audiobook titled Demon King of Tyranny Anaus Voldegod in the Eminence in Shadow, 01-16, by Rida. This belongs to author Rida, source scribblehub.com. Chapter 1, Prologue. Just like how everyone adores heroes in their childhood, a certain boy adored those who hid in the shadows. One day, after living the mediocre life of a side character while undergoing frenzy training by night, he reincarnates in a different world and gains ultimate power. The young man who is only playing at being a secretive powerhouse, his misunderstanding subordinates, and a struggling, giant, shadowy organization. This is the story of a boy who adored shadowy manipulations who might possibly reign over the dark side of another world. This fanfiction story timeline will take place just after Shadow Garden and Sid saved his sister when she was kidnapped and two years before he goes to the capital. So that's basically how we wiped out that bandit group and saved Naysan. When we found Naysan, she was unconscious, so we freed her restraints and then just left her there. The very next day, she showed up back at the house, in high spirits. That person is excessively resilient, so her hand injury had already mainly healed up after just one night. After that was a whole week of recovery or investigation or whatnot before she finally left for the royal capital. And for some reason, during that one week she kept fussing over me. It was quite annoying. I wonder if our parents gave us another sibling, she would stop bothering me. I could really use some meat shield to him, I mean help. Alpha and the others were apparently busy investigating the bandit gang and cleaning up the leftovers. Alright, sorry, they're not bandits, but the order. Well, bandits by any other name are still bandits in the end. But damn, that red-eyed Asin sure had talent. It was partly his credit that I was able to use a cool-sounding line like then I will dive. It matters not how deep. Too bad he died. Otherwise I would have hired him as a supporting actor. And my power in the shadows plays and ad-libbing were a must-see. It's a pity that there was no audience. But I only have to bear with it for two more years. Two years later, I will also be going to the royal capital. It's the royal capital, that capital. One of the few great metropolises of this world, the only city in this country with a population higher than a million. I can bet that there would be both protagonist-like characters and last boss-like characters there. There would be an abundance of incidents, conspiracies, and intricacies that could never occur in a backwater place like here. And thus opportunities for me to make an appearance as a power in the shadows. Ah, in that light, then the current me who is making do by only taking out mere bandits is but a frog in a well. My story so far was only the prologue. As I continued to build up my strength in preparation for two years later, Alpha and the six others requested to meet with me together. Apparently, they want to report on their investigation into the Order and the results of their research into the curse. Lately, they've all gotten quite busy, so it's rare to see all seven gather together at the same time. There's no actual point to investigating and researching, so you guys should keep it to a moderate level, alright? Is what I'm thinking as I listen to their reports. To sum it all up, all of the heroes who fought Dabalos were female. That's why the curse of Dabalos only manifests in females. What a novel idea! But unfortunately, the general consensus is that they were all male. Oh, because Shadow Garden only has girls, except for me, so they're making that their pretext? Should I tell them to hire more males to even things out? But the fact that the only male in Shadow Garden is actually the leader has a nice ring to it. So let's keep it like this. Next, the largest percentage of those who manifest the curse are elves, then beast people, and finally humans. This is related to the lifespans of the races. For example, humans have the shortest lifespans, so the blood of the heroes flows the thinnest in them, which makes it hard for the curse to manifest. Elves, in contrast, have the longest lifespans, so it is the opposite for them. Then the beast people are in the middle of the spectrum. Speaking of which, I am the only human in Shadow Garden, and I didn't even have demon possession. As for the seven of them, two are beast people, and the remaining five are elves. All of them previously had demon possession. Wow you guys, good job thinking up a setting for even something like this. Alpha and the girls also reported a few other things to me but it basically just went in one ear and out the other. And with that, they moved on to reporting about the Order. Supposedly, the Order is an enormous organization that has grown roots all over the entire world. Nice, I like that you girls think large scale. The Order calls those suffering from demon possession, or the curse, you can call it what you want, as matches, and prioritizes the capture and execution of such people. 
It became that in order to mount a resistance against the order, members of Shadow Garden also have to scatter across the world, leaving only one person to stay with me on a rotation basis. The rest will focus on reaching out to and sheltering those suffering from demon possession and also continue digging into the order or run interference where opportunities arise. Oh, hearing that I got it. They have realized that the order of Dabalos does not actually exist. This is why they are trying to say that they can't play along with this farce any longer and that they want to be set free. That's what scatter across the world means, right? But because I really did cure them of demon possession. So to repay that debt they'll take turns to accompany me, and for me to be content with that much. That is the message between the lines that they are hoping for me to read. I found myself feeling a little sad. Even in my previous life, everybody adored heroes when they were children, and I adored powers and shadows in the same way. But eventually, everybody grew up, and before I knew it, they'd all forgotten about their heroes and left me all alone. These girls have also grown up, that's all there is to that. Despite feeling a bit sentimental about it, I quickly agreed to let them go. In the first place, I didn't even plan to gather so many of them. It would be enough with just me and one assistant. I saw off the girls who all teared up at the parting, then swore to myself that I'll definitely become a power in the shadows, even if I become the only person left in the entire world. One year later, when I was in the field and practicing my mob martial arts like usual, the butler of our household appeared beside me. The always serious-looking old man was currently crying as he wiped his tears with a handkerchief. Young Master Sid, congratulations. Your mother. The madam was confirmed to be pregnant. Finally, the meat shield is. Young Master? Nothing. Where is my mother? Realizing that I said my thoughts out loud, I quickly shut my mouth and went to see my parents. At long last, I hope I won't have to deal with my sister alone anymore. This last year without her pestering was really refreshing. I could now focus on my role to be a power in the shadow even more. Sid? Mother, I heard from the butler. Is it true? I looked at my mother who was sitting on the balcony with my father holding her hands in tears. When she saw me, she chuckled and told me to come closer. I just nodded at her and walked toward them. However, when I silently passed by Beta who was disguised as a maid, I noticed that her entire body was shaking. Just how happy was she to become like that? Is she so overjoyed that she can't even control her composure? Hmm? What is this? The more I close the distance to my mother, the heavier the air becomes. There was a certain aura coming from my mother that I could not explain. When I finally reached her, the aura was so strong that it felt as if I was standing in front of an unimaginable mountain. So this is the reason why Beta was like that. The intangible tyrannical pressure was almost suffocating. And it was all coming from her slightly bulging stomach. It seems my parents are unaffected. Are only those who reached a certain level of skill can feel it. My mob instincts are tingling. They are telling me that my future younger sibling has the qualities to become a main character. More so than even my talented sister. Good, very good. My dear sibling, grow up quickly and shine. So I can be an eminence in the shadow. After all, the more you shine, the bigger the shadows become. After 2,000 years have passed, the ruthless demon lord has just been reincarnated, having the capability to destroy humans, elementals, and gods, after a long period of countless wars and strife. Anus the demon lord became sick and tired of all that and longed for a peaceful world, so he decided to reincarnate in the future. However, what awaited him after his reincarnation is a world that, wait, where is this place? Is this a different universe? The Age of Myth. The destruction of countless human countries, reducing the spirit's forest to ash, and even killing the gods. This was the man feared as the demon king. The name was Anas Voldegod. So how about it? The demon king Anas uttered these words while sitting on his throne with his arms crossed. With just that alone a normal human being would be in fear from the power of his words. However, the people in front of him right now do not have that worry. The Severer of Fate, the hero that was chosen by the Holy Sword Cannon. The mother of all spirits, the grand spirit Reno, and the creator of this world, the creation god Melitia, including Anus, they control this world's fate. Four people will be handed down these names in later times but now they gather in the hall of the demon king's castle de Rizigido. I understand the story. It's not a ridiculous condition either. But now, when we are trying to reconcile? The hero canon said. That's right, demon king Anus. How many people have you killed until now? 
Anus answered with a gaze now turned cold. Let me reverse that hero cannon. How many demons have you killed so far? He returned to words of cannons back to him. Who struck first? The humans or the demons? There was no way to know. No, it doesn't matter. Even knowing the answer would not make the past disappear. The reason would no doubt be trivial. Both sides killed and those who survived got revenge on those that were killed. After that, the cycle just repeated. Because they were killed they were avenged, and then those that got revenge were killed for revenge. Hatred accumulated endlessly for both races and the chain of tragedies accelerated to a pace that could not be stopped. Both humans and demons are the same in that they hate things different from themselves. After all your brutality do you think you can say those words? What would have happened without my cruelty? If you did not fear the demon king Anus you human beings would have calmly slaughtered the demons. It was a just cause. I do not remember even feeling one bit of guilt. I even praised the humans I killed as heroes. That was because the demons committed atrocious acts. And I say you humans also did. Are you saying the demons are faultless? It means that in war there is neither good nor bad. With a glint in his eye, the demon king Anos glared at the hero. Cannon, you are a human. Don't you believe that the world will become peaceful if the demon king Anos is defeated? Yes I do. No. You should actually understand it. Stop being a fool. In the place where the demon king Anos was defeated a new fire will be born. Both humans and demons. If the other side is not exterminated the fighting will not end. No. Anos is just talking but he is also a being of immense magical power. Word by word each one had a compulsion like magic. Even if the demons perish, human beings will just make a new enemy again. Next will be the spirits that are different from yourselves. If you eradicate the spirits next will be the gods that made you. And if you defeat the gods you will turn on each other. Certainly, people have weak parts to themselves. However, I want to believe in people. I want to trust in people's kindness. Ha 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 ha. And so Anos laughed. The hero canon is a good person. He knows of humanity's ugliness but has the courage to believe in the goodness of people. Then canon, how about trying to believe in the goodness of the demon king Anos? Canon does not answer immediately. Is this offer true? Should he doubt it? As I said earlier, divide the world into four. The world of humans, the demon world, the spirit world, and the world of the gods. Put up a wall between the worlds and don't open the doors for a thousand years. If the bond disappears for a thousand years the grudges against each other will also disappear. I can change my life force into magical power if you three cooperate, and I can activate the grand magic. So you die for peace? You who are called the demon king. You and the others called me that without permission. I will not die. I will find a handy container and reincarnate. Though it will be two thousand years before I next wake up. Cannon falls silent. After a while he steeled himself. All right. I'll believe in you. Even though he had suggested it, the demon king Anos could not hide his surprise. He had explained it in good faith. Humans, spirits, and gods were shown evidence without any demerit. The remaining problem was emotion. Hatred stacked on top of hatred, constantly repeating. That is why those words needed courage. For the first time, the demon king Anos understood why he is called a hero. Thank you? Canon laughs a little. I never thought I'd see a day when the demon king thanked me. And I did not think a day would come when I could thank the hero. The two of them locked gazes. Their viewpoints are different but they acknowledge the power and strength in each other's hearts. Now, at last, the long battle is about to be rewarded. Let's get started then. The demon king Anas stands slowly up from his throne and holds his hands in front of his eyes. At that moment countless particles of black light began to rise from the castle. Many magic letters appeared on the walls, floors, ceilings, etc. The words being drawn are cramped together. The demon king's castle is a huge magic circle that Anos had prepared. This body is the entrance for the magical power. Anos steps forward and exposes his defenseless body. First, the grand spirit Reno and then the creation god Melitia turned their palms towards him and loosed an extremely pure white wave. It was like looking at a star. It was dazzling. A bundle of infinite magic power. No matter how much magic power was poured into his body, the demon king Anos absorbed it all. Finally, Cannon pulled out the holy sword. The preparations for the reincarnation? Already done. You can do it. The torrent of magic power was intense, crackling and scattering sparks everywhere. It was loud enough to rupture your ears. It could not endure the use of the grand magic that was absorbing all the magical power of the world. 
and the demon king's castle began to collapse. Kenan kicks the floor and thrusts the holy sword forward. Magic is fed into it, and the blade becomes pure white before piercing through the heart of the demon king Anas. Gopha, blood drips from Anas's chest. His lips become wet and red. With this, his ambition was finally fulfilled. He was fed up. The fighting, this barren world. He was tired. Hero Canon, thank you once again. If you are also reborn in 2000 years, it will be as friends. Demon King Anos laughed. Farewell. His body disappeared with the light. 2000 years later, a baby was born in a human house. The Kajino family. Dear, look at him. Our baby. Looking happy, Mrs. Kajino was holding her baby. Sitting at her side was her bald husband Mr. Kajino. Standing in front of them was their 15-year-old son Sid Kajino. He's cute. He will become an excellent man. Mr. Kajino pokes the baby's cheek. Dear, have you thought about a name? Ah, uh, his name is, at that moment when Mr. Kajino was about to speak. The baby suddenly talked with a deep voice like a grown-up man. The name is Anas. Anas Voldegode. Their mouths fall open and their eyes look like they are about to pop out. Mr. Kajino and Mrs. Kajino have expressions of complete surprise. Even Sid was completely dumbfounded as he blurted out a huh, with wide eyes. Thuma, even though it has been 2000 years, it was only a moment for me. The baby said that to himself in a deep adult voice before he turned his attention back to the surprised couple and their son. Ah, sorry. Is this the first time you've seen a baby who reincarnated? I was surprised. It seems that even in this age childbirth has not changed. My best regards. Ta, 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 ta. The group yelled out together. He talk he eat. Seeing their reactions, Anos has a blank look on his little face. Of course, a reincarnated baby can talk. When he said that with a straight face, Mr. Kajino and Mrs. Kajino has extremely confused expressions on their faces while Sid said something in a low voice. I see. I see. So you'll take that route. That's cool bro. It's not like everyone has to stick to the mainstream ice guy trope. Anus looked strangely at Sid for a moment. And then as if he realized something he suddenly floated into the air. It's hard to talk in this body. Should I grow up a little? A magic formation appears on Anus' baby body and then instantly he gets bigger and grew up to be about six years old. He even had neat clothes on him that typical aristocratic's children often wear. For the time being will such an age do? Anos places his feet on the floor. Na o a e a u. While he looks himself over and stamps his feet on the floor Mr. Kajino and Mrs. Kajino have expressions of extreme surprise again. Again they scream out together. H. He. He grew bithurying. Of course. After reincarnating it would be natural to use this magic. Once Anos said that casually as if what he just did was perfectly normal. He suddenly felt someone grabbing his shoulder. The grip was so strong that if he were just a human, his collarbone would have been crushed into dust. He turned around with a raised brow and looked up questioningly at Sid who had a lunatic smirk on his face. Thoma, you need something big brother? Sid's insanely giddy expression was like that of someone who had just found their long forgotten kindred spirit. Forget about some boring main character. Tell me, my little brother, are you actually the last boss instead? When Anos heard Sid saying that with a crazed look in his eyes, he just blinked bewildered and then tilted his head to the side. What do you mean? Excuse my ignorance big brother, but I have no idea what you are talking about. Is this perhaps a new joke used by humans in this era? Author notes, and that's it for the prologue. I hope you like it. This was an idea that I had had in mind for a while now. Whether I will continue this story or not depends entirely on you guys. So make sure to comment on this chapter and tell me your thoughts. Otherwise, I will assume you don't like it and I will drop it. 26. Chapter 2. Unexpected Revelation. What do you mean? Excuse my ignorance, big brother. But I have no idea what you are talking about. Is this perhaps a new joke used by humans in this era? Once Sid heard the by humans last boss-like words coming from Anas's mouth, he nodded understandingly and then looked at Anos with a compassionate expression on his face, which made his little brother even more confused. Nonetheless, Anos quickly recovered and shook his head a bit before he turned back to his parents. Humu. He was about to ask them for something but then decided against it when he saw the dumb faces they have. It seems they are still having a hard time accepting what just happened. 
It will be best to leave them alone for a bit else they will have a heart attack or do something unexpected. It was then that Anas picked the presence of another person in the room. He looked towards the silent maid that was aggressively writing something in a notebook with a crazed look in her eyes. She was rapidly alternating between writing in her notebook then looking at Sid then to him before going back to writing over and over again, occasionally sputtering some random words that made no sense to him. Anas blinked blankly before he turned back to his big brother who was for some reason still nodding to himself and smiling disturbingly at him. Emma, it seems that I will have to look for the closest library myself. Once he said those words, Anas just ignored everyone around him and casually went straight to the door of the room. However, Sid who was still grabbing at his shoulder with inhuman strength was also dragged with him. This resulted in a ridiculous scene where Anas, who was smaller, was dragging the much taller Sid who somehow still had his posture fixed as his shoes slid comically along the smooth carpet. Only after Anas reached the door and opened it did Sid finally release him. Anas was thankful for that, as he was almost about to slap his hand away. He'd rather not end their brotherly relationship before it even started. Have a good day, big brother. Anas politely said those words to Sid before he quickly closed the door. Then he immediately turned left and walked along the decorated corridor. Humu, what a peculiar family. While Anas was looking for a library in the building, many servants saw the unknown child walking throughout the mansion and all of them had question marks floating above their heads. Hey look, who is that? Should I question the brat? Sure. Do you want to be executed? Though, no one dared to approach him because of the confident gait and elegant clothes he was wearing. They were all afraid to be accused of offending the son of some powerful noble. Some brave ones wanted to question him at first but then all it took was a single look from his tyrannical gaze for them to cower and promptly go back to their work. Anus toured the whole mansion as if he owned the place before he finally stopped at what he assumed to be a library. He could see many bookshelves behind the door through the glass window to the side. Click. Anas turned the doorknob, but it seems that the door is locked. Hmm? It doesn't even have digit? Anas was surprised that the door doesn't have any spell that locks gates and doors, allowing just authorized people to enter. Instead, it only has a mundane mechanical lock that can be broken with simple physical strength. Either the people of this era aren't able to use it, or the content of this library is so unimportant that it doesn't even require such standard measures. Now that he thinks about it, his family was extremely shocked by the growth magic curse that he used to age his own body. Cursed was a well-known magic spell commonly used during reincarnation to quickly attain a useful body. It was something even the lowest and lowest citizens of all races know about. There was no end to stories about lucky poor households who suddenly rise to power because of having one or multiple reincarnated children. So how come this family of obvious aristocratic background acted as if they had either never seen or actually never heard of such basic life magic before? Anas frowned and cast a spell to unlock the door. D. When he uttered that one word, a magic circle appeared in front of the lock as the doorknob turned on itself and the door was pushed open by an invisible force. Just in case they used something like Najula, a spell that conceals any and all traces of magic. Anas used another highly advanced spell to detect any and all such tricks. There was no response. Anas's frown deepened as he immediately entered the grand library. The door automatically closed behind him as he used yet another spell. I knees. Thousands upon thousands of glowing hands appeared out of nowhere, and each pair of them grabbed a single book then all of them started rapidly turning the pages at the same time. The sounds of countless pages turning were deafening. Standing in the middle of all the chaos was Anas with glowing eyes as an unimaginable amount of information was directly transferred to his brain. Magic eyes of transcription. This magic eye has the ability to copy any magic with a single glance. It can also be used like this to absorb huge amounts of information in a very short time. Massive knowledge about this era's vast history, shocking geology, subpar science, unknown astrology, laughable mathematics, pitiful magic studies, stone age soul understanding, non-existent source. The more Anas read everything around him, the more he felt something was incredibly wrong. It didn't take long for him to understand his situation, or lack thereof. Thoma, where am I? said a confused demon lord. Back in the bedroom, the trio of the Kajino family was still inside even after Anas has long since left it. Mr. Kajino and Mrs. Kajinu were holding each other hands tightly with swirls in their eyes. H. Honey, our baby. D. 
D did you see it? He already became big S so fast. Why yeah. Humph. A as to be expected O of a Kajino. Honey R B A. Ye. The two were barely able to keep their sanity, as they just kept repeating those same words like a mantra while a smiling Sid was leaning against the wall and thinking God knows. What? Beta who seemed like the only normal one in the room despite disguising herself as a maid finally put her notebook back in her pocket. She looked expectantly at Sid as if asking for permission to do something. Sid noticed her gaze and he nodded mysteriously at her. Beta's expression brightened like a child who just received candy, and she nodded respectfully to him before slowly opening the door and then silently leaving the room. Once she carefully closed the door behind her, Beta turned around and went to a servant who was standing nearby. You there, did you see a boy with black hair? When the male servant heard her question, he was startled and scratched his head. Um, you mean Sidsama? I thought he was in the room with you. I just arrived here, so I don't know where he is. No, not him. It's another boy that has red eyes with big black rings around the irises. He is about this tall. Beta explained as she used her right hand to specify the height of Anas after he transformed his body with some unknown means. When she saw the servant shaking his head in denial, she sighed and was about to move away before another maid suddenly grabbed the hem of her dress. You am, I think I saw someone like that. Really? Beta beamed as she pressured the maid to tell her where he is. The anxious maid told her that he was last seen in front of the locked library and that there were scary noises coming from there and that all the servants were afraid to enter without permission. After all, only the direct heirs of the Kajino family were allowed into it. Beta didn't waste any time and walked briskly towards the library. There was an excited expression on her face. She can't wait to meet and interact with Shadow-sama's little brother. Who is he? How can he talk despite being a newborn? How did he transform without a slime suit? Was that some kind of magic? Is he like Shadow-sama? How strong is he? She has so many questions like these without any answers that she felt her entire head turn blank. Inside the library, Anus was sitting in the window frame as his crimson eyes scanned the landscape outside with a deep expression on his face. He looked at the many humans below moving around and happily going about their lives without a care in the world. It was a surreal experience for him. Normally, the mere mention of his name would strike absolute terror into humans, and they would all run away like headless chickens. Yet here they are, completely oblivious to him. He was the demon king of tyranny, the first and most powerful demon king who ruled the infernal realm. He took as many human lives as there are stars in the sky. He killed as many gods as there are sands in the ocean. Knock knock. Anas's attention was drawn to the knocking sound coming from the door. With a simple snap of his fingers, all the glowing hands instantly returned the countless books to the bookshelves and immediately disappeared. Just in time as a maid opened the door with a light excuse me, and then stealthy entered the library. Anus looked at the maid who elegantly walked to his location before she respectfully bowed to him. Anus Sama, I presume? Humu, and who are you? As Anus was talking, he stopped when he saw the maid's body start shifting into a slime-like substance before she suddenly transformed into another person. What stood before him now was a beautiful young voluptuous elf with blue pupils and shoulder-length silver hair with a left braid behind her ear, as well as a mole underneath the corner of her eye on the same side. Her maid dress was also gone as her outfit now consists of a low-cut dark suit that exposes her cleavage with golden decorations around her chest, shoulder, arms, and waist. Anas was unfazed as if he already knew that she was disguising herself. Who? An elf? How rare. As he muttered that in a low voice, the elf woman introduced herself with a slight bow towards him. My name is Beta. It is an honor to meet you, Anas Sama. When Anas saw her formal greeting, it seems he misunderstood something as he also formally stood up from the window frame and arrogantly crossed his arms. Mama, I didn't expect to be found out so fast. So you already know. Anas said that as his crimson eyes focused heavily on Beta who suddenly found herself blushing a bit. Why yes. If it's Shadow-sama's younger brother then. Beta was stuttering embarrassed while trying to avoid direct eye contact with Anas intense eyes before she suddenly froze when she heard his next words. I guess as expected of my descendants. It is extremely undulated and very. What? A really tiny amount. Almost non-existent. Yet, you certainly had my blood flowing in your body. At that moment Beta felt her entire world shatter as if someone suddenly splashed a massive bucket of freezing cold ice water into her body. 
She took a step back involuntarily as she asked alarmed. Be blood? W what blood? Beta felt a terrible shiver travel her spine as Aina's shocking words reached her elven ears. Hmm? Of course, I'm talking about my blood. You know, demon blood. Suddenly, Beta found it very hard to breathe as she unconsciously took another step back. She looked fearfully at Anas who was studying her with those terrifying glowing eyes. I don't know what why you are talking about. Beta's blue pupils trembled as she also started breathing heavily. She clutched her chest in pain while her beautiful face turned so pale as if she was seeing a ghost. Anas noticed the strange reaction from the hybrid demon in front of him, and he tilted his head to the side as he continued in an innocent tone. He said something that was the most outrageous and the scariest thing Beta ever heard in her entire life. Aren't you a distant descendant of one of the seven demons I created using my own blood 2000 years ago? They were horrifying words that would definitely hunt her to her grave. 19. Chapter 3. Reflection and Resolve Aren't you a distant descendant of one of the seven demons I created using my own blood 2000 years ago? After Anas threw those outrageous words casually as if he was talking about the weather. Beta breathing hitched as her mind started turning hazy from the lack of oxygen. In that abnormal state, old memories that were long sealed deep inside her mind suddenly surfaced. Painful memories about her childhood back when she was still living with her family in the country of elves. The cruel fate she faced after contracting the demon possession, how she was suddenly persecuted by her entire family and society. The horrifying treatment she received from everyone she trusted before being exiled from her home. How dare you? Beta muttered in a trembling voice as she clenched her fists tightly in frustration. Despite knowing everything about the curse and our suffering because of the damned demon blood. How dare he claim something like that so casually? Blatantly saying he's the one who created the demon that destroyed her whole life and caused the death of countless innocent girls throughout history. He was even going as far as saying he made six more such heinous demons. Implying as if demon dabalos and by extension... All of our misery was nothing special. The sheer audacity. Even for being Shadow Sama's little brother, that's going too far. Beta's expression changed drastically as she felt absolute fury toward the person standing in front of her. Small tears formed in her saffron eyes as she glared fiercely at Anas. Not only did he completely shatter her expectations of him by telling such a cruel tasteless joke, but he also offended her and everyone else in the Shadow Garden at the same time. She felt a level of disappointment she never thought was possible. How dare you? Hmm? Anas blinked confused as he looked at the seething elf who suddenly had her whole mode switched in the blink of an eye. If just a few moments ago she was looking at him with respect and admiration in her eyes, then all he could see right now is hate and disgust. Am I wrong? But I can't be mistaken. Aren't you a hybrid? Excuse me Anas-sama. I still have other things to do, so I will take my leave now. While Anas was still talking, Beta snapped and interrupted him rudely. She only half-heartedly bowed to him before she immediately walked towards the door of the library. Anas watched silently without doing anything as she transformed back into a maid and then once she was out, she angrily closed the door with perhaps a bit too much force. Bomb. Anas frowned as he thought about what brought this unexpected reaction. This simple interaction with the elf woman suggested many unfortunate implications and conclusions that he was sure he wouldn't like at all. He noticed that the moment he mentioned demon, the elf woman's emotional state suddenly turned to the worst. It seemed to him as if she harbored extreme hatred towards the demons or something. The same as the humans he meets in the past. But she isn't a human, she is an elf. Even in the past, the elves in fact had a fairly stable relationship with the demons. Sure it wasn't really a good one but it wasn't bad either, mainly because of the complex relationship between the spirits and the demons. So the elves who worshipped those same spirits found themselves in an awkward position with the demons. Nevertheless, that doesn't explain the hatred he saw in her eyes. Did those seven rascals do something stupid while I was gone? Anos was extremely tempted to right away use the more powerful demon eyes in his arsenal to learn about the true past and history directly from the root of the world. But he refrained from doing so. Currently, he has lost approximately 90% of his powers, so he can only effectively use 10% of what he used to be capable of. Moreover, he just reincarnated and is also suffering a huge almost crippling backlash from the last magic he used in his past life to separate the whole world into four separate dimensions. The human world, the demon world, the spirit world, and the world of the gods. 
Doing something of that ridiculous scale put a great strain on him, and so he needs time to calibrate into this new body while slowly recovering his original strength. If he used any significant powers right now, there might be some unrecoverable consequences, either on himself or the world itself. In the worst case scenario, he might actually lose control and accidentally destroy the world. That would make everything he worked for and even die for be for nothing. What purpose does peace have if there was no world there in the first place? Not to mention, if he did something foolish like that, Militia would surely fellow his idiotic ass until the end of existence. Anas has never seen the kind goddess angry before, so he would rather avoid receiving the inevitable wrath of the goddess of creation once he unintentionally destroyed her world. Well, he's not in a hurry anyway. He can take his sweet time enjoying this unique experience. He always wanted to have a family and experience how it feels to have one. Though, he never imagined he would one day have a human one. He even got the full package with a brother and a yet-to-be-seen sister included, if what was written in the family book was true. The complete opposite of the cold corpse of his mother he got when he was born from her dead body in the previous incarnation. Thoma, a human family. Curious indeed, Anas said amused as he sat back in the window frame. He was once again observing and carefully studying the human servants working in the garden below. For now, based on the severe reaction of that elf woman called Beta, he should probably avoid revealing his identity and the fact that he is a demon king for the time being. Furthermore, even his race as a demon should be kept hidden, at least until he learned more about the current standing of the demons in this era and the political balance of all races, especially the gods. Be no even. If the wall that he put to separate the four main races 2000 years ago was still active, there is an extremely high probability that he was currently in the human world and so there might not even be a single demon in this entire country or worse the whole continent. Going by that logic, it is utterly unwise to reveal himself in the dead center of the enemy territory. Alright. He reluctantly decided to portray himself as a human, only temporarily. The only problem with that plan is that he had already revealed his title, and he also showed magical abilities that might not be the norm in this era. Moreover, he told the elf Beta some rather obvious hints too. Well, for his title, he can only hope the people of this era forgot about him somehow or at least he is not that well known anymore. This might highly be the case seeing as not even a single time was his name mentioned in any of the books he read in this library. Not like he will go with another name anyway. He is Anas Voldegode, he will not go by any other name. As for the abnormal magical abilities, he can play it as a genius human seen once in millennia. He heard that type of excuse is pretty effective when reincarnating. This will also tremendously increase the chance of meeting with Hero Cannon if he also reincarnated in the same era. Anas looked forward to their reunion as that would be interesting. How would Hero Cannon react when he found out that humanity's worst nightmare was actually walking in broad daylight right in their backyard? And lastly for Beta, seeing as she is also disguising herself as a human maid, Anas felt she wouldn't pose to be that much of an issue. And even when it inevitably came down to it, in the best case scenario, he would just erase her memory with a magic spell. And in the worst case, well, he would just be doing his new human family a favor by disposing of a potential spy. Saying that though, if there was any minuscule chance that she really has his blood flowing in her veins, no matter how small that amount, he hoped he wouldn't be forced to kill his descendants for such trivial matters. Shadow. Thinking about Beta, Anos tasted the name that she unconsciously slipped out in their rather short conversation. He would make sure to remember it for later. Right now, however, he focused on examining the oblivious humans through the glass window, how they walk, their body language, their facial expression, and their habits. Anything that would help him fit naturally in this era in human society. Anus's crimson eyes glowed dimly as he analyzed everything inside his terrifying mind, occasionally shifting between many different body positions and artificial facial expressions to practice, observe, learn and adapt. That was the secret to the terrifying power of the demon king of tyranny. An irregular demon that puts efficiency above all else. A demon who believes in pragmatic optimism. 19. Chapter 4. Academy Inspection. A month has passed since Anas reincarnated. He spent the time looking into the world that is now 2000 years further on. It seems the magical arts have degenerated to a much lower level than he thought. As a result of his reincarnation, 
Anos finds himself in an era that is vastly different from the one he knew before. The magical arts have greatly declined, and the concept of reincarnation magic is completely unknown. As he expected, humans don't seem to know about reincarnation magic at all. It was rather common magic in the age that he had lived in. For high-ranking magic users, reincarnation magic was not unusual. However, in the present times, the concept of reincarnation magic does not exist. In fact, reincarnation itself does not seem to be even considered possible in the present age. Because of this, despite that Anos was able to talk and use magic from birth, his parents instead see him as a very smart baby rather than a reincarnated being with extraordinary abilities. In this situation, Anos tried to learn more about the unfamiliar world he has been reborn into and figure out how to best use his abilities in this new environment. He also tried to keep his abilities hidden from others, at least until he can better understand the situation and determine the best course of action. He somehow feels a sense of isolation. Not only was he potentially the only demon in this entire continent, he is also the only one in this human world who knows about reincarnation magic and has all the terrifying abilities that come with his past life. As a result of his isolation, Anos felt a sense of loneliness and disconnection from the weak world around him. He doubted he would find others who understand and accept him for who he truly is, and he felt like an outsider in the human aristocratic family he has been reborn into. Two thousand years ago he sowed his own seeds. With magic, he created seven subordinates using his own blood and commanded them to have children and expand their bloodline. He needed a container that contained his blood for a successful reincarnation. As he expected, over two thousand years the blood of the demon King Arnos did not die out. However, he did not expect it to mix with humans. Moreover, the humans don't seem to know much about the demons anymore. He asked his parents, but they didn't know anything either. All they knew is that the demons were some mythical creatures that were said to live in hell. They had no further information beyond that. In order to cope with his isolation, Anos tried to find ways to connect with his human family and form meaningful relationships with them. He also searched for others who are also knowledgeable about magic, even if they do not know about reincarnation magic specifically. The result was, his parents were overjoyed. He managed to make a strong familial bond with them that he never had in his past life. So far so good. However that's it. That was the only good thing that happened. His brother Sid was avoiding him, and Anos was confused and a little bit hurt. He did not understand why his brother is avoiding him, and he feels like he has done something to offend or hurt him. Anos tried to talk to his brother, and find out why he is avoiding him. He even tried to reassure his brother that he is not a threat, and that he only wants to help and support him. But Sid refused to budge, he has done everything possible to avoid Anos all the time. The worst was the occasional smirk he would send at him whenever no one was looking at them. Anos was absolutely bewildered by his brother's actions and nothing about him made any sense. He was like a strange box of mysteries and Anos didn't know where to start to open it. He could feel incredible magic power coming from him. Yet the abilities he displayed were at best average. Even for this era's standard. For the past month, Anos tried to be understanding and supportive. But his efforts were met with continued avoidance. So he became frustrated and somewhat angry. He at one time considered using magic to read Sid's mind and his thoughts. But Anos eventually decided against it as that was unfair and he wanted to honor his brother's privacy. After all, everyone has a secret or two. Hell, he himself was a demon king disguised as a human. He has no right to say anything. Talking about disguising, the elf Beta was nowhere to be seen. He hadn't seen her even once since that time in the library. In fact, other women came one by one at a time in her place disguised in that same maid appearance. Since they didn't do anything major besides glaring at him, Anos ignored them for the time being. For his sister. Unfortunately, Anos did not meet her yet. He knows close to nothing about her besides the fact that she is the heir to the Kajino family. Currently, she is still attending an academy in the capital of this country. The Midgar Academy for Dark Knights. The most prestigious knight academy on the continent. It pulls in talented students from both inside and outside of the Midgar kingdom. In Midgar, all aristocrats must attend this academy as a formality. Which means he is also required to attend it too. Anos was concerned about the potential consequences of attending the academy. He was worried that revealing his abilities and knowledge could lead to unwanted attention or even persecution of his family. 
He was also thinking about the ethics of the methods taught at the Human Academy, and whether they align with his own personal beliefs and moral code. Anos was not confident in holding back if an arrogant human brat was foolish enough to dare to disrespect him, or those around him. Alas, his bald father was ignorant of his thoughts as he had already called an inspector from the academy to test his abilities so they could see if he was worthy enough to attend the prestigious academy as a special student. Anos tried to talk to his father about this and explain his concerns and reservations about attending the academy. He even tried to make his father understand why he is hesitant and why he would prefer to attend normally after a few years. But his father is unwilling to listen to his concerns. Anus even thought about refusing to participate in the testing as a way to avoid attending the academy. But his pride as the demon king of tyranny would not allow him to take a such cowardly move. This brings us to the current situation. Anus looked down at the training sword that was thrown on the ground and then at the huge rock in front of him. They were currently in the vast training field behind the mansion. His father and mother were standing at the side watching him. Sid was also present beside them with one of the disguised maids standing behind him. It was not Beta but one of the other women. Then there was the inspector who has an arrogant expression on his face. The man in armor just walked in out of nowhere and abruptly threw a training sword rudely at his feet. TSK, nowadays. Everyone thinks their child is a genius. You stinking brat, don't tell me you can't even slice that rock. Ultimately, Anos' decision about whether to attend the academy would depend on how much he is willing to show his abilities. Since his father is not willing to take his advice into account then he can only blame himself if something happened. Thoma. Alright then. Anas smiled and picked up the metal sword from the ground. He then tested the durability of the sword by carefully tapping it with his other hand. The fragile thing would definitely shatter at the slightest use of his physical power. There is no other choice. Anas stealthily injected the paper-like sword with a bit of his magic power. That was necessary so that it wouldn't break easily when he used it. Now that he thought about it, this is the first time he touched a sword in this body. He spent the last month researching and interacting with the humans around so he didn't have the time to check his physical prowess yet. Aina swung the sword a few times, testing its weight and balance. He was surprised at how different it felt from the weapons he was used to. He had always relied on his immense magical power to defeat his enemies. But now he would have to rely mostly on his physical strength and skill with the sword. With each swing from him, a massive current of air was generated that left a huge trace on the paved ground around him, slightly surprising his audience. He continued to practice, experimenting with different techniques and styles. As he did so, he felt his muscles start to burn a bit, and his breathing become slightly labored. He realized that this new body was not as powerful as his old one, and he would have to adapt his fighting style to compensate. He focused his energy on his next swing channeling his magic power into the sword to increase its strength and durability even more. With a light swing, he brought the sword down on the rock. The blade sliced through the rock with ease, shattering it into pieces. The inspector's arrogant expression turned to one of surprise and admiration. Well done, the inspector said, nodding his head in approval. It seems that you are indeed worthy of attending the academy. Congratulations, Anos. The inspector didn't finish his words before Anos sliced again and again, each time increasing the speed of his swings. Huh! In a blur as he swung the sword multiple times in quick succession. The sword glowed with a red, magical light as it sliced through the air and struck the poor rock again and again. Everyone around widened their eyes when they saw that Anas's hand had all but completely disappeared from the sheer speed of his swings and all they could hear was the sound of the huge rock being disintegrated into mere dirt. The inspector was stunned by Anas's incredible speed and skill. He had never seen anything like it before. Anas's father and mother were also impressed. Sid had a strange smile on his face, and the maid behind him widened her eyes in shock. Amazing, the inspector said, his voice filled with awe. I've never seen anyone wield a sword like that. You truly are a prodigy, Anas. Anas stooped, feeling a sense of awareness. He has lost himself a bit trying to regain his past skills. Thoma Anas said, nodding his head. I'm looking forward to attending the academy. With that, Anas turned and walked away, leaving the inspector and the others in awe of his skills. As he walked away, Anas couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions. He was looking forward to the opportunity to attend the academy so he could meet his sister and learn more about this era. But he was also feeling a sense of sadness 
and longing for his former life. It seems that Anos has demonstrated his impressive skills with a sword and has been accepted into the academy together with Sid. He is likely feeling a mix of emotions about this, as he is excited about the opportunity to meet his sister and possibly also the reincarnated hero canon. But he also feels a sense of loss for his former era and life. It will be interesting to see how he adapts to life at the academy and continues to learn more about the era he has been reborn into. It seems that the absence of demons in this human world did not allow him to completely enjoy the peace that he wished for in his previous life. It's possible that Anus may face challenges as he adjusts to life at the academy and learns to navigate the new era he has been reborn into. He may feel isolated and out of place, as he is the only one who knows about reincarnation magic and is the only demon on the continent. Additionally, his brother Sid's behavior may continue to be a source of confusion and frustration for him. However, Anos is a strong and capable individual, and with time and effort, he may be able to adapt and find a way to overcome his boredom in this human world. One way that Anos could potentially overcome his boredom in this human world is by exploring and learning more about the new era he has been reborn into. This could involve attending the academy and studying subjects that interest him as well as interacting with others and forming new relationships. He may also want to try new hobbies or activities that challenge him and keep him engaged, such as learning a new skill or taking up a sport. By actively seeking out new experiences and opportunities, Anos may be able to find ways to stay engaged and fulfilled until he regained enough power to go back to the demon world. 15. Chapter 5. Mushroom Gratin I have finally become 15 years old and have matriculated into the Megar Magic Swordsman Academy. It is known as one of the top leading magic swordsman academies in the continent, gathering talents from both inside and outside of our country. In the two months that I've been here, I have purposely maintained my grades somewhere slightly below average, the most optimum position for a mob character. And in the meantime, I have been keeping an eye out for protagonist-like characters, among the few that I have my eyes on, Princess Alexia Megar. The most promising one is her. Even a chimpanzee would be able to figure her for a big potato just from hearing the title Princess Megar. Incidentally, above her is someone even bigger and more famous called Princess Iris Megar. But unfortunately, she has already graduated from the academy. And finally, the one I'm most interested in is my own little brother, Anas Voldegod. Yes, Voldegod. For some reason, my brother refused to be called anything but that. It has caused a big uproar in both the academy and the aristocratic world alike. A child of a noble origin refused to inherit the name of his own family line. It was no different than giving up his own right to inherit the position of the family head too. Normally, doing something outrageous like that would bring severe consequences or even banishment from the country of the culprit. But because of the supposed incredible potential and never-before-seen capabilities that the academy stubbornly vouched for, the Midgar kingdom eventually relented. However, envoys from the royal family were still sent to our household to force my brother to step down from all of his inheritance rights. When the arrogant envoys were mockingly waiting for my brother to get scared and accept the Kajuna name already, they were utterly shocked when my brother casually signed the official documents without even blinking. Is that all? If so, then probably go back to your human king's castle. I'd rather not delay my cooking session with mother. In an instant, he completely decimated the king of the Midgar kingdom's scheme to force him into submission. Such absolute overbearing confidence. He really lived up to his last boss status. I'm really moved by your dedication to our dreams, my little brother. It takes a whole other kind of talent and skill to act like a last boss openly in public like that. This hidden last boss eminence in shadow drops his hat for you. Dear brother, I only ask that you would stop trying to expose my mob status and then everything will be perfect. Alas, he just wouldn't take a hint. Fortunately, because of what happened with the royal envoys, the king of the Migar kingdom sought to save face by influencing the academy to issue a three-month suspension, which means my brother will be unable to attend classes or engage in school activities for at least another month. So my mob character status is safe for now. Anyway, it is this Princess Alexia that I am going to have participated in a super important mob event. To be more specific, it is a penalty game. Yep, you guessed it. It's that one where the loser has to confess to a girl. Thus, I am now on the school roof, standing a certain distance away from Princess Alexia and facing off against her. 
Her silvery white hair falls gracefully to her shoulders, and her red eyes have a captivating quality to them. Her features are striking and exude an alluring coolness. However, due to my exposure to Alpha and others, I have grown accustomed to seeing attractive people. Perhaps if she relaxed her expression and displayed more emotion, it would make her appear more approachable and relatable. Well, let's set that aside for now. Naturally, I am not the first to attempt this foolhardy challenge. After entering the school for two months, already more than a hundred retards have approached her and gotten shot down with the same emotionless phrase. Not interested. It's not like I don't understand. She's probably already got a political marriage lined up for after graduation, and she simply isn't interested in this kind of child's play. But the large majority of the nobles that try to confess to her should also be in the same boat. After graduation, it'll be straight off to arrange marriages for most of them. That's why they are hoping to have a love affair or two while still in the academy. Well, whatever their motivations, in the end, it is all but the mere frolicking of those who know nothing of the world of shadows. However, as a mob character, I am also fated to take part in this frolicking. Forced through a punishment game to confess to the school idol and get turned down in the harshest and most heart-crushing manner. It is truly a mob-like event, is it not? By completing this event in the most mob-like method possible, I would get one step closer to the most ideal image of a mob character inside my head. And that, in turn, would bring me that much further down the path toward becoming a power in the shadows. Seeing my brother's fuck Kajinu event ending with such great results, I felt that I also have to stir things up a bit, and upgrade my mob status too. Ah, uh, now that I look at it carefully, I have two statuses to cultivate whereas my brother has only one. That's somehow unfair. This must be the perk of taking the daylight route, and also the price for the eminence in the shadow route. For the sake of this moment today, I stayed up all night deep in thought. What can I do? How can I confess to making this into the most mob-like confession ever? Word choice is of course important, but there is also articulation, pitch change, and vibrato, to list only a few. After the whole night of research, I have attained the ultimate mob-like confession, and am now standing at the decisive battle. Battle. Exactly. For a mob character, this is nothing short of a great battle. Power in shadows has power in shadows battles to fight, while mob characters have mob battles to fight. And thus I, at this moment, as a mob character, must give it my very best. With resolve in my chest forward I face. Princess Alexia, you might be standing there looking composed and all, but if I really wanted to cut you down, your head would leave your body before you even know what happened. In the end, that is your limit as a person. Therefore, watch closely. This is the world's most mob-like confession. PPP. Prenus Alexia. I reveal the stutter attack card, then display my nervousness through the, in, articulation of princess followed by a pitching change when saying her name. I, I like you. My eyes leap away from Princess Alexia to swim all over the ground, while my whole body trembles at a barely perceptible degree. P- dash, please go out with me. My word choice is kept to the basics, with no fancy additions, while my pronunciation, pitch, and articulation are flying off to God knows where. Then I ended it all with a rising inflection to exhibit my lack of confidence. It was perfect. Now this, this was the perfect mobness that I have been aiming for. Satisfaction. I feel pure satisfaction. Very well. Please take care of me. And then, feeling satisfied, I was preparing to go back when I suddenly heard an auditory hallucination. You, what did you just say? Please take care of me. Ah, uh, okay. Something doesn't seem right here. F- dash, for starters. Let's go back together after school. I'm still having trouble comprehending this recent development. After school, I rendezvous with Princess Alexia and we walk to the dorms together. We part with a smile and a promise to see each other the following day. When I return to my own room, I dive into my bed, bury my face in my pillow, and let out a scream. I can't believe I've ended up on the MC route of a love comedy. How the hell did this happen? Sing. When I was lamenting alone like that by myself. A teal-colored circle suddenly appeared beside my bed as a cylindrical barrier appeared above it. When I turned my eyes to it, a tall handsome guy instantly appeared inside it before the barrier disappeared. Since I was still in mob mode, I acted surprised and scared. Hiya. W who are you? I screamed as I dropped awkwardly from my bed and looked fearfully at the guy. He was at least two feet taller than me. Hmm, somehow, he looks familiar. 
Oh, sorry I scared you. It's me Anas, big brother. Huh. Seeing my confusion, the guy chuckled before explaining, I know you don't recognize me, but I'm really your younger brother. I used magic to grow my body like that time when I was born. I stared at him in disbelief, trying to process everything. Anas seemed to sense my confusion and quickly added, I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. Let's see. Our family ancestors, um, have been blessed with vast magical powers for past generations. And I just happen to be the one to inherit them in this present generation. Oh, nice backstory. I'll play along with you, my little brother. I see, I you understand. Hey, Anas. I said so in the most mob-like way possible. Anas nodded satisfied and put some kind of ordinary basket in my hands. I stared at it curiously as I could smell a delicious aroma coming from it. There was faint smoke coming from the fabric inside. Here, mother told me to give you this. This is... It's mushroom gratin. What? Mushroom? Why? It seems that my inner thoughts slipped into my face as Anas avoided my gaze and scratched his head awkwardly. We made a little. Too much for dinner, and so I proposed to deliver some to you and sister. How? I am not acquainted with our sister yet, so I can't give it to her. Make sure to share some with her. Sid. It's an entire few days trips by train from the Kajinu domain to the academy. If I jogged at full speed, I can probably cover that distance in a few hours. But even then, I'm not confident I can deliver this mushroom gratin before it gets cold like he just did. Especially with such a primitive basket that has zero heat isolation. As I reached that conclusion, a strange smirk unconsciously crept into my face. My brother grimaced as his mouth twitched. Not again. Kukuku. Okay, SC later said. Got him. Tsu. Anus said awkwardly as that same circle from earlier appeared around him, and he disappeared without a trace. This time I was prepared. Bomb. I narrowed my eyes and then I immediately disappeared from my room. I held the basket in my right hand tightly as I jumped from one building to another with inhuman speed. While I was in the air my slime suit uniform transformed into my shadow guys. Zap zap zap. I instantly reached the top of the tallest tower in the capital. Then from there, I quickly expanded my mana sense to the absolute maximum range. From my body, countless invisible lines of purple light manifested and expanded in a grid-like pattern at the speed of light, covering thousands of kilometers out of the city in less than a second, shocking every dark night and all beings in it that are capable of understanding mana. LOM. With this, not to mention a living creature, even an intercontinental ballistic missile flying at Mach 23 or 24,000 kilometers per hour will not pass over this distance in that short amount of time. Interesting. However, even with that terrifying range in my near omniscient mana sense, I can't find him at all. He vanished completely from this whole territory. There is only one realistic explanation. Teleportation magic. The mythical power to move instantaneously from one location to another without actually physically occupying the space in between. Moreover, a fairly high level one at that. Possibly a global scale one. With a simple one word invocation requirement. The possible implications of such a magic spell existing are absurd at worst. The wheel of fate is moving. The era of darkness and destruction is nigh. I said mysteriously as my crimson eyes slowly turned to the warm basket in my hand. Author. Comment story reviews equals more chapters. 14. Chapter 6. Sid Kajino Execution. Tsu. After Anas suddenly materialized in his room at the Kajino household, he couldn't help muttering to himself about how he can't get used to his brother's strange behavior. I can't get used to that. Anas muttered with a blank face as he sighed uncharacteristically. No matter how much time has passed, he just can't get used to his brother's antics. Don't get him wrong. As the demon king of tyranny. Anas had encountered countless strange and unusual beings in his previous life and had seen many things that were beyond the realm of imagination for the residents of this world. So much so in fact, that now he even struggled to connect emotionally with others, as his untold experiences had dulled his own emotions. However, despite all of that, in the end, all of those things shared one thing in common. It was a cause. Everything in existence is ruled by the concept of causality. It was the only absolute law in existence. Everything, be it gods, relationships, death, or destruction. He himself is also subject to it. Because of his exceptional intelligence, 
Amos could easily guess the cause of any phenomenon or action that happened so far in his life. No matter how bizarre it seemed at first glance, for Amos, he always immediately finds a cause or two for it. However, for all of his enormous experiences and inhuman intelligence, Amos just couldn't find any cause for the odd actions of his human brother Sid. No matter how hard and deeply he thought about it, Amos simply couldn't find any cause for his brother Sid's odd behavior. This was a first for Anas. While he could have used magic to read Sid's mind and quickly solve the mystery. If it was anyone else, Anas would have done just that long ago and be done with it efficiently. But Sid is his brother, and Anas couldn't bring himself to invade his brother's privacy. Moreover, his pride stemming from his position as the demon king of tyranny, was also hindering him. If he were to employ magic in this instance, it would signify surrendering to this mental obstacle. The demon king of tyranny is known for never shying away from challenges, no matter how trivial they are. Anas Voldegode will always win. He will definitely solve the mystery revolving around Sid. Isn't it strange? That's strange all right. That's so strange. Lunchtime the next day. I am having lunch with my mob friends while going over how yesterday went down. Consequently, all three of us are of the same opinion, that it was strange. To be honest, you simply don't have the specs to go out with Princess Alexia. Even I would be barely at the acceptable level, you know? So says Hiro. He is the second son of the Baron Gali family. His appearance is tall and thin, and it might seem like he is kind of fashionable and puts some effort into his appearance. But he has terrible sense. From afar, he could perhaps somehow pass off as handsome. Or not scratch that last part. I can't see it at all. Of course... This Hiro Gali does not have the specs to go out with Princess Alexia. Why? Because he is someone that I've acknowledged as a mob friend. If even Sid Kun could pull it off, then even I could have succeeded. Ah, uh, I should have done the confession myself. And this is Jaga, second son of the Baron Imo family. His appearance is small and bony, like that extra guy in every baseball club. He is outstandingly talented in that even when looking from afar, no matter the angle, he wouldn't even have the atmosphere of being a handsome guy. Naturally, he is also a mere mob character who would never be a good match with Princess Alexia after even a thousand years. Oh, and by the way, my name is Sid. Sid Kajanu. When I go by this name, I am your average, everyday mob character. Seriously, this is not as good as it sounds. It freaks me out that there are probably some deeper circumstances here, and in the first place the worlds we live in are too far apart. You got that right. After all, your caliber is even less than mine. I bet the longest this would last would be a week. I say three days max. Take a look around. At Jaga's words, Hiro and I glance around. Almost everybody in the cafeteria is looking my way and whispering furiously to their respective companions. Look, he's the one. No way. His looks are so average. Is there some misunderstanding here? Damn, then even I could have. Eh. Etc etc. I heard that he discovered a secret of hers and is blackmailing her. From that guy called Hiro Gali. Are you serious? I'm gonna kill that bastard. Act like it was an accident. How could we call ourselves men if we don't stand up here? Etc. Etc. I have good ears, so I can pick up pretty much all of it. But for starters, I glare at Hiro Gali. And then, what's the matter? Nothing. Such is the friendship between mob characters. But seriously, what am I to do? It would be super suspicious if I turn around and dump her the very next day after confessing. In the first place, it is not mob-like to break up with the princess. But then again, I was forced out of being mob-like the moment she said yes. Why not just go along with it? Who knows, maybe you can even get a good memory or two out of it. So says Hiro with a smirk. I agree. Even if it was a mistake, you are currently officially going out with the princess. It would be such a waste to chicken out due to a few minor obstacles. I can't actually do that, now can I? The longer this state of affairs lasts, the farther that rumors about me would spread, and the further I would be from a mediocre mob-like life. But now that things have developed to this level, we absolutely cannot let slip that it was just a penalty game. So says Jaga, agreed. The moment it becomes leaked, things will descend into absolute chaos. So I'm begging you guys, alright? Especially you, Hiro. Me? Pfft. No one would be able to make me talk. Of course, I would also never tell. I'm seriously begging you guys, alright? I sigh, then reach for my 980 Zenny daily set meal for Dirt Pernobles. 
By the way, Sidkuin, when did you get that gratin? I'm sure it wasn't on the cafeteria menu, Jaga said as he looked at the mushroom gratin beside my meal. My brother gave it to me. What? You, since when have you had a brother? As Jaga looked at me suspiciously, Hiro laughed haughtily and answered him instead. Jaga, dear Jaga, don't tell me that you didn't know. Huh? What? This guy's younger brother, he made quite the fuss in the nobility world. You know him, right? The one who refused to inherit his family name. What? That Anas Voldegode? When he heard the name, Jaga slammed the table with both hands and looked at me with bulging eyes. He was being too close for his own good so I pushed his face away from me. Close. So, what about it? Why do you even care? Why do I even care? Do you even know the gravity of what your brother did? That guy is done for. He will never get to marry a noble lady in his life. As Jaga was saying that while waving his finger like he was teaching me something, Hiro nodded his head wisely in agreement and continued after him. Yeah, after losing his inheritance rights, he became no different than a commoner. Poor guy, not a single noble house will accept him now. His aristocratic life is over. He, I didn't know that. I said uninterested as I began to eat. Let's eat quickly and then leave this extremely uncomfortable cafeteria. But I was too late. A 100,000 zenny daily set meal for filthy rich nobles is set down right across from my seat. By a maid, with oh so graceful skill. Then, this seat is it free? Princess Alexia enters the scene. Fuck I knew it. That's why I wanted to eat quickly. Oh of course. I, I if it pleases you, please. I can almost see Hiro and Jaga visibly shrinking into themselves. And these are the people who were bragging mere moments ago that even they could have gone out with her. As expected of the mob friends my mob character had fully acknowledged as true mobs. Now I just want to cry, for various reasons. Sit if you want. Alexia was waiting for my answer, so I answered. Well then. And with that, she sits down. Nice weather, isn't it? For starters, I try to fill the gap by bringing up the weather. I suppose. Thus continued our bland and banal conversation. With elegant motions, she puts her hands on her extravagant lunch. As expected of a princess, she has wonderful manners. Low-ranking nobles are pretty much just commoners slapped with a title. That super expensive meal sure is a lot. It is, isn't it? I always end up unable to finish it all. What a waste. To be honest, I would rather choose a lower rank course. But when I do, then everyone else finds it hard to order this. Ah, uh, okay. If you can't eat it all, then may I grab some? I don't mind, but... If you're worried about the manners and all that, don't be. This is the lower noble seating area, after all. I plunder the meat main dish from the bewildered looking Alexia and stuff my cheeks with it before she can utter a complaint. Yep, delish. Ah, uh, I'll help myself to the fish too then. Wait a, eh? damn I feel lucky. Thanks to you, my stomach is now in seventh heaven. In sharp contrast to yesterday, my attitude towards Alexia is now super meh. The reason? It's because I'm currently in the middle of carrying out the make her dump me strategy. Sighs oh well. Thanks for the food. K okay, see ya. Wait for a second. I was hoping to just eat whatever I could and then leave like it's nobody's business. But no dice. Grudgingly, I sit back down. Your practical studies after lunch is royal capital Bushin style, is it not? Yeah sure. This school's curriculum is separated into theoretical studies before lunch and practical studies after lunch. Theoretical studies are separated by years. But practical years are all elective based, and students from all years are mixed together. The point is to pick the fighting style that fits you best from among all the ones that they offer. I also take Royal Capo Bushin style, so how about we go together? Uh, that's not happening. I mean, you're in group 1, and I'm in group 9. Bushin style is a pretty popular course. With 50 students in a group, there are a total of 9 groups, with group 1 being the most proficient and group 9 being the worst. Having joined the academy only two months ago, I am still in group 9. My plan is to eventually settle down in group 5, by the way. With my recommendation, a spot was freed up in group 1, so don't worry about it. Isn't that like abuse of power or something? Do you want me to come to group 9 then? Oh god please don't, you'd destroy my standing. These are the only options available. Choose one. Seriously? It is an order, by my authority as a princess. Group 1. Here I come. Good. Also, since you ate everything in my launch, can I take this gratin for myself? Eh? Ah. Uh, sure. 
Alexia took the mushroom gratin into her plate and began slowly eating it. Even though it was cold and was made yesterday, she actually liked it. Whoa, what is this? This is delicious. Wait, leave some for my sister. The mushroom gratin was devoured instantly. You said something? Alexia glared at me. It seems this was her retaliation for me eating her lunch. No, it's nothing. And so ended my lunch. I apologize, sister. Your mushroom gratin had to be sacrificed for my benefit. Hiero and Jaga remained as ornamental decorations to the very end. So wide. I could not help but say that out loud the moment I stepped into Royal Capital Bushin style Group 1's classroom. Within the area of a gigantic stadium, aside from the changing rooms, there are also baths, a bar, and several other amenities. Even the doors are automatic, made powered. Incidentally, the classroom of Group 9 is outdoors, be it rain or shine. No doors, thus no need for maids. In order to not get tangled with them, I changed at super speed, then stayed in a corner to wait for Alexia. After a short while, let's loosen up a bit first, shall we? Alexia in a dirty enters the scene. The one for girls is a long dress with a deep slit, very much like an unadorned china dress. The color of hers is black. Bushin style uses color to show proficiency. Black is for the best, white is for beginners. Mine is of course white. I am the only white in this whole classroom. I stick out like a sore thumb, ignoring the stairs composed of 70% hostility and 30% inquisitiveness. I start doing some light stretches. Interesting, says Alexia while copying what I'm doing. In this world, the idea of loosening up before exercising is well known, but the way to do so has not been established. So everyone kinda just does it their own way. Those who do sports but underestimate the importance of stretching would definitely destroy their body. In this world, magic can perhaps somehow take care of such injuries, but there would still be an effect on performance. I'm sure my little brother thinks the same, even though I never once saw him do it before. I'm sure he secretly stretches his body somewhere when no one is looking, he has to maintain his last boss status after all. Last boss characters never stretch before exercising in public. Today onwards, a new friend will be joining us, was the way that the teacher in charge introduced me. My name is Sid Kajanu. I will be in everyone's care. Then came the barrage of stares from people who absolutely are not thinking of me as a friend. Ah, uh, as expected of group one. Just by taking a quick glance around, I see super important people here and there. That I met over there is the second son of a duke's family. That beauty is the daughter of the current leader of the Magic Swordsman Knight Order. And even the class instructor is our country's swordsmanship instructor. He is even a blonde eyed man and merely 28 years of age. Everyone, get along well. After which then began practice. Starting from magic control through meditation, all the way to basic training like practice swings. Good, this is good. The basics are important. In group 9, we only did a short time of practice swings before everyone started just banging their swords against each other. Guess the truly strong really do understand what's what. Everyone here seems high level, so this is honestly a really good environment. It's perfect for my little brother when he finally came to school next month. His last boss status will thrive just like a palm tree flourishing in fertile land. Above all else, this royal capital Bushin style is one that makes a lot of sense. It's wonderful that every ounce of effort poured into it would never go to waste. Do you like the royal capital Bushin style? So asked the blonde eyed man while approaching me. If I remember correctly, his name is Xenon Griffey. Do I look like I do? Oh yes, you look like you enjoy it very much. In response to my answer, Xenon Sensei gives a refreshing laugh. As you probably already know, Royal Capital Bushin style is a new branch off of Bushin style. Traditional Bushin style was originally already the most popular style in our country. So the reformed Royal Capital Bushin style had a strong start. Then with the patronage of Princess Iris, it became the second most popular style in this country, behind only the traditional Bushin style. I've heard that Sensei is also quite an influential proponent of the style. What I've done is insignificant in comparison to what the princess has done. But even so, I feel like I was a part of nurturing Royal Capital Bushin style to where it is today. That's why when I see someone else liking this style, I get so happy that I can't help myself. I'm also looking forward to meeting your younger brother Anas. I heard a rumor that he was quite the genius in the way of the sword. Anyway, sorry for interrupting your practice. With that, Xenon Sensei goes off to watch the other students. 
I, too, fully understand how he feels. I like seeing Alpha and the girls swinging my sword. My sword is something that I had built up myself, so the feeling of being recognized when seeing someone else use it is an exceptional kind of happiness. What were you two talking about? So asks Alexia. About royal capital Bushin style. Fion. Anyways, it's mass next, so let's pair up. Mass refers to the light practice of actual fighting forms. The point is to confirm the feeling of using certain techniques and parries, all without actually touching your opponent. Isn't our mastery too far apart? Won't be a problem. So we take a stance across from each other with our wooden swords. I make a move, which Alexia parries. Then she makes a move, which I parry. The attacks don't land, and our movements are slow. Neither are we using any magic. Around us are several pairs fully utilizing magic and whamming each other fiercely. But to my surprise, Alexia is matching along with me. No, rather than matching along with me. This might be what she normally does. Mass is ultimately the confirmation of techniques. So there is absolutely no need for speed or strength. She has a firm eye on the true intended purpose of this training. This can be seen just by looking at her sword. Her older sister, Princess Iris, is praised for her strength to heaven and backed by absolutely everyone in this country. Genius, wizard, every single person has a different word to praise her with. At the moment, she is even said to be the strongest in the entire country. Ahem, Anas Ahem. My younger brother seems to have the ideal rival to fight in his journey to polish his daylight last boss status. I look forward to their inevitable clash. When that happens, I might even pay him a visit as the last boss in the eminence in shadow. By chance, the two opposing final bosses cross paths while gazing down arrogantly upon the masses from the pinnacle of the world. The fated encounter that will shake the whole world. Ah. That event will be legendary. On the other hand, the reputation of Alexia is not so good. She has magic, and her sword is honest, but she simply pales in comparison to her sister. This is the valuation of Alexia shared by the general populace. But now that I'm here standing opposite her, I realize that her sword is a pretty good sword in and of itself. Faithful to the basics, firm foundation, and plain. Yes, it's plain. But that plainness is the crystallization of her effort. After everything useless is removed then the rest is just her continuously building upon her foundation, step by step. Delta, take a good look at this. I couldn't help but mentally call out to that beast person girl who swings a sword that I find hard to acknowledge. Nice sword. So says Alexia. Thanks. But I don't like it. So she's the type to bring you up before dropping you. It's like I'm looking at myself. Let's stop. So saying, she begins to wrap up. Seems like class is almost over anyways. Against general expectations, I was able to safely get through the class without anything untoward happening. Let's quickly clean up, get changed, then dash back at full speed. Wait a second. Or not. Alexia grabs me by the scruff of my neck and drags me somewhere. So this is your answer? For some reason, we have come to Xenon Sensei. Indeed. I've decided to go out with him instead. You can't keep running away like this indefinitely. You know that, right? So asks Xenon Sensei with severe eyes. Us children don't understand the circumstances of adults, says Alexia with a ho-ho-ho laugh. Based on this conversation, I've finally understood most of what's going on. The reason why I was brought here, and the reason why she decided to go out with me. While praying earnestly that I won't be dragged in, I turn myself into air and merely watch these two protagonists having their event. In other words, Alexia and Xenon Sensei are engaged. And I'm the stalking horse? I'm currently facing off against Alexia behind the school building after school. We're not engaged. He's just a fiancé candidate. So returns Alexia with a composed face. Whatever, same thing. No, it's not the same. It's not even been confirmed yet. But he's already trying to forcefully move the talks along. I'm quite troubled by it. Okay, seriously, whatever. Sorry, but I have no intention to be swept up in the circumstances between you two. Oh dear, what a heartless thing for my boyfriend to say to me. Boyfriend? You just wanted a convenient stalking horse, didn't you? That is true. But the same goes for you, no? An unpleasant smile appears on Alexia's face. Same? What are you talking about? Oh, you plan to feign ignorance? Oh, Sid Kajinokuin who lost in a penalty game? Her smile deepens even more. Okay, wait for a second here. Let's calm down. How cruel to play with an innocent girl's emotions like that. 
So says Alexia while crying crocodile tears without even a shred of innocence coming from her. No problem, I am calm. I have no idea what you are talking about though. What, do you have evidence or something? Yep, evidence. Regardless of how much suspicion she might have, as long as those two don't betray me. Is his name Jagakuin? As soon as I talked to him, his face became all red and he began telling me things that I didn't even ask about. You have such a good friend. I mentally beat Jaga up in my shadow mode together with my last boss brother Anos, as we smashed him thoroughly into micro-sized mashed potatoes to maintain my own mental health. Are you alright? Your face is convulsing like crazy. Not a problem. My character is twisted so my mouth is twisted too. Ah, uh, I see. Still better than you though. And then, did you just say something? Ah, uh, no. So what is it that you want anyways? I admit defeat. The reason for my loss is my choice of friends. Let me see. Alexia crosses her arms and leans against the school building. For now, continue pretending to be my lover. Time duration is until that man gives up. My status is but that of a mere barren family. To be honest, I don't even have the strength to be of much use as a stalking horse. I am fully aware. As long as we can buy time, then that'll be enough. The rest I'll handle by myself. Furthermore, I don't want to be put in any danger. The other party is the country's swordsmanship instructor. If anything happens, I wouldn't be able to deal with it. Blah blah blah, you sure are noisy. So saying, Alexia takes out gold coins from her chest pocket and scatters them over the ground. Pick them up. A single gold coin is worth 100,000 zenny, and there are at least 10 pieces there. He, do I look like a guy who would wag his tail for money? So I say while crawling on the ground and carefully picking up the gold coins piece by piece. Yes you do, you've got a good eye. Eleventh piece, twelfth piece, thirteenth piece, ah there's one more. Right as I'm about to reach for that last piece of gold coin, Alexia steps onto it. I look up at Alexia. Alexia's red eyes look down at me. I can see the inside of her pleated skirt. You will move exactly as I tell you to, yes? confirms Alexia with a smile revealing every last bit of her terrible personality. Of course, of course, answers me with a full face smile. Good boy, Pochi. Alexia pats my head like I'm a dog or a child, then leaves with a flutter of her short skirt. I carefully wipe the gold coin that had her shoe print on it before pocketing it. Two weeks after that, I am somehow making do as Alexia's boyfriend. Every once in a while I get harassed by other students but everything so far is still within tolerable levels. More than anything else, Xenon Sensei has not come to beat me up or seek to solve things with any direct approaches that involve violence, so at least that's a relief. As for the man in question, he continues to give Alexia and me appropriate and thoughtful guidance during classes. He no longer comes over for casual talks, but clearly is an adult capable of keeping public and private separate. In comparison to that, that man truly irritates me. Looking like he's all that just because he is a little good at the sword. When we're before people, of course, she's got her act on and all. But when we are alone, her words become like a tornado of vilification. Yep, yep, that's right. I am pretty much just a yes robot. I learned early on that any and all rebuttal would only be a waste of time. Pochi, you also saw that absolutely shady smile of his, did you not? Yep, yep, I did. It has become our routine to return to the dorms after school via a longer path through the woods that few other students use. During that time, I simply continue to agree with whatever Alexia said. Not even 10% of it actually enters my brain. We continue walking slowly down the path as the sun sets above. Whereas walking normally would get us through to the other side in 10 minutes, we easily take longer than 30 minutes. Some days, I can already see the stars by the time we get through, but patience. Some days I feel like yelling at her to just find a random wall to talk to instead, but patience. I can bear it. Patience, patience, and more patience. But even I have one thing that I really need to say. Ah, uh, can I ask you something? What, Pochi? Alexia sits down on her favorite tree stump and crosses her legs. Why the hell are you sitting down? Get the fuck up and continue walking. Is what I really want to say but I know I have no choice but to also sit down next to her. In the end, what is it about Xenon Sensei that you dislike so much? Objectively speaking, as a marriage partner he seems like a pretty good catch to me though. You, were you even listening to what I was saying? Alexia looks slightly displeased. Everything, alright? I dislike his very existence, and everything about it. He is handsome, 
is the country's swordsmanship instructor, has a high social status, has money, and is able to clearly demarcate between public and private. Everything about him seems good. In actual fact, he is quite popular among the female students, I hear. My words are only met with a scornful laugh. That's all just his outward appearance. Appearances can be fabricated and kept up as much as wanted. As a prime example, me? I see. Damn, that's a convincing example. Speaking of which, Alexia is also highly popular. Since she's putting on so deep an act that it makes me want to puke sometimes when I see it. That is why I do not evaluate people based on appearances. Then how do you evaluate people? By their flaws. So says Alexia with a self-satisfied look. A truly negative judgment method. Fits you to a T. Why, thank you. Incidentally, the fact that you are only composed of flaws and that you possess absolutely no virtues whatsoever scores you relatively high in my book. Thank you. It's my first time receiving such a compliment that does not make me happy at all. Alexia smiles wryly. It's good that you are an easily identifiable piece of trash. And that is why I dislike that man. Since we're on the topic, tell me some of Xenon Sensei's flaws then. From what I can see, he has none. Then isn't he just perfect? There isn't a single human alive who is perfect. If there truly is, then that person is either a big, fat liar, there are screws loose in their head or they are not even human in the first place. I wonder if that applies to my younger brother Anus too. After all, he pretty much is perfect human material. I didn't see any flaws so far in his last boss character. Though, the same can be said for my shadow persona too. I see I see. Thank you for that totally jaded and prejudiced reply. I truly learned something today. You are very welcome, O Pochi of the endless list of flaws. Go fetch. With that, Alexia takes out a single gold coin and throws it. I dash out at full speed to catch it. Damn straight, just done earn me 100,000 zenny. My allowances from my parents are nearly enough to fund my eminence in shadow operations. I can't afford to let this chance slip by. I also have to gather some for my younger brother too. It is my responsibility as the big brother to help him achieve his dream, especially when we share a similar one. I put the gold coin into my pocket, then return to Alexia, who is clapping her hands in delight. Good boy, good boy. She is patting my head. Patience. Sid, it's for your younger brother Patience. You're hating this. You're hating this so much. While being patted, once more I think to myself that she is a terrible human being. It's showing in your face, you know? I'm letting it show in my face. With a fufu laugh, Alexia stands back up. Well then, about time to get back. Yes, yes. Pochi, tomorrow I'm going to smash that annoying face of his with a wooden sword, so make sure you watch carefully. Upon hearing Alexia say so, I couldn't help but ask. That thing, are you seriously going to do it? What are you implying? Alexia turns around and glares at me. I really shouldn't have asked that. But it is something that I truly cannot turn a blind eye to. Xenon Sensei is indeed stronger than you. But from what I can see, the difference between you two is not so great that you'd be single-sided done in. I like Alexia's sword. Because it is a sword built up from days and days of accumulation, one step at a time. But when it comes to the real thing, actual combat, there is one unnecessary element mixed in. And I really cannot stand seeing a sword that I had recognized being tainted by that one element. Easy for you to say. What do you know, white robe? Sure, it's nonsense of a white robe. There is no need for you to pay any mind to it. Fine, I'll tell you. Things are not as simple as you think. Is that so? I have no talent. I was born with a large magic capacity. And I'd like to think that I've also put in a fair share of effort. I think myself relatively strong. But even with all that, I can never win against a real genius. You sure? I've always been compared to Iris Naysama. There were expectations from the people all around. But even more than that, I myself also greatly respected Iris Naysama and wanted to catch up to her. But I could not do things the way Iris Naysama could. What each one of us had from the very start was too different. So I decided to find my own way to become stronger. But as a result, do you know what people call my sword? When the sister swords are raised in comparison... There is a certain phrase that comes up with almost guaranteed certainty. The commoner's sword. Yes, that. Oh, and by the way, yours is also the commoner's sword. Too bad, eh? Alexia laughs in self-derision. I don't think it a bad thing at all. I like your sword, after all. 
Upon hearing my words, Alexia's breast stops for a brief moment, then she scowls at me. Previously, someone else had also said those words to me. It was Iris Nesama, on the stage of the Festival of the God of War, after my unsightly defeat at her hands. I really do like your sword, Alexia. With curled lip, Alexia attempts to imitate Princess Iris's voice. I'm sure that person didn't understand even a fraction of my feelings. How wretched I felt at that moment. Even since that day, I've hated my own sword so much. Then Alexia laughs. I don't know what is contained in that laugh, but at the very least it is not a happy laugh. I have something that I really must say. If I don't say it, then it would be akin to denying my very self. I am an extremely facetious person. If something happens and a million people suddenly die, I wouldn't really care. If you go mad and become a serial killer going around indiscriminately slashing people left and right, I wouldn't really care either. If I go mad, the first person I cut would be you. I've just decided. Even if you are secretly a terrible demon king and are just waiting patiently for the perfect day to destroy humanity. To be honest, I wouldn't mind either way. If I'm suddenly a demon then I will make sure to destroy you first before the rest of humanity. I've just decided that too. But there is one thing that I would never compromise on. Even if it is worth absolutely nothing to other people, to me it is the most important thing in my life. And the way I live my life is to protect only that single thing that is important to me. Which is why, what I will say next, I fully mean with all of my heart. Just one sentence. I like Alexia's sword. After a short period of silence, Alexia replies. What meaning is there in those words? None. But if I really had to say... It's because I got angry hearing something that I like being denied. That's all there is to it. Is that so? Alexia turns around. Today, I will go back alone. And then she walks off. The next day. How long has it been since we last had a meal with just the three of us like this? So says Jacob the traitor. Since this guy eats with the princess for literally every single meal. And that was Hiero. What choice do I have? Me. For the first time in quite a while. We three are eating together in the cafeteria. Alexia is, for a surprising change of pace, not present. Sidquin, can you forgive me already? Here, here. Men don't hold grudges over insignificant things. I even treated you to a 980 zeni daily set meal for dirt per nobles, didn't I? Here, here. He already treated you, so just let bygones be bygones. Gah, alright already? I heave a huge sigh. Thank you, Sidquin. Yeah, yeah. So... How far have you actually gone? So asks Hiro in a subdued voice. Gone where? Duh, I'm talking about that and Princess Alexia. You two have already gone out for two weeks so you've been getting some of that, haven't you? Seriously, stop saying that. Oh my god, what a retarded conversation this is. Nothing has happened, and nothing will happen. Ka, what a useless wimp. If it was me, I'd have reached the last base already. Agreed. I would have at least gotten to the kissing stage. As I keep saying, we're not like that. I half-heartedly fend them off while continuing to eat my lunch. But then all of a sudden, may I sit here? The blonde-haired Eichmann Zenon Sensei enters the scene. Yes, of course. All yours. With that, the two true mobs once again turn into ornamental decorations. What business do you have with me? I am slightly on my guard. Just in case he's aiming for me now that Alexia is not present. I'm sure you've already heard. But Princess Alexia has not returned to the dorms since yesterday. Naturally, this is my first time hearing such news. But I'm sure she's merely gone off on a trip of self-discovery or something. That's what teenagers do, right? During our search this morning, we found this. What he takes out is a single loafer. It's Alexia's. There were signs of a struggle nearby. The Knight Order is considering it to be a kidnapping case. And investigations are underway. What, how could this be? is what I shout out loud in a grieving voice. But inside I'm shouting hell yeah, serves you right, while making a guts pose. When we were narrowing down the list of suspects, the last person confirmed to have been seen with her came up. So saying, Zenon Sensei looks at me. The Knight Order would like to ask you a few questions. Standing at the entrance of the cafeteria are members of the Knight Order wearing their full equipment and projecting bloodthirst toward me. You will cooperate with us, yes? Oh, I can see where this is going. Fuck me. A few days later, Anas calmly rose from his bed, as he did every morning, and then exited his room. He walked down the hallway of the Kajino household, passing by the various rooms occupied by the Kajino's servants and civil staff. 
As he walked, he couldn't help but think about his brother's behavior some weeks ago once again. While his brother was still living here two months ago, Anus noticed that Sid had been acting strangely for quite some time now. He would often disappear for hours on end, leaving no clue as to where he had gone or what he had been doing. And when he did return, he would act as if nothing had happened, as if he had never left in the first place. Anus had tried to talk to him about it, but Sid always brushed off his concerns, saying that he was just busy with training to enter the academy, or that he needed some time to himself. But Anus knew that there was more to it than that. As he approached the living room, Anus heard a strange noise coming from inside. It sounded like a mix of screaming and crying, and it was coming from his parents. Anus pushed the door open and saw his mother sitting on the couch with a hand covering her face, with his father kneeling on the ground and tears streaming down his face as he cried pitifully. Anus felt a twinge of concern as he walked over to his parents. Mother, father, what's going on? Are you okay? Anus asked, trying to keep his voice calm. His bald father looked up at him. His eyes are red and swollen from crying. I'm fine, Anus. I'm just... I'm just going through some stuff right now, he said, his voice shaking. Anus crouched down next to him, putting a hand on his shoulder. You can talk to me, father. Whatever it is, we can work through it together. There is nothing in this world that I cannot do. His bald father looked at him, his expression softening. Thanks, Anus. I appreciate it. I've just been feeling lost, I guess. Like I don't know what my purpose is in life. Anus nodded in understanding. I see. But remember father, your purpose is what you make of it. You don't have to conform to anyone else's expectations or ideals. You just have to find what makes you happy and fulfilled, and pursue that with all your heart. His father smiled weakly, wiping away his tears. Thank you Anas, I'll try to remember that. As Anas stood up, he noticed a piece of paper lying on the table near his anxious mother. It was crumpled and torn as if it had been thrown down in frustration. Anas picked it up and unfolded it his eyes scanning the words. Your son Sid Kajnu has been taken into custody for interrogation. He is the main suspect in the kidnapping accident of the second princess of the Megar kingdom. Anas's heart skipped a beat as he read the words on the paper. Sid, his own brother, had been taken into custody for kidnapping the princess of the Megar kingdom? This was beyond anything he had expected. Just what in the infernal realm did you do, Sid? Anas felt a mixture of emotions swirling within him. Anger at his brother for committing such a stupid act, confusion as to why he would do it, and a sense of failure as a brother for not being able to prevent it. He took a deep breath and looked calmly at his parents, who were still shaken by the news. Mother, father, I need to go. I have to find out what's going on with Sid. His father nodded, his eyes filled with worry. Please be careful, Anas. I know you are strong. More so than what even this old bag of bones can imagine. Father. But. Please, we don't want to lose you too. Anas gave him a reassuring smile. Don't worry, father. I'll be back soon, and I'll make sure to bring Sid home safely. With that, Anas turned and left the Kajino household, his mind racing with thoughts about his brother and the kidnapping. He knew that he needed to find out the truth behind this incident, no matter what it took. As the demon king of tyranny, he was prepared to use all the resources at his disposal to uncover the truth and bring his brother back home. After Anos walked a bit into the forest, he went behind a tree. Got him. Tsu. The next moment, his view changed as he teleported just outside the gate of the academy in the capital city. Anos looked around and saw the commotion in the city, with people whispering about the kidnapping of the princess. He could sense the fear and anxiety in the air, and it only fueled his determination to get to the bottom of this. He walked through the crowded streets, ignoring the curious stares of passers-by and made his way to the visible royal palace in the distance. As he approached the palace gates, he could see the guards standing at attention, their eyes scanning the crowd for any suspicious activity. Anos walked up to the guards casually, and presented his identification. I need to speak with your king immediately. It's a matter of utmost urgency. The guards blinked for a moment, but then one of them drew his sword and pointed it at Anos. Presumptuous! Get out of my face right now! Anas didn't flinch but simply stared at the guard with a steady gaze. I understand your concern, but I assure you that I am not a threat. I only want to speak with your human king, bastard. When he saw that Anas was not backing down, the other guard also drew his sword and glared at him. 
Anus narrowed his eyes a bit as he considered what he should do. He could easily neutralize these humans and then enter forcefully if he want. But he knew that such actions would only create more chaos and complications. He took a deep breath and decided to take a different approach. Listen to me, I am not your enemy, Anus said calmly, raising his hands in a gesture of peace. I am the younger brother of Sid Kajinu, the main suspect behind the kidnapping of the princess, and I have come here to help. Your princess has been kidnapped, and I believe I can assist in her recovery. Let me speak with your king. The guards hesitated for a moment, unsure of what to do. But when they noticed that Anas is weaponless, they exchanged a glance and then lowered their swords. Very well, one of them said. Follow us. Anas nodded and followed the guards as they led him through the palace gates and into the main hall. The hall was filled with humans, all of them looking worried and anxious about the kidnapping. Anas could sense the tension in the air and knew that he needed to act fast. As he walked confidently towards the throne, he heard whispers and murmurs of surprise and curiosity from the humans around him. They were all curious about the daring young man that they'd never seen before. Finally, Anas arrived at the throne and stood before the red-haired king. Your majesty, he said with a polite bow, I am here to offer my assistance in the recovery of your princess. I believe I can find her and bring her back safely. The king looked down from his throne, his face lined with a bit of worry and exhaustion. Who are you? he asked, his voice firm and authoritative. I am Anas Voldegode, the younger brother of the main suspect behind the kidnapping, Anas replied, his voice also firm and confident. When he heard Anas's introduction, the king's eyes glinted in realization as an arrogant smirk crept into his face. So it is you, the brat who dared to embarrass this king a few months ago. I see that you are doing fine, how was the academy life so far? As the king said that with an amused tone, all the noble humans around him snickered and looked at Anas with ridicule in their eyes. However, contrary to their expectations, Anas actually smiled and bowed respectfully toward the king. It was superb. I thank you for your generosity, your majesty. This one is thankful for the three months holiday that I got to spend with my dear mother and father in our territory. The king's eyes twitched as he grimaced at the jab that Anas gave him. The high-ranking nobles around him also became silent as they looked at Anas with wide eyes. How dare this brat talk back to the king of the Midgar kingdom like that? Isn't he just the youngest son of a mere baron? But Anas continued, his smile widening as he looked directly at the king. Your majesty, I hope you didn't think that I forgot about the little incident that happened a few months ago. I merely wanted to take the time to sharpen my skills so that I may serve you better. The king narrowed his eyes, clearly displeased with Anos' response. Is that so? Well, we shall see about that, he said, his voice laced with venom. I have a task for you, Anos. A task that, if you complete it successfully, might earn you back some of the respect you lost in front of me and the rest of the kingdom. Anos raised an eyebrow, intrigued. What kind of task, your majesty? The king leaned forward a wicked grin on his face. He said, his voice low and dangerous, I want you to find and rescue my daughter, alone. But here's the catch, if you fail, your brother will pay the price with his life. The nobles gasped in shock at the king's words. Anas nodded, not caring about the gravity of the situation. I see. I do have a question though. Why do you want me to do this alone? The king leaned back on his throne, his eyes glinting with amusement. But Anus could see a hidden desire in his eyes. Because, Anus, I want to see if you truly have what it takes to be a hero. You see, there are those who doubt your family's loyalty to the kingdom, given your reputation. Anus clenched his jaw, feeling anger boil within him. He knew that his actions and unusual powers would eventually complicate his human family's situation with the kingdom. So he had always tried his best to limit his powers and distance himself from their name. That was the main reason he refused to inherit the Kajino name. It was unfair that they were being judged based on his actions. And he can't do anything about it without drastic consequences. Without hesitation, Anus replied, I accept your task, your majesty. I will find and rescue your daughter. The red-haired king's smirk then disappeared as he leaned back on his throne. Very well, Anus. You have three days to complete this task. I expect results, or your brother will face his execution. The king then threw an insignia toward him. Anas caught it without even looking. Take this with you. It may prove useful on your mission. When the nobles saw the golden item in Anas's hand, their eyes bulged and they immediately made a commotion. W what? 
Why your majesty? Chi giving that to such a low? Silence. The king shouted with an authoritative voice as all the high-ranking nobles flinched and reluctantly returned back to their positions. Anas, I give you full permission to search for the princess, but you must keep us informed of your progress and report back to us as soon as possible. Anas bowed politely once more before turning to leave the throne room. As he made his way through the palace, he could feel the stares of the nobles following him, some of them no doubt hoping for his failure. Anas disregarded the nobles' reactions as he believed that the fate of their human kingdom also hinged on his mission. He never once considered Sid's life to be at risk since the moment he was reincarnated into this world. For Anas, destroying an entire human nation would be a small price to pay if it meant protecting his family. Author Comments Story Reviews equals more chapters Long Comments Long Story Reviews equals long chapters 13. Chapter 7 Claire Cajanu Anus exited the palace gates with a calm demeanor and observed the presence of new guards outside. Approaching one of them, he gazed down at the armed dark knight. W what do you want? The guard exclaimed in alarm, grasping his sword. Despite the hostility, Anas paid him no attention and proceeded to retrieve the golden insignia given to him by the king from his pocket. The guard noticed the emblem and paled instantly, dropping to his knees with cold sweat on his face. He apologized profusely to Anas. Forgive me, sir. I was unaware that you possessed the royal emblem. Thoma. Anas gave a nod in response before continuing on his way. Passing by the other guards who had also spotted the insignia, they instantly stood at attention, saluting him. Upon leaving the palace grounds and entering the street, Anas examined the small emblem in his hand. The reactions of the humans confirmed that the king's gift was a rare and precious item in the country with probably fewer than three such insignia in the whole kingdom. This realization reassured Anas that the king was not behind the princess's kidnapping. Anas breathed a sigh of relief as he realized that the worst-case scenario had been averted. He was grateful that he no longer needed to resort to extreme measures like killing the king to rescue his brother. As he walked through the palace gates earlier, Anas had been mentally half-preparing himself to obliterate the entire castle with his magic. Had the human king been conspiring against his own brother, he would never have entrusted such a valuable item to Anas, especially when it gave Anas such a high level of authority over his kingdom's men. Anas walked through the bustling streets of the capital, his mind focused on the task at hand. He needed to find a lead on the whereabouts of Sid. As he made his way through the crowd, Anas overheard a group of human knights discussing a recent prisoner interrogation done by the first princess. When he heard them, Anas quickly approached the soldiers and inquired about the prisoner. The soldiers hesitated at first, but upon seeing the royal emblem in Anas' possession, they quickly divulged the details of the interrogation. Anas learned that his brother was indeed the one being interrogated and that he was taken to a nearby garrison five days ago. A wave of relief washed over Anas upon receiving the news. Finally, he had a solid lead on his brother's whereabouts. While Anas had the power to teleport directly to Sid's location, he knew it would create more harm than good. Thus, he nodded appreciatively at the knights before hastening his steps toward the said garrison. As he approached the garrison, Anas took a moment to observe the area. The garrison was heavily guarded, and any attempt to enter unnoticed would be futile. Anas grew suspicious as he observed the number of guards stationed at the garrison. This is strange, he thought to himself. Why are they using so many personnel for just one student? A nagging feeling of concern began to creep up inside him as he considered the possibility that something may have happened to his brother. With that unsettling thought in mind, Anas quickly moved toward the front gate. As Anas approached the front gate of the garrison, he noticed the guards on duty eyeing him with suspicion. He could tell that they were scrutinizing his every move, trying to determine whether he was a threat or not. But Anas remained calm and collected, knowing that he had the royal emblem in his possession. Who goes there? One of the guards called out to him, raising his hand to block Anas' path. Anas pulled out the golden insignia and held it up for the guards to see. I am Anas Voldegode, brother to Sid. I have come to retrieve my brother from this garrison. The startled guards exchanged a glance before one of them stepped forward. We have received no orders to release any prisoners. We cannot allow you to enter without proper authorization from our commanding officer. Another guard also said arrogantly, "He." Huh? Even if you have the royal emblem with you, our commanding officer is Iris Sama herself, the first princess of the Migar kingdom. 
Anus narrowed his eyes, feeling a surge of anger rise within him. He knew that time was of the essence, and he couldn't afford to waste any more time. Without saying a word, he stepped forward and pushed the guards aside, walking confidently into the garrison. You, one of the guards moved to stop him. Know your place, human. Anus waved his hand dismissively, unleashing a powerful burst of magic that sent the guard flying into the wall behind him with a loud crash. As he lay unconscious, Anus fixed the steely gaze on the guards ahead of him, who quickly parted to make way for him. They trembled and clutched their swords tightly, but dared not raise them against him. Hmph. Anus strode forward, deeper into the garrison. His tyrannical gaze was more than enough to force even the bravest dark knights to move aside pitifully. Is that it for your report? asks a beautiful girl with red hair the shade of flames. The red hair that reaches all the way down her back glitters in the candlelight, as her wine-red eyes flash over the investigative report. That imposing, beautiful figure of hers makes the reporting knight's cheeks dye red. Th- dash, that is all, Iris Sama. We will continue our investigation. Iris nods and then gestures for the knight to leave the room. When the door closes, only Iris and a handsome, blonde-haired man are left alone in the room. Marquis Zinan, thank you very much for your help this time. The incident occurred on school grounds, so I am also partly responsible. But more than that, I am also worried about Alexia Sama. Zenon looks down and bites his lower lip in frustration. You also have your duties as the swordsmanship instructor. I am sure no one would find fault with you for this. For now, what we should focus on is not who to blame, but to safely rescue Alexia. Indeed. So, Iris suddenly closes the report folder. How sure are you of the probability of this student Sid Kajina being the culprit? I am also loath to consider a student of the academy a culprit, but circumstances show him to be the most suspicious. But when considering his strength, it is highly unlikely for him to win if he faces off against Alexia Sama in a direct fight. Zenon chose his words carefully while replying. In which case, it would either mean that he has an accomplice, or that he had to have used drugs of some sort. But he didn't confess to anything even under the interrogation of the knights, right? Are you sure about this? I want to believe in him. I truly do. Iris nods and then closes her eyes. I shall pray for Alexia Sama's safety. With a bow, Zenon turns to exit the room. But at that very moment, a single girl slides into the room through the door that Zenon had just opened. Iris Sama, please listen to me. Claire Quinn, what do you think you are doing? Please pardon her rudeness. I'll bring her back out immediately. Zenon seizes the girl who just slid in, Claire Cajanu, and tries to drag her out. Marquis Zenon, who is this? Iris stops Zenon and asks. She's... My name is Claire Cajanu. I am Sid Cajanu's older sister. Claire Quinn. S- dash, she is an exemplary student at the academy, and is currently temporarily with the Knight Order on a sort of experience program. I see. Very well, you may speak. Thank you very much. Claire Cajanu kneels before Iris in desperation. My little brother, Sid, would never do something like kidnapping Princess Alexia. I'm sure there must be some big mistake here. The Knight Order is conducting their investigation with the utmost caution so that there would be no mistakes. It is still not yet confirmed that your younger brother is the culprit. But the way things are currently going, if the real culprit is not found, it will be him who gets executed. The Knight Order is being very careful. They will not mistakenly execute the wrong person. But still, Claire Quinn. Xenon stops Claire as she frantically tries to press closer to Iris. Claire Quinn, leave it at that. Any more and it would be a provocation to the Knight Order. Coo. Claire glares first at Xenon, then at Iris. If anything happens to that child. Claire Quinn, don't you dare finish that sentence. Covering Claire's mouth with his hand, Xenon drags Claire out of the room. Bam. Staring at the forcefully closed door, Iris sighs deeply. So our love for our family is the same, huh? She murmurs. Alexia, please be safe. Long ago, these two sisters were very close. But when was it that they began to pass by each other? How many years has it been since they last talked? Could it be that they would never again be able to talk with each other? Alexia. As she closes her wine-red eyes, a single tear rolls down her cheek. As he walked down the dimly lit hallway, Anos noticed that the doors to the prison cells were heavily reinforced, with multiple guards standing watch. But he remained confident, knowing that he had the power to overcome any obstacle. Suddenly, he heard a voice coming from the other end of the hallway, 
and he stopped in his tracks. It was a girl's voice. No. Ku dash. Let me go. Sid. Your sister is coming for you. From those words alone. Anus instantly recognized the voice of the person being restrained as Claire, the oldest daughter of the Kajina family, and his own older sister who was attending the academy together with Sid. Anus immediately quickened his pace toward the source of the commotion. As he approached the origin of the voice, Anus could see that Claire was struggling against the grasp of several dark knights who were holding her captive. He noticed that her face was bruised and her uniform was torn, indicating that she had been roughed up. Anus didn't hesitate and raised his hand, summoning a powerful surge of magic that knocked the knights off their feet and sent them flying across the hallway. Claire fell to the ground, gasping for breath. Are you okay? Anus asked, helping her to her feet. I'm fine, Claire replied, a bit dazed. But Sid is in there. Anus shifted his focus to the heavily guarded cell before him, sensing a barrier encasing the lock. But to him, it was a trivial task to break it open. He stepped forward and raised his hand again, channeling his magic toward the barrier. D. The energy crackled around his fingertips as he focused his power, and with a loud boom, the barrier shattered into a million pieces. The guard's standing watch looked on in shock and fear as Anas approached the cell and effortlessly tore open the reinforced door. Inside, he saw his brother Sid bound and gagged, with bruises and cuts covering his face. A blur passed beside him and tackled Sid into a hug. Sid, are you okay? What happened to you? Sid looked up, his eyes widening in recognition. Nason, you came, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Examining his injuries, Claire knelt beside him and asked, Who did this to you? Her voice was filled with anguish, and tears welled up in her eyes as she saw the blood covering her little Sid's body and his missing nails. Looking at the state of both his siblings, Anas clenched his fists his rage boiling over to dangerous levels. Where do you think you're going? His hands then moved at horrifying speed and grasped the necks of the two guards sneaking beside him. Did you really believe that sneaking around would be enough to hide from me? He growled. Arg. Ah. His grip on the guards tightened, his eyes cold and unyielding. Answer me, he demanded in a low and dangerous voice as a dark aura began to emanate from his body. The guards struggled to breathe as their faces turned red from the lack of air. Finally, one of them managed to gasp out a response. We were just obeying orders, he said, his voice shaking. Crack. Anas's terrible aura intensified with each passing second, causing even the ground beneath his feet to fracture under the pressure. Orders? The orders of Princess Iris Sama, the guard replied. Anas released them, and the guards stumbled to the ground, gasping for air. He turned to Claire and said, You both need to leave this place immediately, he said. I'll handle everything here. Griga. A tiny crimson flame flickered to life at the tip of Anas's index finger. He aimed it at the concrete wall and let it fly. The flame made contact with the surface and erupted into a powerful inferno, blasting a massive hole in the wall. Sunlight flooded the area, illuminating the dark prison. Eh? Huh? Claire and Sid were left in awe by the immense power of the seemingly small flame as Anas strode back into the heart of the garrison. His face was twisted in a terrifying scowl as he searched for the one responsible for harming his family. Anus was fed up with these humans and their ignorance, always giving him reasons to consider destroying humanity regardless of the era. He could feel his patience wearing thin. These humans had no idea who they were dealing with, and he was more than willing to remind them. 11. Chapter 8. Demon Blood When Alexia opened her eyes, she found herself in a dim room. No window and only a single lit candle. The walls are stone, and a sturdy-looking door is right in front. This is... She has no memory of anything after separating from Pochi after school. When she tries to move her body, she hears the clinking of metal rubbing against metal. Looking toward the origin of the sound, she realizes that all four of her limbs are chained to a pedestal. Magic sealing chains. She cannot use her magic. Escaping by herself would be difficult in the extreme. Exactly who was it that took her away, and for what purpose? Kidnapping, coercion, human trafficking, a train of possibilities flit through her mind, but there's no way to confirm. Alexia is not in the line of succession for the crown, but her status as a princess still has a certain amount of utility value. This she knows. However, the information she has on hand at the moment is really too little to draw any conclusions with. Alexia stops thinking about it. But then a different thought suddenly comes up in her head. 
Is Pochi all right? The boy with a terrible personality who had recently become her friend. She is quite fond of him because he always says things to her straight without any fear. If he was truly caught up in this, then by now he is probably. Let's stop there. Alexia shakes her head, then looks around. Stone walls, iron door, candle stand, and a black mound that looks like trash. That mound is right next to Alexia, and for some reason is chained up. Upon closer inspection, Alexia notices a slight movement. It is breathing. The mound is a living creature wearing tattered rags. You there, can you hear my viol? The creature moves and looks at Alexia. The creature is a monster. It is an extremely emaciated monster restrained with chains. Its black, festering face only barely retains what seems to be eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Its entire body is bloated in a non-uniform manner, with its left arm even longer than Alexia's leg. In contrast, its right arm is shorter and thinner than Alexia's own and seems to be affixed to its chest as if clutching something. Such a monster is right beside Alexia. Whereas Alexia has all four limbs chained up, that monster is only chained by its neck. If it reaches out with its long arm, it might actually be able to reach Alexia. In order to not aggravate the monster, Alexia lowers the sound of her breathing and looks away. But the monster is looking at her. Alexia can feel the monster's gaze on her body. After a period of silence that seems as if time had stopped. Jairara, the sound of chains rings in the air. Peering from the corner of her eye, Alexia sees that the monster has curled up and gone to sleep. Alexia breathes a sigh of relief. After another while, the door in front is opened. Finally, finally, I have gotten my hands on it. The person who comes in is a skinny man wearing a lab coat. His cheeks are hollow, his eyes are sunken, and his lips are cracked. His sparse hair is sticking to his skin and giving off a horrible smell. Alexia quietly observes the man. Blood of the royals, blood of the royals, blood of the royals, blood of the royals. The man continues to repeat that phrase while taking out a contraption connected to a thin needle. It seems that he intends to draw her blood. The royal physicians have done it to her a few times before, so she recognizes what that contraption is. But, she does not understand why this man wants her blood so badly that he would go to the trouble of kidnapping her. May I ask something? Alexia's voice is steady. N-N-N? The man replies to Alexia with some weird grunting. Why do you want my blood? Why dash, why dash, your blood is demonic blood. It can revive the demons in this day and age. Alexia has no idea what he's talking about, but at least she can gather that he is not right in his head and that he is in some sort of a cult. But it would be a bit of a problem if you draw too much of my blood. I'm not quite ready to die yet. Hi 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 and dash, no worries. I want a, a lot so I'll see dash, come every day to d dash, drain a little at a time. Wonderful, let's go with that then. As long as this man needs her blood, then chances are low that she would be killed. Do not resist, remain cooperative. Alexia determined that her best choice of action at the moment is to wait for rescue. It, it wasn't supposed to dash, to be like this. It was all the F dash, fault of those I dash, idiots. I understand I hate idiots too. Because dealing with you is tiring, whispers Alexia to herself while looking at the man in the lab coat. N dash, my research, all, all destroyed. They got to that idiot Alba first. That's right. That idiot Alba was the first. After that, again and again, an A-G-A-I-N-N-N-N. a r r he How terrible. It must have been hard on you. Yes, yes it was. My, my research is so close. So close, so close. But if I don't finish it, I'll, I'll be excommunicated. dash, excommunicated. What, how could they? S-H dash, shit. So useless, so useless. The man in the lab coat rushes toward the chained up monster and kicks it violently. Again and again, he kicks it and stomps on it. The monster simply curls up and does not react. Weren't you going to draw my blood? Oh right, oh right, your blood. As long as I have your blood I can finish. Isn't that great? The man picks up the contraption and sticks the needle into Alexia's arm. With this, with this. I can finish. I won't be excommunicated. Please do it painlessly, okay? Otherwise, I'd want to punch you, adds Alexia inside her mind. The needle enters Alexia's arm. Alexia looks on like it's someone else's business as the glass container is gradually filled with red blood. Hi 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 hi. When the glass container is fully filled, the man cradles it with utmost care and leaves the room.
Alexia waits for the door to close before heaving a long sigh. Xenon Griffey, the swordsmanship instructor at the Midgar Royal Spellsword Academy and Alexia Midgar's fiancé, hurried down the garrison hallway. With his blonde hair and chiseled physique, he was admired by many of the female populace and had a reputation as a friendly and popular man. However, this persona was just the facade to hide his true self. In reality, Xenon was a self-entitled, delusional individual with a massive ego. He constantly boasted about his accomplishments and believed he deserved fame and glory. He often looked down on others, including Alexia, whom he mocked for her lackluster performance and made snide apologies for comparing her to her sister. Growing up, Xenon was hailed as a wonder child after winning numerous tournaments, and he eventually climbed to the position of swordsmanship instructor. In the Midgar Kingdom, every swordsman knew the name Xenon Griffey. Unbeknownst to all, Xenon was secretly affiliated with the cult of Diablos and had ambitions to become one of the Knights of Rounds. The cult recognized his strength but noted that he lacked achievements. Xenon saw an opportunity when the king arranged a marriage between him and Princess Alexia. He realized that he could take her royal blood and offer it to the Order of Diablos for their experiment. As Xenon began training students at the academy, Alexia started dating Sid, a lower-class aristocrat. Xenon confronted her telling her that she would grow out of it and eventually see him as the better choice. However, she rebuffed him, and Xenon merely smiled at her attempts to get a rise out of him. Xenon later abducted Alexia in secret and framed Sid for the crime. During Sid's interrogation, Xenon and his accomplices severely beat him, but despite his injuries, Sid refused to confess. Xenon then met with Iris Midgar and expressed his guilt over Alexia's kidnapping. He provided a report on Sid's interrogation omitting the torture that had taken place over the course of five days. Iris ultimately decided to release Sid but instructed him to keep a close eye on him. As he now reluctantly made his way towards Sid's cell to set him free, a loud boom echoed through the area, causing the entire garrison building to tremble. Xenon was immediately alerted, he put a hand on his sword and dashed towards the origin of the explosion. Who is it? Is it the Shadow Garden? As he neared the scene of the explosion, a figure came into view, strolling casually towards him with a scowl etched on his face. Xenon comes to a halt, ready to intercept the unknown man. Who are you? How dare you? Xenon's words were cut short by a forceful slap across his face, sending him crashing into the wall and causing his sword to clatter uselessly to the ground. He was left dazed and disoriented, struggling to regain his footing as the imposing stranger loomed over him. Gazing up into the man's glowing eyes, Xenon felt a shiver of fear run down his spine. With a sense of apprehension, Xenon muttered, I didn't even see him moving. This man gives me a bad feeling. He nervously reached for the bottle of red pills that he kept on his belt, clutching it tightly in his hand. The stranger noticed the movement and snatched the bottle from Xenon's hand before he could even react. With a scowl, he twisted off the cap and emptied the pills onto the ground. You won't be needing those, human he said in a cold tone. Damn it! Xenon scrambled to his feet, fury coursing through him. He lunged at the man, throwing punches and kicks, but the stranger easily dodged them all with lightning-fast movements. Xenon soon realized that this was no ordinary man he was highly skilled and dangerous. As the altercation continued, Xenon began to notice something peculiar about his opponent. There was an unearthly quality to his movements they were too fluid, too precise to belong to a mere human. Then, in an instant, the stranger vanished into thin air. Confused and caught off guard, Xenon was suddenly struck with tremendous force in his stomach, causing him to double over in agony. The light quickly faded from his eyes as he slumped to the ground, unconscious. Anas sneered with disdain as he observed the fallen knight on the ground, muttering pathetic, under his breath. He briefly glanced at the scattered red pills before continuing on his way, his previous scowl now replaced by a neutral expression. It seemed that he had vented most of his anger on the weak human who had stood in his way. As he walked, Aina suddenly sensed a familiar presence nearby. His senses immediately went on high alert, and he listened carefully, trying to identify the source of the energy. After a moment, he recognized the weak energy signature it belonged to a fellow demon. Anas promptly made his way to the source of the energy, and his path led him to a closed door. Without hesitation, he lifted his leg and blasted the metallic door out of its hinges. Beyond the door, he could see a set of stairs leading down to an underground tunnel. 
Anus descended the stairs, his red eyes scanning his surroundings for any signs of danger. He could sense the faint energy of another demon nearby, but he couldn't identify their exact location. He knew that he had to be careful. This was the first time he had sensed the demon's presence in this world, albeit a feeble one, akin to that of an infant. As he reached the bottom of the stairs, Anos saw a group of humans gathered in a dimly lit chamber. They turned to face him as he entered, their expressions wary. Anos recognized some of them as members of this country's dark nights. What are you doing here? One of them demanded, his tone hostile. Anos raised an eyebrow. I could ask you the same thing, human, he replied coolly. Noticing the extremely calm demeanor of Anos, the humans unexpectedly relaxed and returned back to their work. As Anos tilted his head in confusion, one of them approached him nervously. So you are the backup sent by the order? W what is your code name? What is the meaning of this? Anos demanded, his voice laced with authority. Ah. F forgive me, sir. The individual flinched and gazed upon Anos with a sense of apprehension and unease, while he looked behind him with a desperate expression, hoping for aid from the onlookers who deliberately averted their eyes. However, a towering figure draped in a black cloak emerged from the group and approached them. Ahem W who are you? W when did you reach the capital? The large man asked, his voice trembling as he felt pressured under the domineering gaze of Anus's glowing eyes. I am Anus Voldegod, the demon king of tyranny, Anus replied, his tone cold and unyielding. And you are in my way. The onlookers gasped and hurriedly moved out of his way. It was an unwritten norm that members bearing the label demon held the highest rank in the cult of Diablos. However, the figure in the black cloak refused to yield. Why you may be from the order's tops, be but this is our territory, the man said, his voice shaking but determined. We will not let you interfere with our plans. Anus arched an eyebrow, noticing how these humans kept making assumptions without verifying anything. After a brief moment of contemplation, Anus concluded that he could capitalize on this situation. What plans? he asked. The man hesitated for a moment before answering. Our team is exploring the possible applications of royal blood. We have reason to believe that it contains a significant amount of demon blood. We have already obtained the second princess of this kingdom, and are currently conducting research. Anas suppressed a smirk. These humans were clueless. I see, he said slowly. And how do you plan to use this demon blood? The man seemed taken aback by the question. W. We haven't figured that out yet, he admitted. Anos couldn't help but chuckle at their naivety. Let me handle this, he said, stepping forward. I will take care of the experiments. I happen to be fairly versed in the demon blood. The man looked skeptical, but he didn't object. Anos could sense that the humans were desperate for any help they could get. Lead me to the subject, Anos said, and the group quickly obliged, leading him through the underground tunnels to a large chamber. In the center of the room were a large blackboard and various sophisticated laboratory equipment. Anus walked up to the blackboard and studied the formulas and equations written on it. It seemed like the humans had made some progress in their research, but they were still far from harnessing the full potential of demon blood. Anus turned to the group. What have you discovered so far? One of the humans stepped forward and nervously explained their findings. They had found that royal blood had a higher concentration of demon blood but they were still unsure about its properties and potential applications. Anus nodded thoughtfully. I see, he said. Let me take a look at the samples. Anus was shown the vials of royal blood that the humans had gathered, and he scrutinized them meticulously. He could barely detect faint traces of his blood flowing within the liquid, and he realized that, with the correct knowledge and techniques, it could be utilized for formidable purposes. However, his inspection was suddenly interrupted when a man with glasses and a lab coat burst into the room from a closed door, pointing his finger accusingly at Anas and exclaiming, H -h 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 H H H H H H You! What are you doing? Don't you dare TT touch that! Anas narrowed his eyes in confusion and glanced inquisitively at the startled human standing alongside him. You him, he's the leading scientist of this laboratory, was the awkward response he got from one of them. You! You, why, why you, unsightly, slap, Anos swiftly backhanded the screaming mad scientist who had approached him. With a sharp blow, the man's glasses flew off and his head was severed from his body, sending a fountain of blood spewing from his neck. The lifeless body collapsed to the ground, devoid of its head. What ash? Shit! Anos ignored the horrified humans 
as he cautiously made his way through the door that the scientist came from, his heightened senses on full alert. The stale air filled his lungs, and the sound of his footsteps echoed off the stone walls. The energy signature of the other demon grew stronger, indicating that it was nearby. Suddenly, he heard a low growl emanating from the darkness ahead. Anus tensed, preparing himself for a potential threat. As he rounded the corner, he saw a figure crouched on the ground, snarling and baring its sharp teeth. Anus narrowed his eyes, studying the creature. It was a demon, but unlike any he had seen before. It was small, almost childlike, with its entire body bloated in a non-uniform manner and large, bat-like eyes. Its claws were razor-sharp, and its eyes glowed with a feral intensity. The creature's eyes widened at an inhuman level when it noticed Anus. Greyawa, roe away it roared before cowering pitifully in a corner. Anus took a step forward, not intimidated by the demon's display of aggression. He recognized the terrible fear in its eyes and knew that it posed no threat to him. Slowly, he approached the trembling creature and extended his hand. It's okay, child, he said in a calm voice. I won't hurt you. The frightened demon hesitated for a moment before slowly reaching out and sniffing Anus' hand. It let out a soft growl before nuzzling its head against his palm. Good girl. Anas smiled, feeling a sense of compassion for the frightened creature. 14. Chapter 9. Shadow Garden. To clarify what happened after Nasan and I escaped through the hole in the wall, it's a simple story. Hey, stop right there. The Dark Knight stationed outside the building nabbed me and tossed me back again into another cell. Nice try you little shit. No. Coup dash. Sid. Leave him. What is going on here? While Nason fought vehemently to stop them, a striking red-haired girl suddenly appeared and ordered my release. She was probably an important character or something, as I later discovered she was none other than Iris Midgar herself, this kingdom's first princess. After the first princess Iris dragged my Nason away for some questioning, I was left to my own devices. Get a move on, you fucker. My back is pushed roughly as I am effectively evicted from the gate of the garrison. Then my belongings are thrown out right after me. As I am now only in my underwear, I pick up my clothes and shoes and put them on right there and then. Because I no longer have fingernails on either hand, it takes a bit longer than usual. After I finish arranging myself, I heave a sigh and then walk off. Dear Brother Anus Kuhn, it is crucial that you do not approach things with a half-hearted effort like this. Because it really sucks. If you decide to start a rescue event, then it is your responsibility as a last boss character to ensure its completion. Mom, Dad, look, hey, yeah, the pedestrians going to and fro that I pass all stare at my scratches and bloody appearance. I heave another sigh. Stay calm, me. Stay calm. What's the point of flipping out over a few small potatoes? I try my best to not remember the face of the knight who interrogated me while maintaining a calm mind. They were merely doing their job. My wounds are all only superficial, and I can grow my fingernails back whenever I want. The only reason why I don't is to fully act out my mob character. Yes, I am the very definition of calm. Tranquility. I take a deep breath. My vision widens back up. Probing with my senses, I notice some suspicious presence. They put two tails on me, huh? The kidnapper is yet to be found. Naturally, Alexia's safety is still unconfirmed. My head is not so full of daisies that I think I have been acquitted. They didn't have enough evidence, but my name is definitely still on the list of suspects. I keep my face down and pretend to be haggard and exhausted while making my way back to my dorm. Along the way, later, a really, really tiny voice reaches my ears, accompanied by the faint smell of a familiar perfume. Alpha, huh? The avenues are extremely crowded in the evenings. Her figure is nowhere to be seen. Having returned to my dorm room, I turn on the lights. From the shadows, a young girl reveals herself. You wanna eat? She is wearing a tight bodysuit that seems to be emphasizing her recently acquired assets. In her hand is a thick sandwich filled with tuna, bought from the famous store Magronald in the royal capital. Thanks. It's been a while, hasn't it Alpha? What happened to Beta? I haven't had anything proper to eat for five days straight, so I attacked the sandwich with gusto. Beta was the one who had been supporting me recently. Beta? That girl. She can't bear to stay anywhere near him. So, since I was close to the capital, I took her place temporarily. Alpha answered as her voice turned cold when she said the word him. This is very suspicious. 
How did he manage to enter the capital without us noticing? What in the world is Zeta doing? Wasn't she assigned to keep a watchful eye on him? Noticing the tension in the air every time Alpha said him, I decided it was best not to ask about him. Do you think? As I ate my meal, Alpha waited for my reply with a gaze fixed upon me. So, I responded with some random nonsense. Too early, it is not the time yet. Hearing me, Alpha narrowed her eyes and muttered slowly. I see. As we thought, he's on their side. Pretty much. I replied without much thought as I looked at the sandwich in my hands. I heard from Beta. Seems things have gotten a bit troublesome, HM? She sits on my bed and crosses her legs. Both her silky blonde hair and long slitted blue eyes seem somehow nostalgic. In the short time that she's left my sight, she has grown up so much. Guess so. I throw the last scrap of the sandwich into my mouth. There's water in that. T checks. I drain the large cup in one breath. Phew, back to life. I throw off my shoes and coat, then dive into my bed. At least change your clothes first. Nah, gonna sleep. You, do you even understand the situation you are in? I'll leave the preparations to you. Alpha is super capable. By giving her free reign, I am sure she will prepare the most wonderful stage for me. Perhaps one day, I might even introduce her to my younger brother Anas. I'm sure he will appreciate her expertise. She can teach him about how to properly plan his last boss events and stuff. But until then, I am going to sleep. I mean conserve my strength. Alpha sighs deeply. I'm sure you understand this. But the way things are currently developing, this will be pinned on you. Probably, yeah. As long as the real culprit is not found, it is almost certain that the one under the most suspicion would be executed. Especially since this case is the kidnapping of a member of royalty. Someone's head has to fly, or else the case can't be closed. Yay for the Middle Ages. The situation is no longer a probability. That arrogant bastard visited the palace today and made it inevitable. To make matters worse, he even made it like you tried to escape. For a brief moment, Alpha's demeanor became ominous. And then she proceeded to bite her lower lip with a scary expression. I am unsure why you allowed him to live for such an extended period. But you must have a grand plan beyond our comprehension. Who the hell is him? Was what I wanted to say. But I just hummed wisely as I looked mysteriously at the ceiling. Get up. I have another sandwich. I'm up. I received the sandwich from Alpha. Other than him, there is also another movement to actively frame you as the culprit for this. He, even though I would become it automatically if left alone, they probably want to resolve things quickly. An average performing son of a poor baron family is the perfect scapegoat. Agreed. I'd do the same too if I were them. The knights cannot be trusted. The order has moles inside? Without a doubt. It was the order who kidnapped her. Their aim is probably her thick blood of the heroes. Alpha and the girls are still sticking to the whole order of Davalos setting for me. How considerate of them. Do you think she's still alive? You can't draw blood from a dead person, right? Good point. Though we can't seem to understand why you decided to take part in a romance story with a princess. So says Alpha while frowning at me with half-closed eyes. It is not what it seems. I'm sure you must have another great plan for that too. Something that you can't tell us. I evade Alpha's eyes as she tries to peer into mine. And of course, I remain silent. Because I don't have any really big reason. It's fine, we understand that you're shouldering something really big. What do I do if I'm not actually shouldering anything as important as she's making it sound? But I just want to say, please trust us a little bit more. Even this time, if you had given us a heads up in advance, things wouldn't have blown to such proportions. Right. Alright, alright. Anyways, don't worry about it anymore. It's our job to follow up after you. So saying, Alpha smiles at me. When this incident is all resolved, treat me to Magronald. That second sandwich was my share, actually. Sure thing. Sorry for eating your share too. Don't mind it. Alpha stands up, opens the window, and puts a foot through. Her small hip sways. I'm going now. You just keep low for a while. Got it. What's the plan? I'm going to gather numbers. We currently don't have enough people in the capital. Also, I'm going to call Delta too. You're going to call her too? She said she really misses you? Delta the loose cannon. Or by another name, Delta the suicide weapon. To put it simply, she's basically an idiot spec solely for battle. Since it's been a while, guess everyone wants to host a reunion or something like that. I sincerely hope that they're all living decent, respectable lives. 
I'll tell you the details after the preparations are over. Well then, after flashing me one last smile, Alpha covers her face with the bodysuit and then disappears through the window. Everything was for the sake of this day. The next day after my release from the nights, I am in my dorm room, sorting through my power and shadows collection and picking out what I can use. Cigar. It'll be a long while yet until when I would be of the appropriate age to use it well. Vintage wine. This is a rare one from Porta in southwestern France that is worth 900,000 zenny. Good, this is just right for the moonless night tonight. This means I need the ultimate glass to go with this. Ah yes, the only glass made by Vitan. This is also French made, and cost me 45,000 zenny. Then there's also this antique lamp. And this, this too, oh right. And this legendary painting called The Scream that I had coincidentally picked up that time. It goes on the wall like so, and ah, perfect. My heart feels so full. Bandit hunting and crawling on the ground picking up gold coins was all for the sake of this. I shed a tear of admiration for this room that I had decorated with the very best items from my collection. How I longed for Anus Kun to witness this accomplishment. He would surely be immensely proud of his elder brother. Unfortunately, ever since the rescue event in the prison, he has been nowhere to be found. The coup de grace is this invitation that I received just today. Then all that's left to do is to wait. I continue waiting for that moment. Waiting. Waiting. Waiting in suspense. Until. Finally. The moment the girl clad in black comes in through the window. I open my mouth. The time has come. Tonight shall belong to the world of shadows. Verily. Everything was for the sake of this very day. The time has come. Tonight shall belong to the world of shadows. Those were the words that greeted Beta the moment she got to Shadow's place. Shadow is sitting in a chair with his legs crossed and his back to Beta. The back looks defenseless. But Beta knows that it is the furthest thing in the world. In his hand is a wine glass glittering under the light of an antique lamp. And the wine that he is drinking without a care, even Beta, who knows almost nothing about wine, recognizes the label as one of the most precious in the world. Beta is shocked at seeing the various first-grade items decorating the room until she notices the painting on the wall. It is Munch's The Scream. It is known as a phantom treasure that cannot be attained regardless of how much wealth one is willing to offer. Beta almost wanted to ask how on earth he got his hands on it, but then realized that there would be no meaning in such a question. Because it is him. That's why. That single phrase is more than sufficient explanation in and of itself. The fact that he owns The Scream feels only natural. More like, it could be said that there is no one in the entire world more fitting to own this item. The world of shadows. It's true that with the moon hidden, tonight is indeed a world most fitting for us, says Beta. Shadow gives Beta a single glance, then only brings the glass to his lips again. All the preparation is ready. I see. He already knows everything. So sagacious is his voice, that Beta feels herself almost hallucinating so. Actually, he most definitely already knows everything that Beta will tell him now. But even so, Beta will say them. For this is her mission. Under Alpha Sama's order, everyone nearby who could move has been gathered in the royal capital. Our total number is 114. 114? Is it too few? Considering Shadow Garden's battle strength, this should be sufficient though. But, no. Beta realizes that she has misunderstood. 114 random riffraff would, in the end, be but supporting actors. In truth, the ones who truly matter are not even 10% of that number. And tonight, he is the main character. The moment she realizes that the role of the supporting actors is to show up the main character, then 114 is truly, truly too little. W dash, we're so so dash. Extras, huh? His words cut off Beta's apology. What is an extra? Beta does not understand the meaning of that word. No matter. Don't mind it. That was just me talking to myself. Yes, my lord. Beta knows better than to ask any further. Every single thing he says contains meaning so deep that Beta cannot even imagine how far it goes. She has neither the privilege nor the strength to ask. But still, one day, she will stand next to him. And she will be strong enough to support him in everything he does. That goal is what fuels Beta's very being. One day, for the sake of that day, she will definitely kill that trash. The audacious trash that dares to refer to himself as Shadow Sama's little brother. The mere thought of that damn self-important disgusting face is causing Beta to feel nauseated. 
Beta shock her head and continues speaking. The strategy is to simultaneously attack all hideouts of the Fenrir branch of the Order of Dabalos that are scattered across the royal capital. While attacking, we will also search for Princess Alexia's magic signature. The moment her position is confirmed, we will immediately change gears towards her protection and extraction. Shadow only nods, as an indication for her to continue. Overall command will be handled by Gamma, but the unseen command will be taken by Alpha Sama, with me as support. Epsilon will be in charge of logistical support, and Delta will spearhead the attacks and initiate the start signal. The composition of each squad is, before Beta goes into further detail, Shadow raises one hand to stop her. In his hand is a single piece of paper. It's an invitation. After catching the letter that was thrown her way, she reads it as instructed. This is an invitation that was written so badly that it makes Beta both exasperated and furious. I'm sorry for Delta, but I will be the one to play the prelude. Yes, my lord. I will make the arrangements. Come along, Beta. So saying, he turns around. Tonight the world shall learn of our existence. Beta is shivering with the delight of being allowed to fight by Shadow-sama's side. As she thought, that thing doesn't deserve to be blood-related to Shadow-sama. In her mind that arrogant trash does not deserve to be considered Shadow-sama's kin. It is a heinous crime against the Shadow Garden to permit such a thing to exist. One day, she would certainly eradicate him. Just bide your time, Anas Voldegode. 11. Chapter 10. Milia's Decision. Milia Oroba the only child and family of Viscount Alba, was a lovely young girl with gray hair resembling her father's. She adorned a dress in two bows, one atop her head and the other tied behind her back, while also carrying a teddy bear everywhere she went. Unfortunately, Milia's life took a drastic turn when she woke up one morning to find a small portion of her left arm had turned dark for no apparent reason. Despite her confusion, she concealed the discoloration with long, white gloves, not wanting to cause any trouble for her single father, who was already weighed down as the head of the Orba Viscount family and a royal guard of the Megar kingdom. As time passed, the dark spot on her arm grew progressively larger, but Milia continued to hide it, hoping it would eventually heal on its own. One day, while attending a tea party with other noble daughters, Milia spilled hot tea on her gloves and impulsively removed them, exposing the unsightly blemish. The other girls noticed, and from then on, Milia's life became a living nightmare as she was discovered to have demon possession. You are, Milia, why? Just why? Pipapa? Her father was horrified upon learning the truth and Milia hugged her teddy bear anxiously while attempting to comfort him as he broke down in tears. The next day, Milia was abducted by the cult of Diablos, who offered to cure her of her demon possession in exchange for her father's service. Sadly, Two years later Alba was killed by Shadow Garden when he kidnapped Claire Kajiro. But Milia has no way to know that. So even now, she believes her father is still alive. Papa. Milia remained in the cult's custody ever since, waiting and praying every day for her already dead father to save her. After four years of living in hell, Milia was heavily mutated due to demonic possession, and she barely looked human at all. She was kept in a laboratory hidden at Midgar Kingdom where she was subjected to horrendous experiments and constantly abused by a scientist that worked for the cult. Over the years, Milia witnessed numerous young girls brought to this wretched place, just like herself. Sadly, all of them ended up transforming into hideous, unrecognizable masses of flesh. Milia was the sole exception, managing to maintain some semblance of a functional humanoid form. As a result, she was the only one to survive out of the dozens of girls who had been brought to this horrific place. However, Milia's resilience came at a cost. After enduring endless pain and torture, she had become numb to any emotion, and her mutated skin had grown so thick that the mad scientist's relentless beatings barely registered as a minor inconvenience. Despite being the only one to survive out of all the girls brought to the laboratory, Milia was barely alive. The experiments and torture had taken their toll leaving her in a perpetual state of silent agony. Milia's once lovely features were now unrecognizable, replaced by a monstrous appearance that made her the subject of fear and disgust for everyone who saw her. Her gray hair had turned a sickly shade of white, and her once innocent blue eyes had lost all their light, now having a black scara and red iris. Another young girl was brought to the laboratory a few weeks later. Milia took a quick glance at the girl, 
who was unconscious and bound to an operating table next to her. Thanks to her peculiar condition of demon possession, Milia possessed a unique ability. She could detect the presence of demon blood in someone's body. As she looked at the new arrival, she saw red particles of invisible energy radiating from the girl's body. Milia's heart sank at the sight. She knew what it meant for the new girl. She had seen it all before, time and time again. The same experiments, the same torture, and the same result a twisted and mangled creature that was no longer recognizable as human. Milia couldn't bear the thought of another innocent life being destroyed like hers. With a heavy heart, Milia made a decision. She knew it was dangerous, but she couldn't just sit and watch another girl suffer the same fate as her. She waited until the scientists left the room, and then she began to speak to the new arrival in a hushed tone. Ey, can you hear me? She barely whispered with her fused lips, hoping the girl would wake up. A low, menacing growl escaped from her throat, almost like a wild animal. You have to listen to me. You can't let them do this to you. You have to FYT. You have to resist. The girl stirred slightly but didn't wake up. Milia continued to somehow talk to her, trying to give her some hope and some strength to fight back. She knew it was a long shot, but she had to try. Suddenly, the door burst open, and the scientist entered the room. Milia quickly went back to pretending to be asleep, hoping the scientist wouldn't suspect anything. The scientist walked over to the new girl and began his experiments. Milia could hear the girl's gasps of pain as he drew her blood, and her heart broke. She knew she had to do something, but she didn't know what. Milia attempted to communicate with the girl as soon as she regained consciousness, but the fear-stricken gaze in her eyes was apparent. Milia inwardly let out a sigh and chose to remain quiet. She knew that even if she tried to speak, the girl wouldn't be able to comprehend her, and it would only cause more terror for her, considering Milia's grotesque appearance due to demonic possession. As the torture continued, Milia's anger and frustration grew. She couldn't just sit and watch this happen. She had to do something. Time crept by, and Milia helplessly observed as the girl's vitality dwindled with each passing day the light fading from her eyes, and her spirit waning. After a few days had passed, the scientists returned to take more blood from the barely alive girl. Suddenly, a loud commotion could be heard from outside the laboratory. Irritated, the scientist clicked his tongue and stormed out in a fit of anger. The situation was dire, and Milia knew she needed to act quickly if she wanted to save the girl from a similar fate as her own. As she was thinking about what to do, the commotion suddenly ceased and the only audible sound was the tranquil footsteps approaching. Both Milia and the girl slowly looked towards the open door, anticipating the scientist's arrival. Milia's heart skipped a beat when an unfamiliar young man emerged instead. Her entire body was consumed by a primal terror, and her eyes widened to an inhuman size. The moment the man or rather, the thing entered, the world around her turned a terrifying shade of crimson. A crimson aura poured out endlessly from the humanoid being as it stared around covering everything around her. For the first time in years, Milia felt nauseous as she struggled to keep her balance. She felt everything spinning around the dark humanoid shape in front of her. When the being's two crimson eyes locked onto hers, Milia shivered uncontrollably and swallowed hard. Greyawa! Roeawaya! Unconsciously, Milia roared before immediately cowering in a corner. She felt an overwhelming sense of fear as the humanoid being began to approach her slowly extending its dark hand toward her head. It's okay, child, the humanoid being said in a surprisingly normal voice. I won't hurt you. Milia hesitated, unsure whether to trust the terrifying being or not. She cautiously lifted her head to look at the being and noticed that its crimson eyes had softened, and the crimson aura had begun to dissipate. She slowly crawled out of the corner, keeping her eyes fixed on the being. As she looked carefully, she saw that the being was not as terrifying as she had initially thought. He resembles a pale-skinned teen human with black hair and red eyes with big black rings around the irises, but his face was kind, and his eyes were gentle. He was wearing a tire consisting of some kind of white uniform. After the initial fright passed, Milia somehow found herself pulled to the hand in front of her, growling. Before she knew it, she was already rubbing her head against it. Good girl. The man smiled patting her head gently. Milia felt a warm sensation spread through her body, and she suddenly realized that the man was not a threat to her. It was a strange feeling, but she found herself trusting the man more and more. What's your name? The being asked, still patting her head. 
Ijim Limiagur, she said in an unrecognizable growl, feeling a bit embarrassed by her terrible voice. Despite that, the man seemed to understand her words perfectly as he nodded. Thoma, Milia, I'm Anas Voldegod, the demon king of tyranny. The man's introduction left Milia in shock, as she had previously heard from the mad scientist about the members of the cult who bore the title of demon. According to the scientist, these individuals were infamous for their great power and brutal nature. Milia's eyes widened in surprise as she made this connection. Teach she'd known Jigur of Yartney? Milia asked nervously. The man called Anas nodded again. Yes, I am. But don't worry, Milia. I'm not here to harm you. In fact, I'm here to offer you something. Fo for me, Stoink. Yes, Anas said, standing up and gesturing for her to follow. Come with me, and I'll explain everything. With a snap of his fingers, the anti-magic shackles on Milia's legs shattered into thousand pieces as if they were nothing. After a moment of hesitation, Milia's gaze fell upon the girl who had remained silent all this while. Anas also followed her line of sight and noticed the girl, strapped to the table, staring back at them with lifeless eyes. Thoma. Anas hummed as if he recognized the girl before he suddenly pointed his palm at her. When she saw the magic circle forming in his palm, Milia flinched and quickly jumped in front of the girl defensively. There was a scared look on her monstrous face as she looked pleadingly at Anas. Anas tilted his head to the side, and he opened his mouth. What's wrong, Milia? Pleeps, do you want to hurt her? Anas raised his brows, lowering his hand. I won't hurt her, Milia. I was just going to heal her injuries. Milia blinked, surprised by his unexpected response. She's been through a lot, but I can fix her. Anas then nodded his head. But first, let's talk about why I'm here and what I can offer you. Milia looked at him curiously, wondering what he could offer her. As she followed Anas out of the room, she couldn't help but feel a glimmer of hope in her heart. Maybe there was a way out of this nightmare after all. Anas guided Milia through a complex maze of dim hallways and indistinguishable doors, all resembling the one they had just departed. The scarlet aura that had previously frightened her had vanished, and she felt surprisingly serene as she strolled behind the demon king of tyranny. She pondered what he could offer her, hoping that it would be a less hellish existence than the one she was currently enduring. Eventually, they reached a spacious room filled with books, scrolls, and strange objects. The room was bathed in an eerie blue glow emanating from the numerous levitating crystals suspended from the ceiling. Anas gestured for her to sit on a nearby chair before he settled comfortably in front of her. Milia stared at the lifeless scientist on the ground and the anxious men donning robes standing on the side before hearing Anas's voice once more. I comprehend your thoughts, Milia, he said, staring intently at her. You are wondering why I am here and what I could offer you that would compel you to depart from this place. I cannot blame you for being cautious. After all, you have experienced a great deal. Milia nodded, feeling a lump form in her throat. I understand the feeling of being trapped, Milia, Anas continued, feeling like nothing more than a lab specimen, experimented on and discarded like refuse. But you no longer have to endure this. You can be free. Freeger? Milia repeated, unsure what he meant. Anas grinned and produced a small white box out of thin air, causing the men surrounding them to gasp at the supernatural sight. Milia widened her eyes at the peculiar display. He opened the box, revealing a shiny silver key. This is the key to your freedom, Milia, he said, holding the key out to her. With this key, you can depart from this place and commence a new life as a human. A life where you will not be treated as a monster, but as a person. Milia gulped, gazing at the silver key in front of her. However, you have another option, Anas said, his other hand appearing beside the one holding the key. He opened his hand, revealing a black key that was identical to the silver one. This key here is the key to power, Milia, he said, his tone serious this time. With this key, not only will you leave this place, but you will also unlock an unimaginable potential and lead a great life in the future. So long as you swear loyalty to me, I will also safeguard you and no one in this world will harm you under my watch. Anas's eyes then glowed eerily as he continued in a chilling voice not even the gods. Milia's mind raced as she weighed her options. The idea of finally escaping from the laboratory and living a normal life was tempting, but the allure of power was equally alluring. She had always felt weak and powerless, a mere experiment in a world that she never understood. The thought of finally having control over her life and destiny was exhilarating. But at what cost? 
swearing loyalty to the demon king of tyranny seemed like a dangerous path to tread. Could she really trust him? Would he keep his word and protect her? Anas seemed to sense her hesitation and spoke again. Take your time, Milia. Remember that each path I offer has its own set of rewards and consequences. You must choose which one you truly desire. A life as a normal human, or a life as a powerful demon? H. Hey, did you hear? D. Demon? What? Hearing the men in robes around her mutter in disbelief. Milia took a deep breath, her heart pounding in her chest. She knew that whatever decision she made would determine the course of her life from that moment on. She looked at the two keys, one silver and one black, and made her choice. Eyes, she's ja, black kx wiger, she said, her low growling voice trembling slightly. Anas's eyes glinted with approval, and he handed her the black key. Wise choice, Milia. You have shown courage and ambition, qualities that I admire in a follower. You are indeed worthy. Clutching the black key tightly in her grotesque hand, Milia felt its weight and power. Despite knowing that the road ahead would be challenging, for the first time in her life, she felt like she was in control of her own destiny. Papa, please wait for me. I can finally see you again, she thought from the deepest part of her heart. Suddenly, the key in her hand started to vibrate furiously, and a bright crimson light exploded from it. The light swallowed Milia whole, causing her to slowly levitate in the air. An enormous amount of demonic energy erupted in all directions, obliterating everything around her. Some of the cult members who had been watching were unable to withstand the pressure and fell unconscious on the spot. Gah! What the hell? The few who managed to remain conscious dropped to their knees, feeling an invisible weight pushing down on their shoulders. Anas watched the spectacle from a safe distance, his expression unreadable. As the dust settled, Milia descended back to the ground her form now different. Her once monstrous appearance had been replaced with that of a beautiful young woman with long white hair that reaches down to her waist and large purple eyes. Welcome to your new life, Milia Anas said stepping forward to greet her. You are now reborn as a complete demon, one of my kin. Milia looked at her hands and naked body in disbelief, marveling at their delicate beauty. She turned to Anas, a mixture of fear and gratitude in her eyes. Thank you, Anas Sama she whispered, her voice soft and melodic. Anas placed a hand on her shoulder, his gaze intense. Remember Milia, with great power comes great responsibility. You have sworn loyalty to me, and I expect nothing less than your utmost devotion. Milia nodded, her determination firm. She would do whatever it took to repay Anas for his kindness and secure her place in the world. As she turned to leave with Anas, she caught a glimpse of the headless scientist on the ground and the cult members who were sprawled everywhere unconscious. A chill ran down her spine, and she knew that her newfound power would come at a price. But it was a price she was willing to pay to finally take control of her own destiny. Author Notes For those who are curious about Milia's new appearance, she is based on the character Chaika Travin from the series Chaika, The Coffin Princess. 5. Chapter 11 Alexia Midar. As they made their way through the dark corridors, Milia gazed at her saviors back in admiration. She then shifted her attention to her new outfit, which fit her perfectly a white dress with a slightly frilly top, a black skirt with puffed sleeves, and a frilled white headband above her long white hair that reached her waist. Once again, Milia was amazed by her savior's powers as he just uttered the word Iris under his breath, and the next moment she found herself fully clothed. The only sound echoing through the halls was the clack and click of her long black and white shoes on the hard floor as she matched the demon king of tyranny's confident stride. At the front, Milia suddenly called the demon king of tyranny, startling her. Yeah? Milia's heart raced as she looked around in confusion before quickly lowering her head and responding, Why yes, Anas Sama. The demon king of tyranny turned his head slightly to look at Milia. Do not be afraid, he said in a calm voice. I just wanted to make sure you were keeping up. Milia nodded, feeling relieved that she had not done anything wrong. Her years of enduring torture in this accursed place had left her with a perpetually composed disposition, but being in the presence of the demon king of tyranny made her nervous. She knew that he was an extremely powerful individual, a figure of immense power who could erase her with a mere wave of his hand. As they continued their short journey through the dark corridors, Milia could not help but wonder why the demon king of tyranny had saved her. She was just a lowly experiment, after all, but she dared not ask him. Instead, she kept her gaze fixed on his back, following him wherever he went. 
After what felt like a few minutes, they finally arrived at their destination a small room hall that was lit by flickering torches. Looking at the place that served as her prison for the past few years, Milia's expression hardened. The demon king of Tyranny noticed the change in her expression and spoke again. Do not worry, Milia. You are safe now. I have brought you here for a reason. Milia looked up at him in surprise. For a reason, Anus Sama? Yes, he replied, his eyes scanning the room. I need your help with something, he said as he looked at the sleeping white-haired girl strapped to the operating table. It seems that she has fallen asleep in the short time that they were away. Milia's heart skipped a beat in both fear and anticipation at the thought of being of use to the demon king of Tyranny. W what can I do, Anus Sama? As the demon king of Tyranny approached the operating table, he scrutinized the young girl's body closely. This one is the second princess of this human kingdom. She was abducted recently, and her father is currently attempting to locate and retrieve her, he stated, his voice laced with a chilly detachment. However, they had the audacity to harm and interrogate a member of my family in the process. But why would they do that? Milia asked, her curiosity now piqued. What could be the reason that someone would attempt to harm the family of someone as powerful as the demon king of tyranny? Because they believe my family is responsible for the kidnapping, replied the demon king of tyranny, his expression darkening. But that is beside the point. What I require of you, Milia, is to use your new abilities to heal this human girl. Milia's eyes widened in surprise. She had never been given any kind of healing powers before, and she didn't even know where to start. But she trusted the demon king of tyranny and knew that he wouldn't have asked for her help if he didn't believe in her abilities. I will try my best, Anas Sama, Milia said taking a step forward towards the operating table. Good, the demon king of tyranny said stepping back to give her space. Take your time and focus your energy on her wounds. Let your magic flow freely and let it do the work for you. Milia closed her eyes, encouraged by his words, and took a deep breath. Her focus was on the sleeping girl's body, visualizing the wounds and injuries she had suffered during her captivity. When Milia opened her eyes, a faint white light radiated from her body and surrounded the girl on the operating table. Unaware at the time, Milia's eyes glowed, and a strange symbol formed around her pupils. Milia concentrated all of her energy on the light, directing it towards the girl's wounds. As she did so, she could feel the demonic energy coursing through her body responding to her every thought and command, automatically converting itself into white light, and then flowing into the girl's body. The wounds on the girl's body slowly began to close, and her breathing became steadier and more regular. Minutes passed as Milia worked on the girl, and eventually, she opened her eyes to find that the girl was completely healed. The demon king of tyranny looked at her with an unreadable expression on his face, nodding in approval. Excellent work, Milia, he said. You have a gift for magic that is rare and precious. You will be a great asset to me in the future. Milia felt a warm feeling in her chest at the demon king of tyranny's praise. She had never felt so useful before, and it was all thanks to him. She knew that she owed him a debt of gratitude that she could never repay, but she also knew that she would do everything in her power to serve him faithfully. Thank you, Anas Sama, Milia said, bowing deeply. I will do my best to serve you. The demon king of tyranny smiled at her, his eyes gleaming with a fierce intensity. I have no doubt that you will, Milia, he said. You have a bright future ahead of you. As Milia stepped back from the operating table, the white-haired girl on it suddenly woke up with a start. Her eyes widened in surprise as she looked around the unfamiliar room before finally settling on Milia and Anas. W.H. Who are you? She asked, her voice shaky and hesitant especially when her limbs are chained with magic sealing chains. I am Anas Voldegode, and this is Milia, one of my subjects, he replied, his voice calm and collected. You have been abducted and were being held captive in this place. The white-haired girl looked at him in confusion before realization dawned on her face. Ah, yes, I remember now, she said, sitting up cautiously on the operating table. Thank you for saving me. I guess, Anas nodded. You are welcome. However, I must warn you that the ones responsible for your kidnapping will likely come after you again. You should stay with us for the time being until we can ensure your safety. After a moment of hesitation, the girl slowly nodded in agreement. However, her trembling eyes betrayed her suspicion towards them. Anus noticed her suspicion and spoke reassuringly, You don't have to be afraid. We will protect you and ensure that you're safe. What's your name? 
The girl blinked for a moment before answering, My name is Alexia. She looked down at her chain limbs and added, Can you please remove these chains? I promise I won't try to escape. Milia. As Anos gave a nod towards Milia, the short and beautiful girl standing beside him cautiously advanced towards Alexia and closed her eyes. She focused her energy and concentrated on breaking the chains, envisioning them shattering in her mind. Suddenly, a brilliant glow emanated from her eyes, startling Alexia, who observed in silence. However, this time was different. Instead of a beam of light, a blade of wind materialized from Milia's palms and struck the chains with force. But to her surprise, the moment the blade touched the chains, it dissipated into the air, leaving the chains unscathed. Milia frowned in frustration, wondering what went wrong. She tried once more, this time with more concentration and focus. She closed her eyes again and envisioned the chains breaking apart. As she opened her eyes, the blade of wind materialized again, striking the chains with even more force than before. But once again, the blade of wind dissipated into thin air, leaving the chains untouched. Alexia watched blankly, her eyes looking questioningly at the white-haired girl in front of her. Um, Milia-san, was it? Alexia's mouth opened slowly, catching Milia's attention. With a cute tilt of her head, Milia looked up at Alexia. However, Alexia couldn't help but feel scared by the strange glowing symbols in the girl's eyes. Despite her fear, she gathered the courage to speak. Right. In case you didn't know already, those are magic sealing chains. So obviously, magic will not work on it. As if she finally realized something important, Milia's expression brightened and then she promptly closed her eyes again. This time she envisioned magic sealing chains instead of normal chains in her mind. Anos watched knowingly as he noticed the black aura that spread out slowly from Milia's hands and started to surround the chains. Then to the surprise of both girls, the chain instantly eroded and disintegrated into ash. Alexia stared at her now free limbs in disbelief, and then looked up at Milia with a strange look. Thank you, NM. I'll pretend I didn't see that, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. With a smile, Milia opened her now normal violet eyes and replied, You're welcome. Milia felt a wave of relief wash over her now that she had finally been able to offer aid. It was the first time she had been able to assist one of the poor girls who were brought to this miserable place. Finally, she possessed the power to assist them rather than simply watch them suffer and perish helplessly. Aina stepped forward and patted Milia on the head, impressed by her quick thinking. Well done, Milia. You have a sharp mind and strong intuition, he said with a proud smile. Milia blushed at the compliment and nodded gratefully. Thank you, Aina sama I'm just glad I could be of help. Alexia, still in shock from the sudden turn of events, looked at the two of them with a mix of admiration and fear. Just who are you? She asked tentatively, her voice shaking slightly. Anas chuckled at the question as if amused by Alexia's nervousness. We're just two people passing through, isn't that right Milia? He replied, his tone light and nonchalant. Before he looked at Milia beside him, Milia's intuition kicked in, and she sensed that there was more to Anas's words than what met the eye. At that moment, she realized that he was concealing his true identity as the feared demon king of tyranny, as well as his and her connection to the cult. With a slight smile on her face, Milia stepped forward and placed a comforting hand on Alexia's shoulder. We're here to help you, she said in a gentle voice. We want to make sure that you and the other girls are safe. Other girls? What do you mean? When she heard the sharp tone in Alexia's voice, Milia froze and she quickly realized that she screwed up. You am. And no. T that's not. As Milia kept stuttering and looking repeatedly at Anos with a panicked look on her pale face, Anos shook his head and decided to help his helpless subordinate. Anos clarified Milia's statement, explaining that Alexia was the last girl to be rescued from the facility. To be more specific, he said there were other girls who were kidnapped with you, and we have already rescued them. You are the final one, Princess Alexia Megar. Whatever Alexia was thinking about, has all quickly but disappeared from her mind as she snapped her head towards Anos with a surprised look on her face. You know who am I? Anos nodded, his expression neutral. Yes, we know who you are, princess. Your father, the king of Megar, has been searching for you tirelessly ever since you were taken. He has spared no expense or effort in trying to find you and bring you back home. As Anos spoke, Alexia's eyes grew wider with emotion. 
being held captive for so long had made it difficult for her to imagine that someone was actively searching for her, especially her own strict father, the king. She had assumed that he would only order a brief search for the sake of appearance before disregarding her entirely. I, I had given up hope, she whispered, her voice barely above a whisper. I didn't think anyone cared about me anymore. Anas's cold expression softened a bit as he looked at Alexia. Your father cares about you deeply, princess. He has never stopped searching for you, and he will be overjoyed when he learns that you have been rescued. Alexia's eyes welled up with tears as she realized the truth of Anas's words. She had been so lost and alone for so long that it was hard to imagine anyone truly caring for her, let alone her strict father. I... I don't know what to say, she stammered, her voice choked with emotion. Anas nodded at her. You don't have to say anything, princess. We are just happy that you are safe now. Come, let's get you out of here and back to your... What about Wanisama? Alexia interrupted, her voice shaky. At the mention of the first princess, Anas's facial expression instantly became stern. He shut his mouth and narrowed his eyes a bit causing both Alexia and Milia to shudder terribly in fear as they anxiously awaited his response. Your sister was also looking for you, but perhaps a little too obsessively. Too much in fact that I would like to have a long chat with her about her methods. Upon hearing the mention of her sister's obsession in such a cold tone, Alexia felt a sinking feeling in her heart. While she was aware of Iris' overprotectiveness towards her, she had no inkling that it had escalated to this extent so much so that her savior would wear that expression while discussing it. Is she, is she okay? Alexia asked hesitantly. Humu, she's fine at the moment. But soon, it all depends on her words and actions. As Alexia gazed at Anas's indifferent expression, she gulped. What on earth did you do, Wanisama? 11. Chapter 12 Xenon Griffey Damn it! As Xenon continued down the dark tunnel, he couldn't shake off the feeling of unease that lingered within him. He couldn't believe that he had been defeated so easily by that mysterious stranger with such unearthly movements. As he reached the end of the tunnel, Xenon stumbled into a hidden chamber that seemed to have been tailored for research. The room was filled with laboratory artifacts, symbols, and strange writings on paper. When he noticed that no one was there, Xenon's expression changed, but his pain and injuries were getting the better of him. What the hell happened? Where is, ugh? He collapsed onto the floor groaning in agony. His thoughts drifted back to the stranger who had defeated him so easily, and he couldn't help but wonder if he would ever encounter him again. With a deep sigh, Xenon closed his eyes, trying to focus on his breathing to ease the pain in his stomach. He blew half my internal organs with a single punch. Xenon muttered to himself, his voice trembling with fear and pain. He couldn't comprehend how the stranger who appeared out of nowhere had inflicted such severe damage on him with just one punch. Who was that monster? He whispered, clutching his stomach in agony. The pain was almost unbearable, and Xenon knew that he needed to get medical attention as soon as possible. But as he struggled to stand up, he couldn't shake off the feeling of dread that lingered within him. The thought of encountering that mysterious stranger again sent shivers down his spine. I have to be more careful, Xenon thought to himself, his eyes scanning the empty laboratory for any sign of danger. There's no telling what else could be lurking around. But despite his best efforts, his mind couldn't help but drift to the unsettling thought that there might be more than just the shadow garden lurking in the shadows. Was that man working with the shadow garden? Or is he from another separate organization? Where is everyone? Where is that damn scientist? Xenon's mind raced with questions as he struggled to make sense of the situation. He couldn't shake off the feeling that he was in grave danger, and that he needed to be more cautious in his next moves. As he made his way out of the hidden chamber through an open door, Xenon couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. The scientist was known to be extremely cautious and would never leave a door open, let alone one leading to a valuable laboratory. Xenon realized that something must have happened while he was unconscious, and the thought filled him with apprehension. He cautiously stepped into the hallway, his eyes scanning the area for any signs of movement or danger. The silence was deafening and the only sound he could hear was his own labored breathing. Xenon's instincts told him to proceed with caution, and he began to move stealthily down the hallway. The walls were lined with scientific equipment, and he noticed that some of the machines were still running, while others were completely still. 
his heart pounding in his chest, Xenon tried to remain calm as he slowly made his way towards the main laboratory. But as he rounded the corner, he was met with an unsettling sight. The laboratory was in shambles, and it was clear that there had been a violent struggle. Tables were overturned, glassware was shattered, and equipment was strewn about haphazardly. What the hell happened here? Xenon muttered to himself, his eyes widening in shock. He cautiously made his way towards the center of the room, where he noticed a trail of blood leading towards a closed door. His heart racing, Xenon approached the door and hesitated for a moment before pushing it open. What he saw on the other side left him speechless. The room beyond was a scene of absolute carnage, with bodies lying in pools of blood and equipment destroyed beyond recognition. No, he muttered, shaking his head in denial. No, no, no. Then, with a sudden burst of energy, he turned around and bolted at full speed. No, Xenon's injured body moved at an incredible speed as he covered a great distance through the dark and damp tunnels. Despite his injuries, he was determined to keep going until he reached his destination. Finally, he came to a stop in front of a closed door, his hands slowly moving towards the doorknob. But just as he was about to turn it, Xenon's instincts flared up, causing him to tilt his head to the side. He had learned to trust his instincts after years of training and experience, and he knew that something was amiss. Xenon stood there for a moment, listening intently for any sounds on the other side of the door. He waited, holding his breath, but all was quiet. With a deep breath, Xenon slowly turned the doorknob, pushing the door open just a crack. He peered through the small opening, his eyes adjusting to the dimly lit room on the other side. Xenon's heart raced as he tried to make out any movement or sound, but there was none. He hesitated for a moment, weighing his options, before finally deciding to step into the room. Katsu. However, as he took his first step, a sword suddenly appeared out of nowhere, aimed directly at his throat. Xenon froze, his heart pounding with fear as he realized that he had walked straight into a trap. Fortunately, he was prepared. So Xenon's reflexes kicked in as he ducked down, narrowly avoiding the sword aimed at his throat. He quickly retreated, jumping backward away from the door before drawing his own sword in one swift motion. Xenon scanned the room, his senses heightened as he searched for any sign of his attacker. As his eyes adjusted to the dim light, Xenon noticed a figure standing in the shadows. With his sword at the ready, he cautiously approached the figure, ready to defend himself at any moment. As Xenon approached the figure, he realized that it was not an attacker but a girl who was pointing her sword threateningly at him. W who are you? The girl shouted. Xenon looked at the trembling girl and released a breath he didn't know he was holding. He was relieved that he didn't have to fight that man again, let alone this girl. He lowered his sword and sheathed it. With a smile, he looked at the girl and opened his mouth to speak. What are you doing here all alone? It's dangerous to wander around these parts without any protection, Alexia Kuhn. Xenon said, sarcasm dripping from his words. Upon closer inspection, the girl's eyes widened in recognition. Why dash you, why are you here? There's no why about it. This facility is mine, after all. I made an investment in that man. That's all there is to it. Xenon watched as Alexia's face went through many emotions before she finally smiled bitterly at the end. What a relief. I've always thought that you must have some screws loose in your head. Feels good to be proven right. Alexia said while slowly getting out of the room and moving to the side, one step at a time. Xenon casually walked to the other side of the hallway, facing Alexia who was looking in the opposite direction. However, Alexia was unaware that the only exit was behind Xenon. Is that so? I don't care what you feel though. All I want is your blood. Every single person here keeps going on and on about blood. Are you guys researching vampires in here? For you, it might be something similar wasn't actually hoping for an answer. I have zero interest in the occult. Thought as much. I'm sure you already know, but the night order will arrive very soon. You're already finished. Finished? Exactly what is it of mine that would be finished? Xenon's smile is the same as ever. As long it wasn't that monster from before, he was confident he could kill anyone standing in his way. Your social status and prestige will be ripped from you, and of course your life too. I'll drop the guillotine blade for you. See? That's not gonna happen. Because you and I will be escaping through an escape tunnel. Together. Wow, what a romantic invitation. But unfortunately, I hate your very guts. Oh, you will come with me. With your blood and my experiments, the twelfth seat of the rounds will be mine. 
The status of such a position is like heaven and earth in comparison to a worthless position like swordsmanship instructor. Rounds? Is that what you and your group of crazy friends call yourselves? Twelve knights recognized and chosen by the order, knights of rounds. Status, prestige, and wealth, everything will come to my hands at a rate incomparable to anything before. My strength has already been acknowledged. The only thing that I have left to do is to present a tangible achievement, but that will soon be cleared too, courtesy of your blood and my research. Xenon spreads his hands theatrically and laughs. Really couldn't care less. More like, I'm getting tired of this stupid conversation about blood. To be honest, if I could choose, I'd have preferred Princess Iris' blood, but I suppose I'll have to make do with yours. I will fucking kill you. Oh, pardon, you dislike being compared to your sister, right? Alexia's flare of killing intent turns into the starting bell of their fight. Her sword flies straight to Xenon's neck, but, oh, so scary. It is repelled by Xenon at the last possible moment. Then he also proceeds to handle Alexia's follow-up attacks. The two swords collide violently again and again, filling the air with sparks. Just by looking at the exchange of blows and the two swords dancing through the air, it can perhaps be said that the two are equal. However, the facial expression of the two is in sharp contrast. Alexia's is grim, while Xenon's is a relaxed smile. Sure enough, the one at a disadvantage is Alexia. After a soft click of the tongue, Alexia retreats from Xenon's sword. In the short time that I haven't seen you, it seems that you've changed to using a rather cheap sword. What Xenon is looking at is Alexia's sword. Alexia also looks at it, albeit with a bitter expression. Although it hasn't been long since the start of the fight, her blade is already chipped in numerous places. Masters don't choose their sword, right? Alexia decides to put up a strong front. That's true. Actual masters, that is. Xenon scoffs. But you, you are a commoner. That I can guarantee, as the swordsmanship instructor. Alexia's face visibly distorts. For a split second, she looks close to tears, then the next moment it is all wiped away by a fierce anger. Then you keep looking. Whether or not I am a commoner. With another flare of killing intent, she dives back into the fray. Alexia knows. She knows that even if she fights Xenon under normal circumstances, she wouldn't win. And now, her weapon is even a cheap, mass-produced sword. It will not last long. However, Alexia has not been swinging her sword every day for nothing. With her sister as a goal, she has been analyzing her own shortcomings and pouring an effort to overcome them. And she has also seen her sister sword up close far more than anyone else. She is already capable of flawlessly tracing a tiny bit of her sister's sword, which is why she can easily pull off this move. H-A-H-H-H. -H -H -H. That one attack truly resembled that of her sister. For the first time, the smile is wiped off Xenon's face. He is also forced to inject magic into his sword. The two swords meet in a violent clash, then bounce back from the recoil. The two were equal. No. It was Alexia who had come out slightly on top in that exchange. There is a single red line left on Xenon's face. With a surprised face, Xenon traces the cut with a finger, then confirms the redness on his finger. I'm surprised. It is pure and simple praise, with no hidden meanings at all. I truly did not expect you to be hiding something like this. Xenon continues gazing at his finger from different angles as if to confirm the color of his blood. I will make you regret it if you underestimate me. Cuckoo. However, the smile is back on Xenon's face. I am indeed surprised. But I am only surprised. In the end, it is merely a mimicry. This is far too removed from the original. Xenon shakes his head. You sure know how to talk. Since we're at it, how about I get a bit serious? So saying, he takes a stance with his sword. The very air around them changes. The magic surrounding Xenon qualitatively becomes sharper and more condensed. Because of his internal injuries, Xenon didn't want to resort to this. But there is no harm if it was only for a little. Allow me to say this beforehand. Up to now, I have never once gotten serious in front of outsiders. What you will now see is my true sword, and is also the strength of someone who will soon become a member of the rounds. Then the air shakes. This... The very dimension that they are on is too far apart. This strike contains far more power than Alexia has ever seen Xenon pour into his sword. Genius and commoner, the gap between the two is too vast. The unbridgeable distance causes Alexia to despair. She acknowledges that this man's strength might even be enough to match her sister. 
Alexia has no way to defend herself from the blades speeding towards her with overwhelming pressure. It is only due to her many years of training that at least her body's muscle memory kicks in. However, there is no clash. Sword meets sword. Then Alexia's sword simply shatters into pieces. Alexia feels herself looking at those glittering fragments flying through the air as if it is somebody else's business. As if she is looking on from far away. The far-off memories from her childhood, when she had been swinging her sword because it was so fun, flashes through her mind. And her sister had always been right beside her. These are memories from so long ago that she had already forgotten them. You cannot be like your sister. A single tear falls from the corner of Alexia's eye. You will come with me now. From her hand falls what is now a mere handle. It makes a dry rattle upon hitting the ground. Then at that moment, Katsu, Katsu, a sound of footsteps rings out from behind Xenon. Katsu, 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 someone is coming from the dark end of the tunnel. When the sound finally stops, a man wearing a jet black coat is there, clad in jet black from head to toe, deep hood pulled forward, face hidden behind a mysterious shadow. The man walks forward composedly until finally stopping a step away from Xenon's sword. T.S.K. Scared me to death for a moment there. You're not that monster. Hmm. A black-cloaked man. So you are the stray dog who has been bearing fangs against the order as of late. With a sharp glint in his eyes, Xenon glares at the man. My name is Shadow. I lurk in the shadows, and I hunt the shadows. It is a voice so deep and so low that it almost seems to be emanating from the bottom of an abyss. I see. You might be feeling full of yourself after crushing several of our small hideouts. But I shall enlighten you. In the hideouts that you've crushed, there hasn't been a single person truly important to the order. In other words, you are merely a coward who only targets the small fries. Who I hunt, and where I hunt, it is all the same. Unfortunately, it is not all the same. A core power of the order is here. Today, you will be the one to be hunted. Such is your fate. Xenon turns his sword towards Shadow. I am Xenon Griffey, the person who will soon become the twelfth seat of the rounds. Taking your life shall become my achievement. Then he flies towards Shadow with the force of a hurricane. However, Shadow's figure disappears, causing Xenon's thrust to pierce through empty air. Wah! Immediately afterward, Shadow is standing behind Xenon. In a mere moment, his back had already been compromised. He cannot move. As if forgetting about the flow of time, Xenon holds his sword still and even stops breathing, concentrating every last drop of his concentration towards his back. No one moves. Indeed, Shadow is only standing back to back with Xenon, with his arms crossed, no less. Then comes a single question. So, this core power or whatever, where is he? Xenon's face distorts with the burning humiliation. Immediately, he turns round with a sharp mowing attack. But there is no longer anyone there. How coo! The rustle of a coat flutter turns his head. He realizes that Shadow is now standing in his original position, looking as if nothing had happened. Even as someone looking from the outside, Alexia could not catch what had happened. If there was no trickery or contrivance involved, then that would mean this man is someone of quite some skill. No, one could even call him an aberrance. Xenon pushes down his shaken heart and slowly turns around. It seems that I had underestimated you a bit. Though they were small, it seems that you do indeed possess the strength to destroy several of our hideouts. Despite his self-confident words, Xenon was actually experiencing a sense of desperation deep within. Upon reflection on his circumstances, Xenon became acutely aware of his internal injuries. He knew that he couldn't muster his full strength at the moment, and that his pills were not on his person. Considering how easily he had been defeated by the man before, he didn't want to take any chances lest he faces a similar outcome against this shadow. With that in mind, Xenon swallowed his pride and turned his head towards Alexia. He bolstered himself with magic and suddenly launched forward. Alexia let out a surprised exclamation E.H. Alexia was taken aback by Xenon's sudden movement. She barely had time to react before he was right behind her, his sword pointed directly at her throat. She froze, unable to move or speak, as Xenon stared down at Shadow with a fierce expression. I don't know what your intentions are, Shadow, but since you came here, then you must also be after this girl, Xenon said, his voice low and menacing. Shadow remained silent, his eyes fixed on Xenon's sword. Alexia's heart was pounding in her chest, fear and confusion gripping her. 
She couldn't believe that she had gotten caught up in something like this. Xenon took a step closer to Shadow, his sword still at Alexia's throat. Speak now, or suffer the consequences, he growled. Shadow finally spoke, his voice calm and steady. I have no business with that thing. I am simply passing through. Xenon eyed him suspiciously, not lowering his sword. Thing, passing through? Why should I believe you? Shadow's eyes flicked briefly to Alexia before returning to Xenon. Believe what you will. I don't care about that thing. You can kill it or do whatever you want with it. But if you harm that thing, you will regret it. At Shadow's cruel words, Alexia flinched, remaining frozen in place. Xenon's expression shifted as he hesitated briefly before his face contorted with anger, turning red. Xenon tightened his grip on the sword and cast a dangerous gaze toward the pale Alexia. Let's see if you can still speak so boldly after this, he muttered. He then slowly swung his sword towards her head, aiming a straight line toward her neck. Please! With pleading eyes, Alexia looked at Shadow for help, hoping for assistance. But the man remained steadfast in his words and stood motionless, silently observing them without moving a single step. Shlurk! The sound of flesh being ripped apart was nauseating as Xenon's sword sliced through her fragile neck with precision. Crimson blood spurted from Alexia's fatal wound and splashed into the ground below. Her body spasmed as a chilling gurgling sound came from her open throat. Xenon was looking at Shadow the whole time as he looked for an opportunity to move. He was about to throw Alexia's dying body at him before escaping at full speed. But the sudden jerk on his hand that was holding Alexia's hair made him frown and look down at her. The moment he looked down, Xenon flinched instantly in horror. He had expected her to scream or cry out in pain, but instead she turned her head at an impossible angle and looked at him with wide eyes on her face. It was such an unnatural sight that for a moment, Xenon doubted his eyes. Ha! Hi ha 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 ha! Xenon was taken aback by Alexia's sudden maniacal laughter. His hand, still holding the sword, trembled slightly as he tried to make sense of what was happening. But before he could react, Alexia's laughter turned into a maniacal cackle that echoed through the whole tunnel. Alexia's voice was twisted and distorted as she spoke, her eyes gleaming with a maniacal light. Kiki, hee hee, foolish human, ah ha 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 ha, you dare. Xenon's confusion quickly turned to anger as he tightened his grip on the sword and swung it at Alexia without a second thought. However, as the blade neared her bloody neck, her body twisted and contorted in an impossible manner avoiding the blade completely. Xenon stumbled forward, crashing into the wall. Wa, Gavdia. Before he could even react, Alexia suddenly lunged at him from behind, wrapping her arms around him in a tight embrace. In an instant, a magic circle appeared beneath them, and she muttered a terrible incantation. Nedra, unleashing a spell unlike any witnessed in this world. As soon as the words left her lips, Alexia disappeared into black flames, and a magic formation expanded from the purple magic circle in the ground, enveloping Xenon's entire body. Xenon struggled to break free from the strange magic formation, but it was no use. He felt a strange sensation coursing through his body as the demonization magic began to take effect. His vision blurred, and his body convulsed as he underwent a horrific transformation. Ah! He could feel his body changing, his bones elongating and reshaping his muscles bulging with newfound strength. His senses heightened, and he could feel his mind slipping away as a demon nature took hold. When it was over, Xenon looked down at his hands in shock. They were no longer human hands but instead had transformed into claws with razor-sharp tips. He could feel the power coursing through his body, but at the same time, a sense of dread filled him. What the hell? Xenon's mind was reeling with shock and disbelief at the sudden transformation that had overtaken him. He struggled to find the right words to express his confusion and fear. What? What's happening to me? He stammered, his voice trembling with fear. As he spoke, he felt a strange sensation coursing through his body, and he looked down to see spikes sprouting from his elbows, fangs growing in his mouth, and thick horns emerging from his skull. Aye, he murmured, unable to comprehend what was happening to him. Shadow simply shrugged, his expression indifferent as he spoke. I warned you, didn't I? I told you that you would regret it. Xenon slowly raised his head, directing his ugly countenance toward Shadow. You scoundrel! W what have you done to me? He exclaimed. Nedra. Nedora lit. Demonization. 
a spell that is mainly used to transform animals with the intent of improving their physical abilities. It uses animal nature and demon nature that exist in animals' sources. Results vary depending on the animal it is applied to and the power of the caster. Sometimes the target's intelligence decreases, other times it increases, and sometimes it increases enough that they can understand human language. Additionally, the animal that has netter cast on it changes its appearance into that of a demon. These transformed animals are called mutants. In the present Dilhade, unless certain conditions are met, Nedra is forbidden from being used. Humans that have senses are hard to demonize, but it is not impossible. Human demonization is different from other animals, probably due to their inherently high intelligence. A demonized human's desire, malice, and hate will manifest in their outward appearance. Lent, rento, lit, condition, magic that sets conditions for activating spells. Leaks, Rikusu lit, thought communication, a spell that enables long-distance communication and mind reading. It is possible for a skilled enemy to intercept the caster's messages even if communications are encrypted. If there is difficulty establishing a connection, one can also use jais to establish a line. EV, EV lit, recollection, a spell that can evoke memories, even those of the distant past. Memories that have been erased cannot be recalled with EV. Igrim. Igurimu lit, rotten death, a spell that resurrects the dead as zombies. Those who have been resurrected gain immense magic power. In exchange, their bodies burn with hatred for their killers, and the pain of their wounds torment them for eternity. Ij, Ij lit, subordination, a spell allowing the user to dominate the target the spell is applied to. It is difficult to work on those with a will, such as demons and humans, and is mainly used on animals with low intelligence. Naria, Naria lit, memory lapse, a spell that erases memories of the target. Teles, Terasu lit, memory engraving, a spell that engraves knowledge directly into a target's mind. However, the process is painful. Linel, Raineru lit, illusion mimicry, a spell that creates illusions. It can be used to change the caster's appearance, or create illusions of situations that didn't actually happen. The caster can also use it to make themselves and others invisible to the naked eye. When linel is used alongside Najula, the caster can make themselves virtually undetectable. However, people who excel at source magic can still detect the sources of people who have hidden themselves with linel and Najula. Najula, Najira lit, concealed magic power, a spell that conceals any and all traces of magic. Even a demon of the mythical age would struggle to detect magic concealed by Najula. However, casting Najula continuously consumes a considerable amount of power. It is stated that Najula is easier to use those who have lower amounts of magic power, as it takes greater effort to conceal immense magic power of powerful users. Also, Najula cannot conceal immense amounts of magic power such as when a greater magic spell is cast. Nas, Natsu Lit, Source Camouflage, a spell that disguises the nature of one's source as it is possible to conceal the user's identity by disguising the characteristics of the source, making their source's wavelength seem incredibly small or making the source have a wavelength that matches other species such as gods. Gavdia, Gavudia, lit, source power destruction strong body, magic that shaves off the source and turns it into power. It can also be used to sacrifice one's own source completely to activate a spell that requires a considerable amount of power. 8. Chapter 13 Stress relief. A few hours ago. Here, take my hand. You am. Thank you, Milia San. As Alexia awkwardly stood up from the operating table with the help of Milia. In his mind, Anos continued to analyze Alexia's lifetime memories. At that time when Anos first came to this room and laid his eyes on the kidnapped Alexia, Anos had pointed his palm towards her and told Milia, who had stepped in front of her defensively, that he was going to heal her. However, this was only half of the truth as Anos had actually secretly used a combination of two spells, Leaks and Eevee. These spells allowed him to perform a long-distance mind reading of the target, and to forcibly evoke memories from the distant past. Anos had kept the spells active from the moment he first cast them until now, having already analyzed over ten years of Alexia's past without her knowledge. However, at that moment, Anos decided to release the spells. As he realized that what he was currently seeing were only the useless memories of a three-year-old human child, which held no value to him. Aside from her childhood memories such as growing up in the palace, interacting with family members, 
and training in various skills like etiquette, diplomacy, and combat, attending royal functions, meeting with foreign dignitaries, and participating in political discussions, Anas had also gained valuable insight into the internal politics, customs, and past of the kingdom, as well as the second princess's private life encounters. Anas now had more information about Alexa than Alexa had about herself, not figuratively speaking but literally. After all, while he doubted the human girl could even remember what she ate last year, Anas, on the other hand, could recall with perfect clarity the number of wrinkles on the face of the royal nanny who had changed her diapers more than a decade ago. What interested him the most, however, was the strange relationship and the absurd interactions between the princess and his brother Sid, spanning over only a few days. It was such a small fraction of the memories as a whole that it felt like a tiny drop in a vast ocean of information. But despite its brevity, it still allowed him to discover a side of Sid that he never saw before. Anus absolutely regretted seeing it. Watching in horror as his older brother barked like a dog with Alexia patting his head and muttering good boy, Pochi, Anus almost spat out blood, bones, spine and his entire organs from his mouth as he once again seriously considered if his human brother is suffering from some kind of severe, causality law defying mental illness that is undetectable by magic. Enos vowed to never read minds again unless it was absolutely necessary after the traumatic experience. As he released the spells while feeling very uncomfortable on the inside, Enos returned to the present moment and saw that Alexia and Milia were looking at him nervously. Follow me. Anos said curtly before striding out of the room, with the other two trailing closely behind him. However, after walking only a few meters away from the room, Anos couldn't handle it anymore, and so he abruptly invoked another spell. Revide, he spoke, and both Alexia and Milia froze mid-step, affected by the instantaneous effect of the time magic spell. Without even glancing at them, Anos kept moving forward and activated another spell, Gadam. As he uttered the incantation, Anos vanished from his spot and reappeared in the middle of the main laboratory, where the robed men were still waiting. Confused by the sudden appearance of Anos, the others muttered among themselves. But before they could do anything else, Anos invoked the revived spell once again. Revived. Huh. This time, it affected all of the robed men in the room. Anos could feel their movements slowing down as time itself seemed to grind to a halt. With his enhanced strength and speed, he started systematically killing all the robed men with his bare hands, his movements almost too fast for the human eyes to follow. As if healing something that was damaged inside of him, Anas's restless complexion gradually lessened with every human he shredded in his way. In just a matter of seconds, all the robed men lay dead on the floor, and Anas stood amidst their severely mangled corpses. His clothes splattered with blood as a calm expression settled on his face, now refreshed after the horrifying slaughter. After a brief scan of the room, Anas casually sauntered towards the least damaged corpse. Using the spell that brings the dead back to life as zombies, he invoked the incantation, Igram. A wicked magic circle materialized on the floor as the headless corpse of the scientist levitated into the air. Suddenly a new head emerged from its neck, and it let out a deafening roar, entering the world once again. Greya! Anas simply glanced at the monster with its bronze complexion as it growled at him and then proceeded to cast another spell, each. The subordination magic immediately seized control of the creature's mind, shattering its will like dust. Anas focused his attention on the zombie, using his vast knowledge of magic to formulate a plan. He decided to use a combination of several spells to transform the zombie into a clone of Alexia. First, he used the Najla spell to conceal his magic power and hide his actions from any potential onlookers. He then cast Lino to create a transparent illusion of Alexia standing in front of him. Next, he used the Neria and Telly's spells to engrave Alexia's memories and personality directly into the zombie's mind. This process was complex and required a great deal of concentration, but Anos was an expert in the use of magic and was able to complete the process quickly. Finally, he used the Nas spell to camouflage the zombie's source and make it appear as though it was a natural part of Alexia's body. As he completed the final incantation, the zombie's body began to glow with soft white light, and its features slowly began to change. Within moments, the transformation was complete, and a perfect clone of Alexia stood before him. Anas stepped back and surveyed his work, satisfied with the result. The clone had all of Alexia's memories, personality, and physical characteristics, and was indistinguishable from the real princess. 
As he looked around, Anos noticed the scattered corpses of the robed men littered across the hallway. Remembering why he killed them and rendered them into such unsightly and unrecognizable forms of mangled meat, Anos grimaced and commanded the clone to drag and gather all the corpses into a nearby empty room. The transformed zombie dutifully obeyed and dragged the lifeless bodies of the humans into the designated room. Turning to face the zombie, he commanded it again. Come, he said, gesturing for the clone to follow him out of the laboratory. Grab a sword from there, and follow me. The zombie nodded blankly without saying anything as it moved and grabbed a short sword that was laying on the ground before following Anos obediently. As Anos walked silently in the dark tunnels, he thought back to the memories of the second princess, and the rather obvious clues that had led him to the kidnapper's identity. Xenon Griffey, the swordsmanship instructor at Midgar Royal Spells Word Academy and Alexia's fiancé. Ironically, the individual who had the misfortune of standing in his path at that time happened to be the mastermind behind this trivial kidnapping mishap. My name is Thomas, and I've been a guard in a small countryside village for as long as I can remember. It's a peaceful place, with nothing much happening most of the time. But being a guard isn't exactly a lucrative profession, and I've always struggled to make ends meet. That's why, when I heard about the cult of Diablos, I couldn't resist the temptation. The Cult of Diablos is a secret society that operates in the shadows of society, making deals with those who seek power and wealth beyond their wildest dreams. It's said that they have access to knowledge and resources that no one else does and that their members are among the most successful and powerful people in the world. I was skeptical at first, but I figured I had nothing to lose. So I made contact with one of their recruiters, and before I knew it, I was initiated into the cult. The initiation was intense and terrifying, but also exhilarating. I felt like I was finally part of something bigger than myself, and that I was on the cusp of a new life. At first, the cult didn't ask much of me. They just wanted me to keep an eye out for any suspicious activity in the village and report back to them. It was easy enough, and I was grateful for the extra income they provided. But soon, they started asking for more. They wanted me to turn a blind eye to certain things, like smuggling and illegal gambling and even to protect some of their members when they came to the village. I knew it was wrong, but the money they offered was too good to pass up. Over time, I became more involved in the cult's activities. I helped them recruit new members, and I even participated in some of their human trafficking crimes. It was all very secretive and mysterious, and I felt like I was part of a select group of people who knew things that no one else did. But as time went on, I began to see the dark side of the cult. They were ruthless and unforgiving, and they didn't hesitate to eliminate anyone who stood in their way. I started to feel like I was in over my head, and that I had made a terrible mistake. But by then, it was too late. The cult had become my life, and I was trapped in a web of lies and deceit. I couldn't go back to being a simple village guard, and I couldn't leave the cult without risking my own safety. So when the cult ordered me to join their latest mission to guard the underground tunnels beneath the capital city of the Midgar Kingdom, I didn't have much of a choice. I was nervous about the assignment, but I knew I had to do whatever it took to prove my loyalty to the cult. I arrived at the designated meeting spot with a group of robed men, all of us armed with swords and other weapons. The tunnels were dark and dank, and the air was thick with the scent of mold and mildew. We moved slowly and cautiously, scanning the walls and floors for any signs of danger. As we ventured further into the tunnels, it became evident that this mission would be arduous and protracted. We had to maintain constant vigilance since the tunnels were riddled with traps and other hazards. Additionally, it was clear that we were not the sole occupants of the area. Faint sounds and voices reverberated through the tunnels, and we glimpsed movement in the shadows. Based on their previous experiences with the cult of Diablos, Thomas and his companions understood that it was prudent to remain quiet and avoid investigating further. As the days wore on, we grew tired and hungry. We had brought some provisions with us, but they were quickly running low. We tried to conserve what we had, but it was difficult. The air in the tunnels was thick and oppressive, and it was becoming harder to breathe. By the end of an entire week, we were all exhausted and on edge. We had seen and heard things that we couldn't explain, and we were all starting to doubt our own sanity. But we couldn't give up. Surrendering was not an option. We have to accomplish our objective, no matter the cost. Our very lives depended on it. Just as we were about to reach the entrance of another tunnel, we heard a loud noise from up ahead. 
We froze, our weapons at the ready, as we tried to discern what was happening. Suddenly, a man appeared from the shadows, catching us off guard. He was barehanded with crimson blood on his arms and had black hair and black red eyes. He wore a white outfit, a black belt, and a metal chain around his waist. We had never seen him before, and he didn't look like anyone we had encountered in the tunnels before. Before we could even react, he lunged at us, his movements inhumanly fluid and extremely precise. We tried to fight back, but he was too fast and too skilled. One by one, my companions fell, their bodies sliced open by his bare hands. I could do nothing but watch in horror as he effortlessly slaughtered them all. As he turned his attention to me, I realized that I was the only one left. I tried to run, but he was heinously quick. He instantly caught me by the arm and pulled me close, his inhuman black-red eyes staring into mine. I felt my soul tremble under that terrifying gaze. And monster, crunch. With a mere flick of his wrist, he plunged his hand into my chest tearing out my heart. I fell to the ground, my life slipping away as the man silently vanished back into the shadows, not uttering a word from start to end. In my final moments, I realized that I had been a pawn in the cult's game, nothing more. They had used me, manipulated me, and ultimately discarded me like a piece of trash. I had made a terrible mistake, and now I was paying the price. As I lay there, my life slipping away, a young girl with white hair appeared before me, wielding a short sword. Despite appearing to be no more than a teenager, her red eyes conveyed a chilling indifference that caused shivers to run down my spine. Without a moment of hesitation, the unfeeling girl drove the sword straight into my throat. Schlurk. As my vision faded to black, I knew that I had only myself to blame. I had let greed and ambition cloud my judgment, and now I was paying the ultimate price for my folly. Anos and the zombie clone of Alexia make their way through the damp tunnels. As they progress, they come across several other groups of robed men. Anos quickly dispatches each group with brutal efficiency, using a combination of magic and physical strength. The zombie clone, meanwhile, follows behind him, finishing off any injured humans that survived Anos's absolute carnage without question. As they move deeper into the tunnels, the groups of robed men become smaller and less organized. Anos takes them down one by one without exception, his movements fluid and graceful as he dodges their attacks and strikes back with deadly precision. With the last human in the underground facility lying lifeless under his foot, Anos muttered, this should be enough, before crushing the head and causing a gory explosion of blood and brain matter. While observing the blood-stained sword in the clone of Alexia's hand, Anos detected a strong odor emanating from both himself and the clone. It was the all-too-familiar disgusting smell of blood and bodily fluids, and he realized that it was from the countless robed men they had slain. With a swift incantation of miscellaneous magic, both the scent and the blood vanished completely. Satisfied with his spellwork, Enos strode towards the clone and teleported with her to the room where he had initially discovered Alexia. He pointed to a corner beside the door and instructed the clone to stand there and not to move from that place. Using conditioning magic, Anus set specific conditions for activating other spells. He pointed his palm at the door and muttered, Lent, causing a yellow magic circle to appear. He then evoked the same spell on the clone, saying, Lent, again. The conditions he established were as follows. First, if a human entered the room, it would release the subordination magic each, which held the clone's will, allowing it to act as Alexia with free will. Second, if the clone sustained a fatal injury, it would convert its source into magical power using Gavdia, which would then activate Nedra on the perpetrator. After finishing his task, Anus left the room and shut the door behind him. He strolled over to where Milia and Alexia were still frozen in time, and upon reaching his previous spot, he deactivated the time magic. Without any indication of what had just occurred, the two unknowingly followed him in silence. Author Notes during the mythical age, Anas Voldegode was widely recognized as the demon king of tyranny, a powerful demon who was feared for his absolute power and infamous for his extreme brutality towards his enemies, particularly the humans who were considered the archenemy of the demons. Comment story reviews equals more chapters. Where are those who kept claiming that Anas was acting weak? Anas himself had stated that he was intentionally keeping a low profile to maintain peace. If there is no hero canon and Anus is severely angered by the humans, then goodbye world. 
If Sid doesn't control his Chinibio, then also goodbye world. His delusions are too powerful and can cause harm to Anas's mental state. 10. Chapter 14. Iris Migar. Claire Cagino sat in a chair, her hands tied behind her back as she was interrogated by Princess Iris Migar in her office. The red-haired princess stood tall and imposing in front of her, her piercing gaze locked onto Claire. Why did you try to attack us, Claire? Iris asked, her voice cold and commanding. Because you tortured my brother, Claire spat back, her eyes flashing with anger. I did what was necessary to find my sister, Iris replied firmly. Your brother was a suspect in her abduction, and we needed to know what he knew. He didn't know anything, Claire protested. He's just the kid who got caught up in all of this. Iris's expression softened slightly, realizing that Claire too also cared deeply for her younger sibling just like herself but her tones still remained firm. I understand that Claire, but we had to investigate all possible leads. Your brother is safe now, and we will not harm him further. Claire slumped back in her chair, her anger deflating slightly. I just, I couldn't bear to see him hurt anymore, she said quietly. I understand, Iris said, her voice gentler now. But attacking here was not the solution. We need to work together to find my sister and bring her home safely. Claire nodded, her eyes downcast. I know. I'm sorry for what I did. I just, I couldn't control myself. I forgive you, Claire, Iris said, placing a hand on her shoulder. But you need to learn to control your emotions, especially in times of crisis. We're all on the same side here, fighting for the safety of our kingdom and our loved ones. Claire nodded again, her eyes meeting Iris's. I understand, First Princess. I'll do better. Good, Iris said, smiling slightly, and walked back to her chair behind the desk. As Claire was looking anxiously at Iris with her hands still tied behind her back, Iris leaned forward on her desk and put her hands under her chin. After silently looking at the setting sun through the window, her red eyes then focused back on Claire on the chair. She said in a serious voice, Lastly, I heard you didn't attack alone. Is that true? Claire hesitated for a moment, unsure whether to reveal the identity of the man who had helped her rescue Sid. But she knew that keeping secrets would only make things worse, so she took a deep breath and answered truthfully. I don't know. Iris frowned, realizing that Claire was lying. You don't know? Or you don't want to tell me? Claire shifted uncomfortably in her seat, feeling trapped. I really don't know, she repeated. Iris narrowed her eyes, studying Claire's face carefully. She knew that Claire was hiding something, but she also knew that pushing too hard could cause her to shut down completely. She decided to take a different approach. Look, Claire, I understand that you're trying to protect someone, Iris said, her voice softening. But we need to work together to bring my sister back. I promise that whoever helped you won't be punished if they come forward and help us find her. Claire bit her lip, her mind racing. She knew that she needed to tell Iris something, even though she knows nothing about the identity of the man. Finally, she took a deep breath and spoke. It was a tall black-haired man. I don't know his name, but I think he's a senior F friend of Sid. He helped me rescue him from your guards. And then, um, he disappeared afterward. What? Iris's eyes widened in surprise. She knew exactly who the man was, for he had already introduced himself to her knights who stood guard at the entrance. She was just testing Claire to hear it directly from her mouth before letting her free. Her mind raced as she processed the information. So, Claire didn't know that the man who helped her was her own brother, Anos Kajino. Iris couldn't believe it. How could Claire not know about her own flesh and blood? Anos was the youngest child of the Baron of the Kajino family, and the younger brother of both Claire and Sid. Iris couldn't help but feel puzzled at how Claire could be so oblivious to her own family ties. No, that's nonsense. She was lying. So blatantly at that. You dare! Iris stopped herself from lashing out impulsively and took a deep breath as she tried hard to compose herself, not wanting to hurt Claire. She needed to handle the situation peacefully. Claire Cagino. Claire flinched at the cold tone of the first princess as she nervously replied. Why yes? In case you didn't know, lying to the royal family is a grave offense that carries the immediate punishment of death. No. I'm not lying. I really. Enough. Bomb. Iris shouted enraged and hit the desk in front of her with her gloved fist. Under her immense physical power, the expensive furniture easily snapped into two as Claire jolted with a fearful expression on her face. 
Claire Cugino Iris said darkly, her expression filled with fury, as a menacing red aura began to emanate from her body. Yes, Claire replied meekly, tears welling up in her eyes as she felt trapped and humiliated. I shall give you one last chance. Iris stood from her chair and put her hand on the handle of her sword. Who was that man with you? She said solemnly as she glared down at the pale Claire. Silence. It's a shame, Iris muttered as she slowly drew her sword. Ah, Iris Megar, the first princess and heir to the throne, to Claire Cugino of the Baron Cugino family, at this moment. Claire's face slowly descended into despair with every word that came from Iris's mouth. I hereby condemn. Knock, knock. But before she could finish, there was a knock at the door. Iris frowned and looked toward it while saying, What is it? Iris Sama. You am. T the second princess is. As the knight was talking anxiously from behind the door, a new voice sounded from there. Out of my way. Iris raised her brow at the unfamiliar arrogant voice and Claire's ears perked up instead, as if recognizing it. What? How dare you? Who the hell are you? Why are you with the princess? At the sound of many swords being drawn, Iris frowned and was about to move to the door before something shocking happened. Know your place. Humans. Crash. Swish. 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 Claire and Iris widened their eyes in astonishment as several blurs zipped through the air, barely visible due to their incredible speed. The pair were unable to respond in time, such was the velocity of the movement. Suddenly, the door burst open and a formidable force hurled the knights into the room, slamming them into the wall with great force. The soldiers groaned in agony as they struggled to regain their footing before all of them dropped unconscious. As the dust settled, Iris could see a tall figure standing in the doorway. It was a man, dressed in a white outfit, a black belt, and a metal chain around his waist. Who are you? How dare you attack my knights? Iris demanded, pointing her sword at the unknown man. The man chuckled and his voice was like a hiss. Your knights? They were nothing but pathetic ants in my path. As for who I am, you are not worthy to know that. Insignificant human. Claire gasped, recognizing the man that was casually walking towards them. It's you? When the man turned his dark crimson eyes to Claire that was tied to a chair, he abruptly stopped and his expression changed dramatically. At that moment, another two girls appeared from behind him. When Iris saw one of them, all of her anger disappeared and she immediately sprinted toward her. Alexia? Dismissing the man, Iris brushed past him with little regard, hurrying towards the girl, oblivious to the terrifying, glowing eyes that bore down on her from the side. The action she just took made it seem as though the man didn't even exist, which was extremely insulting to the point that caused the man's already in the clouds anger to reach unprecedented levels. Alexia looked at her and smiled, relief evident in her eyes. Wanisama. Amph, Iris embraced her sister tightly, her heart racing with worry and relief. What happened? Are you hurt? The man slowly shifted his focus from Iris to Claire and then calmly closed his eyes and stood still, lost in deep contemplation for a short while. It appeared as though he was merely deeply pondering the matter. However, during this moment, the air in the atmosphere of the entire continent ceased to move, and every magical particle on the planet became frozen in space. It was an indication that a spell of an unprecedented scale in existence was about to be cast. Despite that, because of the sheer colossal global magnitude of the magic, unless someone attempted to use mana at that exact moment, no one would have noticed anything out of the ordinary. Tremble. Tremble. Huh. Milia blurted out confused as she suddenly felt the whole world around her shake uncontrollably. Bzzzzz. Rzzzzz. Sss. The trembling quickly soared without notice and her vision instantly turned blurry as she now found herself standing in the midst of a sea of vibrating white invisible dots. She got goosebumps all over her entire body as an ancient and instinctive primal fear overtook her fragile unconscious mind. Milia felt soul-crushing terror as her body began to violently hyperventilate involuntarily, leaving her unable to breathe, speak, move, or even blink. Her very soul resonated with the collapsing reality around her. Only she, who has already transcended the limitations of human senses could feel it. The heralding of the true Ragnarok. The start of the era of unforgiving darkness and absolute destruction. Not aware of the impending existential horrifying calamity, Alexia pushed the worried Iris away and shook her head.
Her silver hair glinted in the light. Don't worry, Wanisama. I'm fine now. Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure you're not hurt somewhere? Ugh, you're persistent. After a brief moment of hearing the quarreling sisters behind him, the man appeared to come to a resolution. He loosened his tense shoulders and reopened his eyes. At the same time, the mana in the world was released and everything returned back to normal, allowing the hyperventilating Milia to finally breathe normally again. I seem to have become unexpectedly soft. The man muttered emotionlessly to himself as he gazed at his seemingly clean hands. However, he saw them stained with the blood of untold, an innumerable amount of creatures that had perished under his hands throughout history. Is it due to the peace of this era? Or has my weak body influenced me? Is this the outcome of my and Hero Cannon's endeavors? Claire was taken aback by the strange words coming from the man as she found herself staring blankly at his face. Now that she looked at him clearly, despite her reluctance to admit it, she couldn't help but think that he was incredibly attractive. Huh? Why is he coming here? Claire thought confused as she noticed that the man was now walking directly towards her. W what do you want? She said anxiously as he stood in front of her. The sight of him effortlessly defeating so many knights before and the fact that she was currently tied to a chair made her incredibly nervous. When he silently moved his hand towards her, Claire flinched and tightly closed her eyes in fear. However, instead of inflicting her harm, she felt the rope around her wrists loosen as the man skillfully untied the knots. He then reached out his hand to help her up from the chair. Claire hesitated at first but then decided to take his hand, feeling a strange sense of trust in him despite her fear. As he pulled her up, she stumbled slightly, but he caught her easily and steadied her. Are you okay? He asked in a gentle voice, completely different from the arrogant and overbearing tone he used before. Claire looked up at him, her heart racing, and nodded meekly in response. This was the first time a man near her age had treated her in such a gentle manner. As soon as the man caught Claire's intense gaze, he responded with a knowing smile. His devilishly attractive appearance sent shivers down her spine, making her quiver uncontrollably like a cicada, and her cheeks flush with a bright crimson hue. Without conscious thought, her body moved mechanically towards the open window, as if trying to escape from something. Why yes, I need to check on Sid, she exclaimed hysterically, before jumping out of the window. As soon as she landed on the ground, she sprinted away at full speed, shouting why your sister is coming for you, before disappearing into the street. Anos smirked at his sister's cute behavior, he will tease her a little bit more in the future before he disclosed his true identity to her. He was immensely relieved that she was pretty easy to read unlike the anomaly known as his human brother Sid. As Anos turned to Iris and Alexia who were still chatting, he noticed the restless Milia standing awkwardly close to them and called out to her. Milia, come here, he said. Why yes, Anas sama Milia's expression brightened as she quickly moved to stand behind Anas, as if she had been waiting for his call for all eternity. Anas? Iris, who was speaking with Alexia, heard Milia mention his name and turned her red eyes towards him. Are you Anas Kajino? She asked, moving her hand towards her sword and standing protectively in front of Alexia. Anos was annoyed and corrected her. It's Anos Voldegode. Ignoring his words, Iris continued, Anos Kajino, explain. It's Anos Voldegode, Anos interrupted. Iris frowned at the interruption and continued, Anos Kajino, what is? It's Anos Voldegode, Anos corrected her again. Iris was infuriated by the constant interruption. Anos Kag. It's Anos Voldegode. Enough. Iris shouted in rage and a massive aura of red energy exploded from her body, startling both Alexia and Milia. However, Anas merely sneered at her. Hmph, it's Anas Voldegode. You better remember that, insignificant human, he said. Iris seethed with anger, her eyes blazing red as she glared at Anas. How dare you speak to me like that? Are you rebelling against the royal family? You're just a mere third-born child of a baron, she spat. Anas smirked. I speak to you the way you deserve to be spoken to, human. To me, you could be a god and it would make no difference. What a presumptuous bastard. Alexia stepped forward nervously, her expression incredibly anxious Owani Sama. Please calm down. I told you he's the one who saved me. We're not here to fight, she said, placing a hand on Iris's shoulder. Iris took a deep breath and slowly let it out, her aura dissipating. Fine, she said, glaring daggers at Anas. But mark my words, third-born child of a baron, I'll be watching you. 
Anas laughed mockingly. Do as you please, human. I couldn't care less. He turned to Milia. Come, Milia, let's go. Milia nodded and followed behind Anas, casting a hesitant glance back at Iris and Alexia before they disappeared into a strange magic circle in the ground. Iris gritted her teeth, her fists clenched in frustration. Get him. She was so lost in rage that she didn't even register the impossible magic that Anas had just cast. I don't trust him, she said to Alexia. I know, Alexia replied, but we have to be careful. Anas Voldegode is not to be underestimated. As Alexia was speaking, she suddenly remembered something and immediately grabbed Iris by her shoulders. W wait a minute, eh? Iris was bewildered as she looked at the wide-eyed Alexia. Did you just say Kajino? That Pochi's family? 8. Chapter 15. Calculated Chaos. Did you just say Kajino? That Pochi's family? Hmm? Iris blinked, momentarily thrown off by her sister's sudden reaction, then nodded. Yes. Claire and Anas are indeed siblings from the Kajino family. What? Alexia cried, her eyes wide with shock. That man, Anas, he's from that rural family? Yes, Iris confirmed, her eyebrows furrowing in confusion. Why? What's wrong? No, it's just... Alexia began, a thoughtful expression appearing on her face. I saw Claire once before. She was normal. But Anas, he seemed nothing like her. He was arrogant. Passively disrespectful even, he's like the complete opposite of how a noble-born son of barren rank should behave towards the royal family. Indeed, Iris agreed, her own gaze turning dark. His insolence and disrespect for authority is completely infuriating. But what troubles me more is how he could save you, Iris added, her gaze softening as she looked at her sister. Despite his unacceptable attitude, he still did save you, didn't he? Alexia nodded her face going pale as she remembered her encounter with Anas. Yes, he did save me from that madman. However, the way he gazed at me, it sends a chill down my spine. It was as if I were nothing but an insignificant pebble on the side of the road. Pebble? Yes, that Anas. He is indeed different. Dangerous, even. I can't shake off the feeling. The more perfect a person is, the more likely they are to be a fraud. But with Anas, there's something incredibly genuine about his confidence his power. It's as if he has absolutely no need for pretense, Alexia admitted, her expression troubled. He seems really authentic, she continued, her eyes narrowing in thought. Authentic and terrifying. Iris pondered on her sister's words, her grip on her sword tightening. You say he is not a fraud, and yet you also say he is terrifying. I assume it is because of the power he wields? Yes, Alexia admitted, her expression somber. I think his power is immense, yes, but there is more to it than just that. His demeanor, his condescending way of speaking, it's as if he truly sees himself as superior to all others, as if he perceives himself as the absolute sovereign of the world. A chuckle escaped Iris' lips before she could stop it, her eyes sparkling with incredulity. A man of superior strength? You must be jesting. No, Wanisama, Alexia insisted, her tone earnest. I'm not joking. The first princess threw her head back, her laughter echoing through the room, rich and full. That's preposterous. Is that uncouth, disrespectful peasant displaying unparalleled strength? It's ludicrous. His only remarkable attribute seems to be his audacity. And even that's rather infuriating. I don't know what underhanded methods he used to rescue you, but he is really pushing his luck. But when Isama, Alexia started, only to be cut off by another round of laughter from Iris. No, no, Alexia, Iris said, wiping away the tears of mirth from the corner of her eyes. Your tale, though thrilling, is far too fantastical to be believed. The idea of Anas, a man from the modest Kajino bloodline, wielding immense power is beyond absurd. It's laughably ridiculous. Remember, dear Alexia, even the lowliest of insects can have a sting, she added, her laughter subsiding, replaced with an arrogant smirk. But an insect remains an insect. No matter how deadly its sting may be, Anas is no different. Even if he does possess some strength, in the grand scheme of things, he is nothing more than a mere blip, an inconsequential speck. As she finished, Iris' laughter filled the room again, her disbelief in Anas' strength apparent, and her arrogance towards him undiminished. Alexia, however, didn't join in her sister's mirth. Instead, she watched Iris, her thoughts heavy. She wished she could share her sister's dismissive views about Anas, but she couldn't. 
She had seen his strength against the knights, his fearlessness. She had been at the receiving end of his subtle disdain, and it had shaken her more than she cared to admit. Maybe you're right, Wanisama, Alexia finally said, though her tone lacked conviction. Maybe Anas is nothing special. Iris's laughter subsided as she glanced at her sister, a smug smile playing on her lips. Of course I am right, Alexia. We are the royal family. What can a mere barren son ever do to harm us? But Alexia wasn't convinced. Something about Anas's demeanor, the way he had saved her. It wasn't something she could easily dismiss. The fact that a man of such low rank could possess such power was troubling, to say the least. Wanisama, she said hesitantly, I think we should be cautious. I have a bad feeling about this. Nonsense, Iris dismissed with a wave of her hand. You're just being overly cautious. Let's not waste any more time on this matter. Anas is of no concern to us. Despite her sister's assurance, Alexia couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. She knew Iris was confident, but this time, her confidence seemed misplaced. Alexia could only hope that her sister's laughter wouldn't turn into a regretful cry in the face of Anas's unknown strength. But for now, all she could do was wait, and hope that her unsettling feeling about Anas was nothing more than just a figment of her overactive imagination. Milia blinked her expression one of disbelief as she observed Alexia restlessly shifting back and forth while lying unconscious on the sofa. Silence enveloped the room. Taking a moment to tuck the white cover snugly over Alexia's sleeping form, Milia slowly directed her gaze downward, where Iris lay sprawled haphazardly on the cold floor. The sight was undeniably undignified, prompting Milia to feel a pang of sympathy for the first princess, despite never having met her before. With a flicker of hesitation, Milia turned her attention to Anas, who sat leisurely in a chair behind the desk and was deeply engrossed in a book he found by chance in the drawer. His demeanor seemed out of place in the room calm and composed, contrasting sharply with the unseemly sight of the unconscious royal figure sprawled across the floor. Anas Sama, Milia started, her voice wavering with uncertainty. Why, why did you do this? Anas turned the page of the book, his gaze never leaving the text. Do what? he asked, his voice sounding as indifferent as his expression looked. Milia gestured awkwardly towards Iris, her fingers trembling slightly, this making her unconscious. Anas looked at Iris, his gaze apathetic. Oh, that, he replied, his gaze returning to his book. She was getting annoying. This way, we can work without interruptions. But Milia stuttered, wasn't that a bit ruthless? You even left her on the floor. Anas ignored Milia's last words and simply looked at her. It's a harmless illusion magic. Those two humans are in an illusion world right now, he said dismissively. They'll wake up after we are done. Now, let's focus on our task. But still, Milia protested weakly, her voice trailing off under Anas's disinterested gaze. She found herself at a loss for words, unsure of how to voice her concern without provoking his ire. The aura she had sensed earlier still haunted her, intensifying her reluctance to irritate Anas any further especially considering how he treated the first princess compared to Alexia. It was a clear indication of what fate awaited her if she were to push him too far. Anas, however, didn't respond. He simply continued reading his book, seemingly unperturbed by Milia's evident discomfort. His apathy served as a chilling reminder of the disparity in their power and status. Milia was left standing there, her discomfort slowly giving way to a sinking feeling of unease. She found herself wondering about the kind of man Anas really was a savior, a powerful being, or something far more complex and daunting. With a sigh, Milia turned away, deciding that for now, it was best to keep her thoughts to herself. There was no point in questioning Anas's methods. After all, they were merely the tools for his objectives, no matter how ruthless or unorthodox they might appear. You said our task, but you still haven't explained anything. As Milia thought that with a sullen expression, Anas suddenly lowered his book and looked at her. Are you afraid? he asked, his voice as cold as ice. His gaze pierced through Milia, causing her to stiffen. And no, I'm not afraid. I'm just concerned, she replied, her voice barely more than a whisper. She didn't dare to meet his gaze, fearing the intensity she might find there. Concerned? Anas echoed, his voice carrying a note of amusement as he leaned back in his chair. Concerned about what? About them, Milia responded, gesturing at the unconscious royals. About what you did to them. About why you did it. 
Anas, despite his apathetic demeanor and seemingly ruthless actions, wasn't inherently a bad person. His disregard for human sentiments was a product of his age, his status, and the countless eras he had lived through. His actions were dictated by practicality and efficiency, by the need to achieve his goals without unnecessary hindrances. Alexia and Iris, there are no harm. Anas spoke without raising his eyes from his book, as if reading Milia's mind. Their bodies are here, but their consciousnesses are in an illusion world I've created. They are living their usual lives there, oblivious to the truth. He then closed his book and stood up, walking over to a weathered painting hanging on the wall. The artwork depicted a colossal beast locked in combat with a valiant human hero. For a fleeting moment, Anas's dark and crimson eyes gleamed, as his visage merged with that of the monstrous creature within his thoughts. My actions might seem ruthless to you, but they're necessary. I have a clone looking for the culprit behind the kidnappings. If it was made public that Alexia has been rescued, it would alert the kidnapper and he would likely go into hiding or possibly hurt other victims. He turned to face Milia, a serious expression on his face. I can't afford to risk that. So, for now, Iris and Alexia will remain here, in their shared illusionary world, unharmed and safe. His words made sense. Milia realized that his actions, though harsh, were calculated and aimed at protecting everyone involved. It was a new perspective on Anus a perspective that highlighted his strategic thinking and his willingness to take extreme measures to ensure success. It was a reminder of the complexity of Anas Voldegode, the demon king of tyranny. Milia slowly nodded in understanding, finally beginning to grasp the depth of Anas' strategy and the motivations behind his seemingly ruthless actions. It was a harsh lesson, but one that was essential for her to learn in her new existence as a demon. Anas' eyes glinted with an unreadable emotion and he fell silent for a moment. As if in thought, he crossed his arms and gazed out at the cityscape beyond the window. I presume you're curious, he began, turning back to face Milia, as to why I don't simply employ my magic to swiftly locate the culprit, thinking, since he possesses such immense power, can't he just employ a magical technique and uncover their whereabouts instantaneously? Milia flinched, her eyes widening at Anus's perceptiveness. A wry smile spread across his face. Indeed, it is true that with my magical abilities, I could swiftly track down the culprit. However, such an action would potentially alert them to my awareness of their true identity. As the demon king of tyranny, my powers are far from subtle, unlike those possessed by most individuals in this world. Employing them to such an extent would be akin to sounding a war drum, announcing my presence to an unfamiliar adversary. Regardless of one's might, it would be foolish to provoke an unknown enemy in an unfamiliar environment, with unknown third parties involved and countless variables at play. Unfortunately, that is precisely the situation I find myself in at the moment, albeit temporarily. Silence hung in the air. There's no need for me to elaborate on my powers, as you've already experienced them firsthand mere moments ago, he asserted, causing a loud gulp to involuntarily escape Milia's throat. A sudden dryness seized Milia's throat leaving her momentarily speechless, while her complexion paled noticeably. Anas started to pace the room, his hands clasped behind his back. Locating the kidnapper is just the beginning, he emphasized. Our ultimate goal is to apprehend them swiftly and discreetly. Preventing any harm to others and ensuring their escape is impossible. This situation demands utmost delicacy. If we alert them prematurely, they will likely resort to desperate measures. However, since I have already confirmed Sid's safety and we now have the princess in our custody, we find ourselves with the luxury of time. With this advantage, I have deduced that our best course of action is to pursue the most promising strategy, one that guarantees the highest level of certainty. He stopped and turned to her, his unfathomable and terrifying eyes intense. That's why I've created this illusion. It buys us time to locate the perpetrator quietly and efficiently, without setting off any alarms. The lives of other innocent humans are most likely at stake here. One wrong move, and the kidnapper might harm them or worse kill them out of desperation. Naturally, I would still possess the means to rectify the situation if necessary. However, I would prefer to avoid such drastic measures, given the multitude of currently unknown variables that are in play. So, Milia, does this explanation satisfy your curiosity? Understanding dawned on Milia's dazed face, and she just nodded in stunned silence a newfound respect for Anas's strategic mind growing within her. 
His methods might have been ruthless and seemingly indifferent, but it seems they were always calculated and had a higher purpose. It was yet another facet of the enigmatic demon king of tyranny that she was just beginning to comprehend. 5. Chapter 16. A Demon King's Warning and a Human King's Fear. Next, the next day, as the night deepened, the room was bathed in the soft, flickering glow of a single candle. Anas had conjured it with his creation magic, the flame dancing and casting long, wavering shadows on the walls. The demon king of Tyranny himself was engrossed in another book, his eyes scanning the pages with an intensity that belied the late hour. The only sounds were the occasional rustle of a page turning, and the steady rhythm of his breathing. Milia, on the other hand, was struggling to keep her eyes open. She had insisted on staying awake this whole time, sitting vigil beside the unconscious Alexia for more than thirty hours straight. Her eyelids felt heavy, and her head bobbed occasionally as sleep threatened to overtake her. She fought against the drowsiness, her determination fueled by a sense of duty and concern for the royal sisters. The candlelight flickered across her face, highlighting the lines of exhaustion etched there. Despite her best efforts, her eyes would close for a moment before snapping open again, a clear sign of her battle against sleep. Anas, despite his apparent focus on his book, was aware of her struggle. He didn't comment on it, choosing instead to let her fight her own battle. He understood her sense of duty, and he respected it. But he also knew that everyone had their limits, and Milia was fast approaching hers. As the hours ticked by, the fight became harder for Milia. Her head bobbed more frequently, and her eyes stayed closed for longer intervals. The room was warm and quiet, the steady flicker of the candle and the rhythmic sound of Anos turning the pages creating a lullaby that beckoned her towards sleep. Finally, as the clock struck midnight Milia's battle against sleep ended. Her eyes closed one final time, and her head drooped forward, her body finally succumbing to the exhaustion. She fell asleep sitting up, her body leaning slightly against the couch where Alexia lay. Anas glanced up from his book, his gaze landing on the sleeping Milia. A ghost of a smile touched his lips as he quietly closed his book and set it aside. He conjured another candle, this one with a softer, dimmer light, and extinguished the first one. The room was now bathed in a gentle, soothing glow perfect for sleep. With one last look at Milia and the unconscious Alexia beside her, Anas picked up his book and resumed reading, the soft light of the candle illuminating the pages. The room was quiet, save for the soft sounds of their breathing and the occasional rustle of a page turning. It was a peaceful scene. The royal insignia that the king had given to Anas sat innocuously on the desk, bathed in the soft glow of the conjured candle. To any casual observer, it was merely a symbol of the king's favor. But Anas knew better. The insignia was a spy device, a silent observer that relayed everything back to the king. Anas had known from the moment he'd received it. His magical senses had detected the subtle enchantments woven into the insignia, the silent hum of magic that was its true purpose. But he had chosen to act as if he didn't know, to let the king believe that he had an eye on Anas's actions. He had used the insignia to his advantage, showing the king only a fraction of his true power and ruthlessness. He had let the king watch as he dispatched all his enemies with cold, calculated efficiency. He had shown the king how he created a perfect living clone of his youngest daughter, and how he ordered it to execute the injured and vulnerable ones to instill extreme psychological pressure on the arrogant king's mind. Furthermore, Anos had forced the king to helplessly watch his precious oldest daughter discarded on the dirty floor like a piece of trash for over thirty hours. It was a cruel, yet effective way to demonstrate the dire situation his daughters were in, and the helplessness of the king to do anything about it. He had shown the king what he was capable of, what he could do if anyone dared to threaten his family. It was a silent warning, a raw and plain demonstration of indisputable power meant to put the puny human king in his insignificant place. Now, as the clock struck midnight and Milia slept beside the unconscious Alexia, Anos turned his attention to the golden insignia. He picked it up, the cool metal heavy in his hand. He could feel the magic pulsing within it a silent heartbeat that connected it to the king. With a flick of his wrist, Anas forcefully activated the insignia with magic. His image appeared before the king far away in the royal palace, his crimson eyes glowing ominously in the dim light. The king, Klaus Midgar, who had been watching the scene unfold in his private chambers, jumped in surprise. He hadn't expected Anas to activate the device, to willingly show himself. 
Greetings, your majesty, Anus began the final warning, his voice icy and lacking any semblance of reverence. I presume you've found the spectacle to your liking? W what? King Klaus stammered, taken aback by Anus's direct address. He had thought his spying was secret, that Anus was unaware of his observation. But now, he realized that Anus had known all along and had chosen to let him watch. I, the king stuttered, fear creeping into his trembling voice. He was suddenly very aware of the power that Anus wielded, of the dangerous threat he posed to him and his kingdom. Anus's expression was icy, his eyes hardened into crimson stones. He moved towards the unconscious form of Iris on the cold floor. Bending down, he gently picked up a lock of her hair, letting it slide through his fingers as he turned back to face the insignia. I trust you're taking this to heart, your majesty, he said, his voice a chilling whisper that echoed in the silent room. Should anyone, and I do mean anyone, pose a threat to my family again, they will be met with my fury. And I assure you, it's a sight you wouldn't want to witness. Anus's gaze was locked onto the insignia, the unspoken threat hanging heavy in the air. The lock of Iris's smooth red hair, still held in his hand like fresh blood, served as a stark reminder of the potential danger the king's daughters were in. It was also a subtle hint at his capabilities he could create a perfect living clone of Iris, the first princess and heir to the throne, and the king would be none the wiser. This was a silent, chilling warning, one that the king would be wise to heed. The power to replace his beloved heir with a clone, to control the future of the kingdom without anyone noticing, was within Anus's grasp. It was an exceedingly terrifying prospect, one that would surely send chills down the king's very soul. With that, Anus deactivated the insignia, cutting off the connection abruptly. King Klaus was left staring at the now blank device, his heart pounding frantically in his chest so much so that he even felt terrible pain from it. The implications of Anus's words and actions were slowly sinking in, leaving him with a sense of dread about what the future might hold. The silence that followed was deafening. King Klaus sat alone in his private chambers, the golden insignia in his hand a stark reminder of the frightening threat he had just faced. His mind was a whirlwind of fear and regret. He had greatly no, grossly underestimated Anus, and had thought him to be just another pawn of the order. But the reality was far more terrifying. Anus was not just any pawn. He was a great force to be reckoned with a power that could single-handedly bring his entire kingdom to its knees. The image of Anas holding Iris's hair, his eyes cold and unfeeling, was etched into his mind. It was a chilling reminder of what Anas could do, of the danger his beloved daughters were in. His heart pounded in his chest, each beat echoing the fear that gripped him. He had tried to gain the upper hand, to control the situation. But all he had done was provoke Anas, and now, his kingdom was at grave risk. He looked down pitifully at the golden insignia, the cold metal a stark contrast to the warmth of his hand. He had given it to Anas, had thought it would finally give him an advantage against the order. But it had been a mistake, a nauseating miscalculation that could cost him everything. As the harsh reality of the situation sank in, King Klaus felt a traumatic chill run down his spine. He had personally seen the horrible power that Anas wielded and had seen the ruthlessness with which he annihilated his enemies. And now, he feared for his daughters, for what Anas might do if they were caught in the crossfire. The king sat alone in the silence of his royal chambers, the weight of his actions heavy on his shoulders. He had underestimated Anas severely, and now, he was left to face the consequences of his actions. King Klaus found himself looking upwards, his eyes drawn to the ornate ceiling of his private chambers. But it wasn't the intricate designs or the gold leaf that caught his attention. Instead, he found himself looking beyond, to the heavens that lay out of sight. A prayer formed on his lips, a desperate plea to the heavens. What manner of creature have we welcomed into our kingdom? He whispered, his voice barely audible in the silent room. What have we done? His mind was filled with images of Anus the cold, unfeeling glowing eyes, the ruthless display of power against horridly weaker enemies, the chilling threat. He had foolishly invited this abominable creature into his kingdom's most inner circles and had even given him a place of honor out of ignorance. And now, he feared what that decision could mean for his kingdom's future. The insignia lay forgotten on his desk, a silent testament to his miscalculation. He had thought it a tool, a way to keep an eye on Anas and the Order. But it had only served to reveal the true extent of Anas's power, 
to show him the danger that now lurked within his kingdom's borders. His prayer continued, a silent plea for guidance, for protection. He prayed for his kingdom, for his people, for his daughters. He prayed for the strength to face whatever was to come, for the wisdom to navigate the dangerous path ahead. And as he prayed, King Klaus could not shake off the feeling of dread that had settled in his heart. He had seen the godly power that Anus wielded, had seen the unimaginable danger he posed. And now, he could only pray and hope that his kingdom would be able to withstand the storm that was sure to come. Demon King of Tyranny, Anas Voldegod, just who exactly are you? What is it that you seek? As the night wore on, King Klaus remained in his private chambers, his thoughts consumed by the looming threat of Anas. His mind replayed the chilling scene he had witnessed through the insignia, the cold ruthlessness of Anas's actions, the implicit threat in his words. The silence of the room was broken only by his own ragged breathing and the occasional clink of the insignia as he turned it over and over in his hands. Meanwhile, back in the room bathed in the soft glow of the conjured candle, Anas continued his vigil. Milia was still asleep, her steady breathing a comforting rhythm in the quiet room. Alexia and Iris lay unconscious, their faces peaceful in sleep. The insignia lay discarded on the desk, its purpose served. Anas's gaze was drawn to the insignia. He knew that the king would be reeling from the revelation, that he would be questioning his decisions and fearing for his kingdom. A small, satisfied smile tugged at the corners of Anas's lips. The human king had dared to offend him, and now he was paying the price. Fortunate was he, for had he been a demon instead, Anas would have unleashed every magic at his disposal to subject him to the most indescribable torment possible, perpetually ending his life over and over again and then erasing his essence until nothing remained. Yet, as the king is a mere human, the dynamics changed. Anos was bound by a different set of rules, unable to inflict harm upon his kind without a compelling alibi, for the consequences of doing so would render him incapable of confronting Hero Cannon in the face. Anos was determined not to disappoint the only man in existence whom he would genuinely regard as his equal. As the hours ticked by, Anos turned his attention back to his book. His mind, however, was not on the words on the page. Instead, he was planning his next move, considering his options. He knew that the king would be on high alert now, that he would be more cautious. But Anas was not worried. He had shown the king a glimpse of his power, and had given him a taste of what he was capable of. And he was confident that he could handle whatever the king threw at him. Boom. Kaya. Just as Anas delved into his contemplations, a thunderous explosion echoed from the far side of the capital. The abrupt disturbance roused Milia from her slumber, her purple eyes widening in alarm. Swiftly, Anas employed his magical abilities to lull her back into a peaceful sleep, sparing her from the torment of sleep deprivation. Instantly, Anas closed the book, recognizing the urgency of the situation. With a swift wave of his hand, he erected a protective barrier around the room, shielding Milia and the others from potential harm. Sensing the gravity of the loud explosion, he knew he had to investigate immediately. Fless. Without hesitation, Anos propelled himself towards the window, effortlessly defying gravity as he soared through the night sky. His eyes gleamed with cold indifference as he sought to uncover the source of the disturbance. The dark capital awaited his presence, and he was more than ready to confront whatever lay ahead. Somewhere high above the city, Alpha stood on the edge of a building, her gaze fixed on the dark capital below. The other members of the Shadow Garden were with her, their expressions serious as they surveyed their surroundings. The night was quiet, the city bathed in the soft glow of the moonlight. But the peace was shattered by a sudden explosion, the sound echoing through the night. Alpha's eyes narrowed as she turned towards the source of the explosion. She recognized the signature of the magic it was Delta. Alpha had ordered her to initiate the attack on the Diablo's cult hideouts scattered in the capital. The explosion marked the beginning of their operation. Delta has begun, Alpha's words hung in the air, a stark contrast to the quiet night. The members of the Shadow Garden nodded, their faces set in determination. They were ready to support Delta, to ensure the success of their mission. Authors note, I know you're all excited for the next chapter where Anas is going to face Delta. But let's remember... Anas is so powerful that he could literally defeat Delta with a blink. So, here's a little joke to keep you entertained until the next chapter. Why doesn't Anas play hide and seek with Delta? Because each time he shuts his eyes to count, Delta turns into a puddle of doggy meat slurry. 
Now, I have some exciting news to share with you all. One of our fellow readers, Sivan underscore Voldegode, has created an amazing fan pick for our story. I was so impressed by it that I've decided to use it as the new cover for our story. New cover. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to Sivan underscore Voldegode for this wonderful contribution. It's readers like you who make this journey so much more rewarding. I hope everyone enjoys this new cover as much as I do. Stay tuned for the next chapter. And remember, no blinking during the Anus versus Delta Showdown. 6.